Sounds great. All right, so here's, here's our uh, icebreaker that I'm going to ask you about, which is tell me what your experience with JavaScript is, your favorite, and your least favorite part of the language. So how about we start here in the back to my left? Oh, you would start with me, wouldn't you? <laughs> you've, had, you've had the super powerful coffee, so I know you're you know, ready to go. I, you know, I, I'm going to lean. Go. I'm going to lean on that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> What's your name? Sorry, my I should have. My name is Crystal. Crystal. Um, I graduated from Prime Digital uh, Academy just in January. Um, as far as JavaScript, <laughs> um, what I like, or I guess what I least about like about it, um, is that sometimes it'll do something. I don't know. I don't know. You put me on the spot. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> oh my gosh. Tell me what you like the most about what you've seen so far. What I like the most about JavaScript so far is that it's relatively, I mean, I guess, sort of easy to learn, I suppose. Okay. But then again, it allows you to do things. <laughs> um, that you shouldn't be able to and you know, give you an answer that you weren't necessarily expecting. All so right. it'll let you do things All that right. you shouldn't Fair be enough. able to do. Fair enough. Next. Hi, so my name is Alina. I also graduated. You said, I'm sorry, you said Alina? Okay. Yeah, Alina. Uh, I graduated from Prime Digital Academy in the same cohort as Crystal. So, uh, oh, okay, so... Um, yeah, I would say my favorite thing about JavaScript was that it just uh, feels intuitive to learn it. Okay. Uh, I think it was uh, uh, kind of natural. Uh, things that I do not like about it uh, is, I guess, regex. Regex? Yeah, uh -huh. regular expressions. Okay. <laughs> I think that was kind it's of... It's a language in and of itself. Right. Whoops, I'm so sorry. Uh, but, yeah, also just uh, sometimes not knowing what um, the type will be of whatever your input is. Mm. So typing, dynamic typing sometimes is great and sometimes not. So. In the boot camp that you were in, did you get exposure to TypeScript? Uh, we no. did not. No, OK. We, All right. we know about it, but not. It won't take long before somebody's throwing TypeScript on you. That's pretty common in this industry. OK, fantastic. How about moving here to the, this row? I am Chu. I graduated from Hack Bright Academy in December. Um, I like all the cool stuff you can do with JavaScript on the front end. At the academy, I learned Python. I actually, I prefer Python. Really? Yeah. Excellent. All right. Nice. Uh, Jason Graft. <coughs> Excuse me. I uh, work for Relational AI. This week, my title is Graph Engineer. Okay. Uh, I do. Uh, I do mostly information science uh, and related there. Uh, my least favorite feature of JavaScript is there is a cycle in the base of its type tree. An object, or is a, excuse me, a function is an object with a function in it. Mm. Uh, yeah, that, is, that is no good. That's what happens when you develop a language in 10 days. Uh, my favorite uh, feature of JavaScript is if you can get closer to the core of its uh, functionality, uh, you know, around like the map and uh, reduce set uh, it performs very well at those tasks, and, and you can uh, trick it into thinking stably, uh, even though it has almost as many equivalence classes as Visual Basic. All right, all right. By the way, just as a fun little side fact, uh, one of my other uh, workshops on here covers, uh, it's the Deep JavaScript Foundations, I think is what it's called, covers the uh, the prototype chain that you're referring to mm -hmm. with the circular objects and functions, and there's a, a fun little evil diagram that I show in there, I think. I can't remember now, it's been a while, but I think there's a diagram in there about the prototype chains. It's quite, it's quite an interesting journey when you, when you di dive into the bowels of JavaScript. Fantastic, well, welcome, thanks I'll for being here. I'll read a few from chat, just, uh, yeah, so, someone said prototypes, someone said closure, are they saying for favorite or least favorite? <laughs> uh, I believe people are saying least favorite. Yeah. <laughs> there's least favorite is coercion. Clo closure might be right up there. <laughs> uh, callbacks. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, let's see. Least favorite is definitely this. 
My favorite. Yeah, self reference. This person says, my favorite is <laughs> jQuery, even though I can't use it anymore. <laughs> um, yeah, that both least and most favorite is that it's so flexible. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, lots, lots of possibilities to do things many ways, the greatest strength and the greatest weakness. Um, favorite is closure and browser APIs like fetch. Least favorite is doing stuff with numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, most prototype, least primitive types wrapper. Um, someone said this. And the chat room's just flying. People got all <laughs> kinds of stuff no. to say. Yeah, yeah. This is this is. I tapped topic. a nerve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have a therapy session later today. <laughs> yeah. Uh, favorite thing you can do anything it's flexibility multi paradigm least favorite immutable data structures aren't built in the language mm. hopefully coming um, yeah I mean I think it's yeah, favorite favorite dynamic typing least favorite dynamic typing. <laughs> Functions, favorite passing functions to other functions. Uh, while, while John is monkeying with the setup, we might as well read more. <laughs> this is kind of fun. JavaScript is the only language where we could create a framework, then a framework of that framework, then another framework of the previous framework of the first framework. That's why John I love it when people write a JavaScript engine in JavaScript and then run JavaScript inside of the engine inside the similar similar energy to the framework in a framework thing. Favorite dynamic first class functions. Favorite, uh, and I really like <laughs> a lot of answers. Good answers, everyone. John is still. Uh, I think he just doesn't. One of the one of the shades broke. So we have sun pouring in. We well, can't have the line, sun. Uh, you get that line on the backdrop now. Like I said, yeah. the, the professionals of the industry, these guys, they don't miss a single pixel. All right. Still very, still very hot. Is it that shade? Well, yeah, I think you're right. If you move some of my stuff, you could put, be, put it in front of that gap. I don't know. This person said, I love creating giant. There. Uh, I think it's this, this yeah. shade right here, right in the corner. I love no, creating no, giant this functions. This corner back here. I think so. I think the, I like the monster. I think we found the source of the light that's cam contaminating the <laughs> recording. <laughs> By the way, have you b all been able to hear me in the chat? Curious. Because as I've been reading everybody's stuff, they said yes, yes, yes. That's cool. The, the one over then? More cardboard, more tape. It's the solution to everything. Cardboard it and tape it. done in the lab. What else are you? I don't even know what line y'all are talking about, but I'm finding it funny. There's like a line over your left shoulder. It's really not that big of a deal. We could go without it, but like. Well, let's see if it fixes it or whatever. Yeah. Is it like a glare off a screen or something? I'll just keep reading chat because this is. Favorite dynamic this and prototypes, least favorite coercion. Uh, people are asking at what level of JavaScript will this workshop begin? Mm, I'll cover that in a minute. Okay. Coercion. Cover that. Great if you're the only one using it. 
And you ask Kyle how he learns things so in depth and has a clear understanding. Hmm. He does this with a lot of topics, which is amazing. Um, That's a trade secret. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, trying to give. If you see my social life, there'll be Kyle's no secret secrets sauce. after that. The secret is commit to a book editor that you're going to write a book and then you force yourself to go learn something. That's that's the honest yep. secret. Oh, uh, coffee was supposed to. Uh, oh, from chat, she um, was supposed to. So, Kyle, did someone give you that advice? Come no, <laughs> I've heard that from a lot. I of stumbled on it. Heard for that sure. from He's a lot favorite of authors. Uh, Lasha in chat says, uh, John, please don't harm Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> Carrying these giant wooden boards around yeah, my head. Oh, this is just cardboard. <laughs> it, it was just cardboard, Lasha. It was just cardboard. Okay, one last thing, sorry. Yes. Could you look into the camera? Okay. Do <laughs> <laughs> you see the reflection? I'm trying to strike my best pose. Look right here. With that screen, could you turn the brightness down? I don't know how to turn the brightness down. How do we do that, Tanner? Yeah, uh, there's a button on the side. You should be able to access okay. the screen right here. I think they mean you need to rein in your personality. Oh. Blue steel kind of looks under uh, the There's soul. a volume. <laughs> uh, there should be a button in the midst. I think it's touch screen after that. <coughs> oh, access to slides. There's no other button. There's oh wait, no. There's just a. Uh, there's volume now, but. Uh, yeah. <coughs> okay. Oh, just that easy. Right. Oh, uh, they want to know your yeah, favorite and least favorite parts, Kyle. Is that better on the glare? Yeah, that's gonna be. I'm just gonna turn it a little bit. Tell me when it's. We can make that work. Uh, Kyle, they want to know your favorite and least favorite feature of JavaScript. Stay tuned. I would, I mean, I hate to be real cheesy about it. I'll summarize it, but really, honestly, you have to go watch the Deep JavaScript Foundations course because <laughs> that's where I elucidated all of my thoughts, good and bad, about the language. But in summary, uh, my favorite part about JavaScript is that uh, the language, at least at times, does not apply an, too many, I will say, opinions about how you need to write stuff. I'm not a big fan of super opinionated languages, tools, environments that sort of constrain. I like to have, you know, like. I'm not an artist, but if I had a canvas and I could just do whatever I wanted on the canvas, I'd rather a canvas without edges, if that makes sense, rather than having, oh, you got to stay within the 12 by 12. Uh, that's my favorite part about JavaScript is that it's a very you know, malleable language and you can make it what you want. But the least favorite thing about JavaScript is that with such a diverse audience that it has to cater to, uh, I feel like, mm, I'm trying to be very careful about my words, many of the features that end up landing in the language end up serving well only one particular constituency and making it harder on other constituencies. Um, and I'm, I've spent many, many years banging my head against that problem. And I happen to be in a constituency that doesn't get as much fan service from TC39 as other constituencies. So. You know, it makes the balance feel a bit off. Uh, so I guess that'll be my best political answer to that question. All righty, well. <laughs> Welcome to, to democracy, yeah. Yeah. Oh, you see the chat now? Yeah, I've got the chat up here, okay. yeah. Cool. Well, everybody, we are ready to
to get started. So once we get the thumbs up, thumbs up, John. Thumbs up, Aisha. Thumbs. 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 We're good. Here's, here's my three thumbs up. Our, 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 our weekend workshop. Someone said, well, "Is this your first workshop on the weekend?" I would say it's not our first, but it is pretty rare. It's, it's maybe unusual. like one per year. Unusual. One per every three years. One per every three years. Yep. Wow. Yeah. It's been a while. It's been a while. So. All right. All right. So before we uh, actually dive into my presentation, just a quick little um, like housekeeping sort of a thing. In the slides, which you should all have access to, as we go along, there'll be links to GitHub repositories that we'll be going over with our exercises. So you'll see those links, and it'll say repo down in the bottom right corner. They'll come to repos like this. This will be the first one we're actually going to go through. And I just wanted to point out real quickly the, the mechanics of these repos. The main branch on the repo has the readme that describes the project. So it's got all your instructions on kind of how to orient and that kind of thing. And then we've got, you can do this from the command line, you can do it from the UI, however, whatever your is, is your favorite way of interacting with it. I like to just git clone and do it from the command line. But there are branches in here, and there's a start here branch. And that's where you want to start uh, when you're going to work on the workshop. So the start here branch will have the basic files already created for you. And then for each of these workshops, you'll see option one, option two, three, four, et cetera, for each of the different workshops. Those are progressively more and more or different ways of doing the solution to the problem. The reason I did them as branches is it's real easy in the UI to do a diff between two branches. You can also do that from the command line. So you can check and see, oh, I missed something, or something he did didn't work quite the same way. Just diff the, you know, if we're on option two, diff one to option two, or start here to option one, or whatever, and you can see anything that you might have missed. So hopefully those diffs are helpful for you just as, you know, as you're keeping up. I'd also mention that if, for whatever reason, we're going to be doing a lot of live coding in the workshop, but if for whatever reason you get behind or something isn't working for you exactly quite right, you're welcome to ask questions and we can try to do a little you know, troubleshooting or, or tips or whatever. But if, if for some reason you are behind, you don't have to stay behind. Just simply stash your work and switch to the new to the branch. So again, if we're getting ready to do the option two solution, you switch to the option one branch, which is the base. Just you know, stash your changes, switch to option one, and then you're good to go uh, for the next portion. So you'll see those links to those repositories. There's four of them, I think, four or five. You'll see those links throughout the slides. I'll be going back and forth between slides and the code editor and also the browser. One other little note is that each one of the exercises that we're going to work on are designed to be run in a web context, which means from the root directory of that repo checkout, you want to run some sort of a web server. People, some people like to do that from inside of their code editor or IDE. Some people like to do it from the command line. I always do like NPX HTTP server, but whatever your favorite way of running just a local host web server, you don't need anything else fancy than that. But some of the, you know, we make fetch for a JSON file, and you can't do that on the file system. So you want to make sure you run. Um, you want to make sure you run a local web server so that you can run it in the browser. So I'm going to pull up, for example, I've got a web server running for localhost. Localhost port 8080 is what I choose, and here's that first exercise. Pull up in a browser, nothing fancy, but that's what you want to be able to see in a browser when you go to localhost and whatever port you choose. OK, so I think that's it for the kind of housekeeping stuff. So let's dive in. I'm thrilled to be back. It's been way too long. Uh, it's been quite a black hole uh, in the world over the last several years. And being back in person with people, connecting with people, really brings the energy and the spirit and the life back. And so thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining in person. Thank you for joining live online. Thank you for joining virtually later through recordings. Uh, it's fantastic to have you here. Uh, thank you to the front end master's staff who I quite literally owe my career to because I got my start teaching because Mark called me up one day and he was like, 
come up here and teach. And it took me it took me a few weeks to convince myself I'd come up to cold Minnesota in like November or December, but I came up here and uh, my whole career blossomed from doing that. So I, I thank Mark and his staff for all the fantastic stuff that they've done. They're the best in the business. I teach exclusively at Front End Masters. I don't record anywhere else because they're the best. So there's lots of my courses on here that you can find and uh, some really fantastic other courses on Front End Masters. I watched some of the algorithms courses that other teachers have done just to get a sense of what's being presented, making sure that I'm presenting things both consistently but also in my own voice. So there's some really fantastic ones. Um, I think one actually just came out recently, the Primagean had an had a algorithms course, was really fantastic. So check out all, all of those great resources on here as well. Um, all right, so and just to some recommended reading, depends on kind of your background with computer science. I feel like a lot of times people get upset with this general topic because the first Google that you do and you land on a Wikipedia page and they start throwing a bunch of mathematical symbols or complex terminology and it might feel like this general idea of algorithms and data structures is hard unless you have some sort of formal background. I do have a computer science background but it's 25 years old at this point so I think at least half if not the majority of my skills in this area are the practical on the job skills rather than all the theoretical stuff you get taught in school. And what I hope you take away from that is that not that education isn't helpful, but that it's not requisite. It's not a requirement that you've gone through some sort of hardcore course to be able to learn this stuff. And I found these books a couple of years ago. I started with the computer science distilled and then a couple of years later, the unleashed one came out. I'm not even going to try to pronounce this guy's name because I'm sure I'll butcher it. But the books are fantastic, especially the computer science distilled. Um, it really is like if, if, you've, if you have a computer science background, then it's a review of those things. It sort of it hits the high topics and you say, oh, yeah, I remember red black tree or I remember this kind of sort or whatever. But it doesn't get too into the weeds. It's just it's an outline. It's a roadmap of the things that you might want to go back and check on. If you don't have a computer science background, it's actually a really fantastic outline of things that you could go dig into to learn computer science without having gone through, you know, say a four-year college degree. So I really highly recommend that book. And a lot of the things that I use in sort of a practical sense are founded in things that you might read in this book. So there's, it's both, it, by the name, it's both theory and practice. And I think that's really kind of the way to go with this stuff. So I recommend those books. I don't have any affiliate links. I'm not getting anything for it. But I, I do think those are very useful books to read. A couple of disclaimers. I kind of already have hinted at this. But the other courses that Frontend Masters has and other resources that you find out there in the world tend to take a pretty straightforward, what I would call almost an academic lecture approach. And I don't mean this in a disparaging way. But there's, there's kind of a standard set of topics that you're supposed to go over that maps similar to what you learn in you know your first couple of semesters of a computer science degree taking data structures courses and I want you to think of this course as not that uh, there are other great courses again the, the Primagena and others other great courses on those topics this I want you to think of more like your lab course if you've been if you've taken a college course where you had to do a, a lecture and a lab I want you to think of this one more like the lab course Second disclaimer, might ruffle a bit of feathers, um, but we're using JavaScript, but I'm like, eh, we have to use JavaScript. I'm not like, I want to use JavaScript. I love, you know, this is absolutely the right language for this. It's the most widespread language, and I don't think anybody can deny that. And I've built an entire career being happy with JavaScript. Personally, I kind of consider myself in a transition point to post JavaScript. But JavaScript is going to be around, and I'm going to be writing JavaScript till the end of my career, I'm quite certain. So, you know, we have to use JavaScript. It's a, it's a great language. There are pros and cons to us taking on a topic like this in a language like JavaScript. One of the pros is its accessibility, is how easy it is to get things done, how much of the underlying mechanisms you don't have to worry about because JavaScript, the language, is taking care of those things for you. 
And that goes for garbage collection, it goes for typing, it goes for all kinds of things. The downside to that is that most of the theory behind data structures and algorithms is based on you being able to have control over those things. So it doesn't mean that none of it's applicable to JavaScript, but for example, there are algorithms that are written specifically because they know that in a language where memory is contiguously marked and you go from one place to another in an array, then those are contiguous memory segments and accessing the next element in the array is a, basically a no-op, it's just a single addition of a pointer. They're, they're based on that sort of internal knowledge and we would apply the same algorithm to JavaScript, and while we might get great performance, we're not gonna get the performance that the algorithm designers intended because we're not using at all the same kind of mechanism. We're several levels higher in abstraction at that point. So do take with a bit of a grain of salt when you get into those hardcore algorithms. You know, I'm talking about things like quicksort and stuff like that. If you get into the deepness of these algorithms, you do have to take with a grain of salt that what you are coding in JavaScript may functionally work, but may not have the same kind of characteristics that the original design intended. Another example is, you know, it, it may be easy for you to code an algorithm where you create an array and return it and then spread that array into a bigger array, and that's just sort of a, it seems to, in the JavaScript world, as a free operation, but you're creating a tremendous amount of garbage collection pressure. And that's something that the designers of many of the classical algorithms never had to worry about. They did not worry that, oh, you know, right in the middle of my really fast operation, it's going to throw up a garbage collector that blocks the thread or something. So there are lots of balances that we have to take, which is, again, why I treat this more like a lab course than a theory or academic course. Lots of balances that we have to play between the processing and the memory. In fact, we'll get into some of that kind of like memory management stuff in a garbage collected world. Those are things that you know, the original founders of, of you know, data structure science and computer science, they wouldn't have even needed to concern themselves with because they used systems that didn't have those same properties. So that's what I mean when I sort of shrug and say, meh, we have to use JavaScript, we're gonna use JavaScript. I don't have anything, you know, I don't hold any grudges against JavaScript, but in a perfect world, you'd probably be tackling the learning of this through one of those lower level languages. But then again, you know, 99% of us aren't going to go learn those languages, so we don't want to be stuck and, you know, gate kept out of the knowledge of this. And, and there's plenty to be gained from applying proper thinking in whatever layer of abstraction you're working in. Okay? So just so you're aware, keep those caveats in mind as we go forward. I wanted to give a brief TL didn't watch, too long didn't watch. This is, a, this is a quick summary of kind of the takeaways that I'm going to illustrate throughout the entire workshop. These are principles that you might take at face value or you might not fully appreciate, but hopefully by the end of this course, you appreciate that these things are really important. The first one that I want to highlight is asking better clarifying questions. Anytime you're presented with a problem, whether it's somebody stating a problem to you or it's just there's an issue filed or there's a feature that you don't know how to implement or whatever. Anytime there's a problem presented to you, your first job is to understand that problem completely. Your first job is not to write code. That's the last thing you do and that's optional. The first thing you have to do is understand the problem. And we cannot get that with one single question. That is a progressive thing. It's a cyclical thing we have to come back to. We have to reapproach a problem and realize later, I should have asked this before. If you can get better at having that almost uncanny ability to ask the right questions up front, that really is probably the best approximation of seniority and maturity and experience as an engineer is just the instinct to ask the right questions earlier. That, that, there's no magic trick to it. In fact, I tell people that's really the only difference between me and any other JavaScript developer, even somebody who just started in a boot camp, is that I've just asked more questions of the language and I didn't stop when I got an answer, I asked another question, that's it. So just, if I have a superpower, it's asking questions. And so I wanna encourage you to adopt that mindset. It does not show weakness. It does not show that we're not good enough or anything like that. In fact, it's a superpower. 
If you can be the one who asks the best questions in the room, you'll be the one who's providing value long, long after everybody else has left the room. So I, I strongly encourage that. So when, you, when you're faced with a problem, you have to ask the right questions to constrain the problem because the answers to those questions, sometimes you won't get an answer. They'll say, I don't know, depends, right? But sometimes you'll get a concrete answer and that very much may guide you to an entirely different path for solving the problem. So don't forsake getting those sort of clarifying questions as early as possible and then revisiting that as often as possible. Second one I already kind of mentioned or referred to, we definitely want to balance what we do with the processing optimizations versus what we do with memory optimizations. Most of the time, people only care about performance, the speed, the CPU processing speed, and they tend to neglect the memory. And in a language like JavaScript, it makes it even easier for you to neglect the memory and even easier to shoot yourself in the foot where something is running super fast until it completely stops for two seconds while it cleans up all of your memory mistakes. So don't make that mistake. Do be aware at all times of the trade-offs. There are not always trade-offs, by the way. I used to think this earlier in my career. I used to think there's no such thing as a performant and memory optimized. It's one or the other. And in a lot of cases, it feels like that. A lot of cases, the trade-offs that we make do feel like that. But there are times, and you will see in this workshop, we will come up with a solution that is both better in performance and better in memory management. And that's a win-win. So look for those. But when you can't find those, be aware of the differences. That means asking, where is this application going to run? If it's going to run on low-end smartphone devices in you know, third world countries or other parts of the world that don't have the same access to you know, privileged access to, to high-end devices that we do, if that's what that means, then you might need to actually make a totally different choice there versus I'm, the only people that are ever going to run this are you know, high-end Mac Pros or you know, something like that. So that goes back to number one, asking better questions, understanding the context of where this stuff is going to run. Number three, this is kind of a big pet peeve of mine. I don't hear enough people say this, but I think most of the people who teach this really believe it. They just don't call it out. So I'm going to call it out that you really actually need to get good at understanding the problem and then shaping what data structure you use or how you use it to that problem rather than the reverse, rather than trying to say, all I've got to, is a queue and I've got to figure out some way to express my problem as if I can solve it with a queue. Oftentimes, you can solve most problems with many different data structures, but most of those are not the best way to go. So what you want to do is develop a broader understanding of the various ways to use data structures, to combine them, to mix and match them, just br more broadly. I mean, there's dozens and hundreds of different data structures, some of them general, some of them very highly specialized. And n none of us can keep all of that in our head, but the more of that that you have in your head, the easier it will be for you to identify this is more likely the school or the group of those problems that are going to help me solve my problem. These data structures are more well aligned. So literally aligning the data structure choice with the problem is one of the big, biggest hurdles that we have to get over. Because our job as an algorithmist, our job as an engineer, is to turn what we have in our heads into instructions for the computer. And if those two are misaligned, our code is going to be non-performant, buggy, hard to maintain, and ultimately it's going to get rewritten. That's the ultimate cycle is that every code that we write, every line of code that we write suffers that same fate that somebody comes along later, doesn't understand it, and just rewrites it. And as an algorithmist, we should be trying to ask those questions and think about it more carefully so that hopefully the code that we write is more robust. It's going to survive those, re those inevitable rewrite cycles. Somebody comes along and says, well, I don't know about all this other stuff, but this thing is solid. This code does what it's supposed to do, and it's as good as we're going to get it. That's sort of the ideal, if you will, that, we, that, you, could sh that you could shoot for. Final point that I'll make. Many of you have probably heard the famous um, quote. I did a little bit of like digging, and actually I'm not sure that it was even uh, Newt's original idea. Maybe he cribbed it from a few other people. But many of you have heard this common quote about 
you know, don't, don't, the, or premature optimization is the root of all evil. Don't prematurely optimize, right? Like this, this concept that anytime somebody sees an engineer working on an optimization of something, it seems like there's almost an automatic doubt that what they're doing is even worth it. Like there's this presumption that if you're optimizing something, you're probably prematurely optimizing it. And what I will say is that, and we're gonna, we're gonna teach this as a practice. I could have put this as a fifth point up here. We're gonna teach it as a practice that when you tackle an algorithmic problem, the first solution that you do should be the dumbest and worst solution. It should be the quickest thing that you can get that is accurate, in my, in my opinion. It should work, but it should be, you should not have to spend days or weeks trying to conceive of that solution. Even if it's horribly non-performant, even if it's completely impractical to launch to production, you actually need a reference solution so that the optimizations that you can do, you can check to make sure that you're doing it correctly. Most people will skip over that step. They'll try to you know, sort of second guess things. I absolutely do this. I know for a fact that you know, an n squared algorithm, for example, is gonna not work, so I'll just avoid even writing the code. And as a discipline, I'm gonna teach you that it's really important to have that reference implementation that was quick to write so that you can benchmark and so that you can check your answers, okay? Testing to make sure that you didn't create some regression because you were trying to optimize something. So what I would say is that premature optimization is not really the problem, it's immature optimization. There are things that you should be optimizing from the very first moment that you write some code, and there are things that will never matter. You, you think you're optimizing them, but they will never matter. I'll, I'll pick on one, for example, uh, that I sometimes see floating around in the world, is that people claim, for example, that if you use the const keyword, that somehow magically underneath JavaScript's engine covers that it's gonna, more, it's, it's gonna do less work because it knows it's never gonna get mutated or something. And I don't actually know whether that's true, but I'm just gonna go out on a limb and say it's completely irrelevant. There is never going to be a case where the choice between a varlet and const was the difference between performance and non-performant code. That's just nonsense. It just, it is, okay? so. Immature optimization, one of the things that I'd put under that umbrella is trying to micro-optimize or trying to look at some implementation detail and say, I know that V8 uses hidden classes and blah, blah, blah. And then tomorrow, V8 ships a new version and all that's different. My advice is don't bet against the future. That practice of saying, I know now better than the engine, better than the compiler, better than the computer, I know these things better than they do, is you betting against the future of all of those incredibly smart folks who are working on optimizing that stuff. That's one of the reasons that I like JavaScript is I like to be able to let it do its, what it's really good at. They're really good at optimizing JavaScript. And I don't wanna fight against that and try to convince JavaScript that I know better. I certainly wouldn't wanna write a code, I would never endorse writing a piece of code that's gonna work great in V8 and suck in SpiderMonkey, for example. And that happens all the time because people actually feel almost an ego boost when they learn some internal detail and then they optimize their code for that and then it turns out they didn't even care about testing it in some other JavaScript engine. So I would say that the real thing that we should be worried about is immature optimization. How do you get more mature at it? Practice, experience. But don't follow the bandwagon of oh, I'm not allowed to optimize now or I'm only allowed to optimize in this specific way because this guy, this person said this or whatever, don't follow that. Look at the problem, follow these steps, and that's the path cyclically, experience over experience over experience, is the path to more mature optimization. And optimization is good, it's useful. You need to understand actually the full context of Newth's quote, which was not just that all premature optimization is bad, but what he was saying is that many times people focus on the non-critical paths of their application, and they optimize stuff that won't actually matter. So that's, that's really speaking to what I'm talking about, about being more mature with it. If you can figure out what the critical path is, that's, that's the $64 million question. What is the critical path? It turns out that's not a binary one, you know, it is or is not critical path. It's extremely context dependent. So we have to get more mature, and we have to get better at asking questions about our systems, our requirements, our problems, the context that our code will run in,
before we can ever hope to figure out where's the 3% that my attention should go. Okay, any questions about the TLDW? That's your five or six minute spiel if you're not interested in watching the whole rest of the course. Those are the big takeaways. All right, I wanted to start with a quick primer on DSA, data structures and algorithms. This is the few minute version of what is full courses for other people, right? So I'm, I'm definitely not going deep into detail. We will get into many of these topics and come back to them as we code along. But I just wanted to present for those of you that maybe don't know some of the terms, just so you have a little bit of basic familiarity with the terms, how they relate to each other. These are the sorts of terms that you go and Google and find the Wikipedia pages for. And just read the first three paragraphs of any Wikipedia page, because beyond that, probably too much depth for you. But the first three paragraphs of any one of these Wikipedia pages is probably enough to get you a familiarity, like, oh, okay, I know where that's going to fit into the overall scheme of things. Some common data structures to be aware of. These may be familiar to many of you, maybe not familiar to some of you. I just picked a few of them that you definitely want to have on your radar screen and have done some at least minimal research on. Arrays, we talked about that, the concept of sequentially ordering li uh, you know, a list of values. They go, they go by lots of different names, lists and arrays and vectors. And There's all kinds of sub nuances and caveats underneath each one of these. But arrays are sequentially, generally index ordered, numerically indexed collections of values. Stacks are most always built on top of arrays, although they don't have to be built on top of arrays. They can be built on top of other, other primitive data structures. But a stack is kind of like an array with an additional property, which is that we only put onto the end and we only take off of the end. So if I start out with two values in a stack, and I want to take one value off, I don't take the first item off, I take the last item off, because it's last in, first out, so-called LIFO. Last in, first out is what we have with stacks. Stacks are immensely important to understand. They go, we use terminology like pushing and popping. We push onto a stack. My favorite visualization of that is the stack of pancakes. I got four pancakes, that's not enough. Give me a fifth pancake. You put a fifth pancake on top, okay? And then I eat a pancake, and then we've popped it off the stack, and now I'm back to four, and now I need a fifth one again. Just tell the waiter, always keep five pancakes on top. Okay? So there's your stack, right? And, and this, this is immensely common in programming. We'll see this over and over and over again. You'll hear that word stack over and over again used, so be familiar with it. Queues, similar to stack, but it's a first in, first out instead of last in, first out. In the queue world, again, often implemented with an array, can be implemented with other things like linked lists and so forth. But in a queue, the first thing that we put in, no matter how much else we put in, the first thing that we put in is the thing we're going to take out. Queue being like a line. Just think of it like a line at the, you know, waiting to get on a roller coaster. Generally, we don't let people cut in line, so the next person in line is the one that gets to get on the roller coaster. Just think of it like that. And again, we use those a lot. We'll see queues today in use in some of our algorithms. These are kind of like Lego pieces that you end up putting algorithms on top of. So data structures are the mechanisms by which we implement our various algorithms. A couple of others, we've got sets. So what is a set? Again, often implemented as an array, but can be implemented with other primitive data structures. Sets are basically like, I want an unordered collection that is unique. Unordered is important. In arrays, they're ordered. So if you were implementing a set with an array, you would actually have to go to a little bit of extra trouble to make it seem as if the array was set-like because two sets with the same values in a different order should be equivalent. And two arrays with the values in different orders would definitely be different, right? So you have to go to a little bit of extra trouble and that might be why you didn't actually implement a set with an array. Maybe you implemented it with something else. Again, lots of choices there. But sets are an unordered collection of unique values. Extremely helpful. We will see uh, traversal algorithm. We'll, we will implement traversal algorithms and talk about traversal algorithms where we need to remember that we visited something before. You throw it into a set, and then you ask the set, have I seen this thing before? Extremely useful. 
Could you do that with an array? Of course you could. We've got array, we've got array includes or index of or whatever. But that's not the right tool for the job. The right tool for the job is set. Why? Because you would not want to just keep throwing the same value into that array over and over and have it grow and grow and waste your memory. A set's going to make sure we only have one copy of the thing. So that's sets. I don't know. Uh, yeah, you sir. take a brief look at the chat if there's sure. anything worth pulling or you would like to pull out of there. but. We've got people mostly making some, what you're mo saying. yeah, making some of the same points. Yeah. So. I'll talk about map in a moment, and then we can answer the question about. There's a question being asked about what, when would you use a map versus set. They're very different data structures, so you wouldn't, you would almost never use one interchangeably with the other. They're very, for very different types of problems. Objects. I throw that up here because. It's, it's a nice, simple, recognizable word for key, val key value data structure. And by key, in JavaScript in particular, we mean something like a string key. So that's contrasted with something like an array, which is that the location of the data is numerically indexed and it's generally contiguous. Here in an object, you can have string keys that are not contiguous, that aren't related in any way, you know, whatever. And so, you're probably familiar with these sorts of things, JSON objects, or how we, how most people kind of visualize this. But an object is simply a, a place to store some data in a collection and give it a unique name, generally a string. You technically can use numbers because it just stringifies the number for the key. But usually you stick to numeric indexing on arrays and string indexing on objects. What's a map? A lot of people get confused, object versus map. Maps are very similar, but maps under the covers fundamentally say we can use any value as our key, not simply a string. And that is why that gives rise to the more formal concept, which is called a hash map. What does that mean? Or, uh, there's other terms that you'll find as you Google around for this. But a map has to take any value, and if it's a string or a number, it's real easy. Right? We just know where to store stuff if we've got strings and numbers, or at least we can think in our minds, I know where I would probably store something if the key was a number or a string. But what if the key is a function? Function's a, a weird value. What would I do? Would I stringify the function or whatever? So there's this notion of hashing something. A hash is a one-way mathematical transform on a value that produces, ideally, a unique value. Unfortunately, there's no perfect hashing, so we always have what's called collisions. And the job of an implementer of something like a hash map is, what do I do if two different values, I push through some transform, and I get a hash to use as the key, and both values end up with the same key? They end up with the same hash. What do I do? Um, and so there's lots of different strategies for how to deal with that. You have these kind of exotic data structures where there's a hash key mechanism used to do the single slot and that in it, and at any given slot then it's simply an array a list of all the values that were you know that had a collision in their key or something so you know it's lots of different complexities there not relevant to our discussion in this workshop but now understanding maps and sets you can see that in a set its key is completely irrelevant it's simply the inclusion in the data structure. That's the only question we want to ask of the data structure is, does it have it or not? I don't care where it is. I don't care how you stored it. I don't care how you implemented it. Just tell me, do you have it or not? And ideally, I mean, also, it needs to, there needs to only be one of it, right? Don't ever let there be more than one of it. So the kinds of questions we'd ask, like inclusion or exclusion, is it there or is it not? We'd ask that of a set. You technically could ask that of a map, like, does it have the key? But again, that's not the right data structure for that kind of question. So you often would not, I mean, it, it's not to say that you couldn't, and sometimes we do stick a key into an object to represent that we've seen it or not seen it or whatever, but you usually only use something like a map or a hash map when you're going to go retrieve it by its index. In a set, you don't need to retrieve it because you already have the value, and you're asking, do I, is the value already in there? But with uh, something like a map or a hash map, 
you wouldn't have the value, but you would have the key, you would have the index, the property name, whatever, you would have that, and you would be saying, hey, go t tell me what the value is for this thing. So it's more of a lookup as opposed to an inclusion exclusion question. Just different kinds of problems that we solve. They're both useful. We do th use them for different things. Hopefully that helps answer the question from the chat. If not, clarify your question. Moving on, we've got trees and graphs. Uh, trees are extremely common. We use them quite a bit. And many people, if pressed, can't actually tell you what's the difference between a tree and a graph. They are very different. Uh, and some of you listening probably are like, yeah, they're, they're used for very, very different things. They have different properties. What's interesting about the algorithms that we are going to look at and the algorithms that you're likely to run across is that many times there is a version of the algorithm for kind of each of these different classes of data structure. So there are algorithms that work on trees that have an adaptation, sometimes just a one for one and sometimes a slight tweak, an adaptation that works on a graph. But graphs are going to throw more complexity in, so the algorithm has to generally be a little bit smarter to handle what am I doing with a graph. And there's lots of different kinds of graphs. There's directed and undirected, there's cyclic and acyclic, there's all kinds of stuff. But generally, if you learn an algorithm in a tree, a tree algorithm, there's at least some way to apply that or translate that concept over into the graph world. So what's the difference between a graph and a tree? A graph is going to allow all of those sorts of uh, multiple connections. So you can have multiple parents. One node can have you know, multiple inbound arrows if you were drawing it out in your mind. That's a graph. In a tree, the relationship is always unidirectional. A child only has one parent. It never has two parents. So there's no such thing as cycles. Trees are inherently directed from parent to child relationship. Graphs are not inherently directed, meaning that the arrows have a certain way that they go. But you can create directed trees, I mean directed graphs. Or you can create kind of undirected or unidirected, uniconnected, um, universally connected graphs. So some things, some words that I've been spouting out, words that you see here in the slide, these are things, if any of them are unfamiliar to you, just make yourself a note. I should go and read the first few paragraphs on a Wikipedia page just to kind of get a little bit more comfortable with them. We'll see them in practice as we go. There was a question here. Yes. Yeah. So uh, the, uh, if we look at the categories, you, you know, the array stack queue, set object map, and tree graph, uh, is another way of thinking about the differences between those groups. Uh, you have a change in the permissiveness, say, of ordering and indexing. So array is going, uh, arrays, stacks, queues, if you, they're pretty friendly to what you throw at them. Sets, objects, and maps are going to be much more reactive to what you try to put in them. You have to know kind of how they're going to behave and what you want out of them. And trees and graphs are an absolute mess if you don't go in with a plan because they'll do anything you want and the tree will turn into a graph. So we have to have a way of uh, accessing the, we have to have kind of a, an expectation for ourselves to access the information because the data structures provide less uh, rules hmm. uh, as you move from one to the next. Is that a fair interpretation here? I don't disagree with any of what you said. I think it's a, a pretty reasonable way of, of summarizing things. I won't take credit that I had any deep thought exactly in exactly how I you know, categorized these or whatever, but there is definitely a difference between whether order matters in the data structure or not. That's one of the big characteristics that will differentiate data structures. And you see that arrays, stacks, and queues order absolutely matters. In set object and map, order does not matter at all. In fact, the concept of order is somewhat undefined. Um, in trees, order absolutely matters, and in graphs, it depends. It depends on the kind of graph. So ordering is certainly one of the characteristics that we could distinguish data structures with. I think there are various other ones, but I, I agree with your general interpretation that that's a, that's a primary characteristic to keep in mind. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about some common algorithms. Not all of these are ones that we're going to tackle again. These are just things that you, you'll hear, that you'll Google, you'll find. There are sorting algorithms. A couple of the most 
famous ones are bubble sort and quick sort. There are dozens of other ones. There's all kinds of general and specialized sorts for different conditions. I'm going to be straight up honest with you. I don't care about sorting at all. It's the least interesting DSA topic to me. People have figured that out. They've written volumes of information about them. And the, the most that I've ever cared about the sorting algorithm is I love the little fancy animated you know, animations where they show how it works conceptually or whatever. That's about as much as I'm going to care. So we're not going to deal with sorting in this. And, and sorting is, is one of those key common topics that are covered in a DSA course. I'm just going to skip it because I think it's not as interesting. Um, if I need to sort something, I'm pretty likely to just use the built-in JavaScript sort. And if that's somehow, for some reason, not going to work, then I'm just going to grab a quick sort implementation, most likely. I'm not going to get much deeper than that in my own coding. Um, but you know, your, your, your mileage may vary. Your mileage will vary um, on that. All right, so setting aside sorts, there are things that I find much more interesting. And I, the kinds of work that I tackle I've seem to come, a lot, come across a lot more often. Traversing things like trees and graphs. And when we get into graphs, we have this interesting concept called pathfinding, which is I have this you know, multi-connected set of these different elements or what we call nodes in a, in a graph. And they may not actually have direct connections to each other. So there's various different circuitous routes that I could take to go from one node in the graph to another node in the graph. And there are different reasons why I might want to take one route versus another. For example, you might have what's called a weighted graph meaning that the connection between node A and B costs more for some definition of cost than the, def than the connection from A to C. And it might be that a longer route, meaning more hops, costs less than the more direct route. So we can think about a variety of different real world metaphors for this, like toll bridges and things like that. There's a more circuitous route that costs less, takes you longer. There's the more direct route. You get there quicker, but now you've got to pay a higher toll. By the way, I talk about toll roads and toll bridges. That's not, I, I used to think that must be one of those universal cultural references, and it's not. I've gone places in the world that people are like, you have to pay to use a road? It's like completely foreign to them. I grew up in the land of toll roads. I, I happily pay that as one of my little life's luxury taxes. I don't worry about toll roads. But, for some people, that's a foreign concept. So uh, maybe you need a different metaphor there. Insert your own metaphor for having to having something that that you have to pay more to get across or something. I don't know. Anyway, so we have algorithms that allow us to go through a tree. And again, remember, trees are ordered. So the order that we go through the tree is a big deal. So, well, sometimes, sometimes we want to just visit every node in the tree, and it doesn't matter what order we visit them in. But many, and I would say maybe even most of the time, if we're going to go through a tree, the order matters. The order matters perhaps because we're processing all of the elements in the tree, and the operations that we're processing with are not commutative, so the order of the operations matters. Sometimes it's that we're traversing through a tree, and we need to stop early. So obviously, the order matters, because if we go in the wrong order, we're not going to stop as early as we wanted to. So those are things to think about. And then I threw up here binary search. Similar to sorting, search algorithms to me seem pretty straightforward. And I, again, don't end up implementing search algorithms in the classical sense very often. But the concept of binary search, we'll get into this in the next slide, the concept of binary search being recursive, that's pretty important. So being able to understand the, the underlying principle of something like binary search meaning divide a problem into multiple pieces. In the binary world, that's divided into two pieces, so divide it in half and only work with half the problem and then divide it again in half. But there's higher order divisions where you divide it into three or four or whatever. So binary is just the most common, and that means divide it in half. Divide and conquer would be sort of a general term for that. And finally, a few of the techniques. These are things that we'll go through throughout the workshop. These are common techniques that you end up using to create your algorithms. You implement algorithms. These are some of those Lego pieces that we put together. Iteration, pretty straightforward. Things like for loops, while loops. We're going to iterate in order 
for a certain amount of time or perhaps just an arbitrary amount of time when you have like a while true loop that's just going to keep going until you've exhausted the entire uh, space. So that's iteration. Recursion, one of those terms I heard somebody earlier talk about regular expressions. Those are things that we can kind of be sometimes frightened about uh, with recursion. It's similar. There's a few other topics in computer science that people kind of feel like uh, those are like taboo or difficult. In fact, closure is one of those that many people feel like you have to have this special magical enlightenment to be able to, to understand. We are going to use recursion a lot. Depending on your level of comfort with recursion, some of that may feel a bit uncomfortable. But you absolutely cannot make any progress in this DSA topic and data structures and algorithms without getting comfortable with it. So whereas somebody might be able to tell you, you can get away with never using a regular expression. I don't necessarily agree with that, but you might have somebody say, you don't need a regular expression. There's other ways to solve those problems uh, or at least abstract those problems. While that might be true of regular expressions, you can't get anywhere <laughs> in this world without, you know, in this topic without getting real comfortable with recursion. So I think it's just one of those bullets that we need to bite. Uh, we need to tackle it. So we're going to use it quite a bit. Put very simply, recursion means that a function ends up calling itself either directly or indirectly. So a cycle of function calls where it, where while the function is still running, another inv invocation on the call stack, there's that word stack that we referred to. So you think about a function call and then when it calls another function while it's still running, then it adds to what we call the call stack. Right? So you have these functions that call each other. That's not the same thing as calling a function, it finishing, and then calling another function and it finishing. It's call function A, who then, while it's running, invokes function B. And while it's running, invokes function C. That's what we mean by the call stack. That's stacking up. And if A calls B and B calls A, then you would have a stack. You'd have A, B, A. Or if A calls B, B calls C, and C calls A, now you have a cycle. Either one of those is what we call recursion. And you might be thinking, why on earth would you have A calling A or A calling B? Or, you know, what, why would you have direct or indirect recursion? Why would you allow that sort of thing to happen? The answer is that the call stack is an abstraction over iteration with state management. Every time we invoke a new function, we get a new set of state that is encapsulated in that function call. And therefore, we have this stack where we're doing things. We're stacking up work, A, B, C, D, however deep it goes, could go 10,000 deep, right? Each one of those individual function calls has its own state. And what we're asking the engine to do, the JavaScript engine in this case, is manage that state for us in a stack where it pushes it on and pops it off. The entire world of that function gets pushed onto the stack, and then when it's done, it pops off. I don't want to worry about all of that stuff. Well, what if I did worry about it? I absolutely could take any recursive algorithm and implement it with an iteration, with a while loop. And what I would have to do is take every bit of state that I need for each one of those levels and manage it in my own stack. Can I do that? Yes. Sometimes I do do that. Sometimes I do implement something that we would think of recursively. You, you can implement it iteratively and vice versa. They are w what we call in, in a formal mathematical term, they're isomorphic of each other. Any recursion can be expressed iteratively. And in fact, most compilers for most languages unroll you know, these sorts of things that will unroll recursion and make it a loop or sometimes vice versa because uh, the, the same is also true, or generally true. So you have to be real familiar with iteration. And most of us that have done any sort of imperative programming, we're familiar with for loops and while loops and so forth. Maybe less familiar with recursion, but you just need to understand that that's asking the, the engine to do our iteration for us. It's an abstraction over iteration that says, I'm going to need this state at, to be separate for each of these iterations. And I want you to manage that. I'm going to do that through the call stack rather than through my own data structure. In fact, we have examples of places uh, in modern framework world where the call stack 
that as we think of as being a built-in thing that we just invoke and use, turns out the call stack isn't quite malleable enough for some frameworks, and they have re-implemented the entire concept of a call stack in the framework so that they have control. I'm, I'm referring to React and fibers and non-local continuations and stuff, but like you can get real deep with this. So anything that you think of that's built in, could you could re-implement yourself. You could implement memory management yourself if you wanted. You shouldn't, but you could. Right? So recursion is just a dual of or isomorphic of the iteration, and sometimes it's more convenient to invoke recursion than it is to do it with iteration. In fact, there'll be we'll see an example where we're going through a tree, and you typically think, because trees are typically referred to as a recursively defined data structure because every node is its own subtree. That's what we mean by recursively defined data structure. Because trees are recursive data structures, recursion is a very natural operation to use to traverse them. But that's not always true. The breadth first traversal, again, we'll come back to this later, but the breadth first traversal of a tree is much more complicated to represent recursively. In fact, most people don't re implement it recursively. You could, but most people don't. They implement it with an iterative loop and a queue. An iterative loop plus a queue is a breadth first traversal of a tree. And we'll come back to some of that stuff. So if that feels unfamiliar to you, don't worry. We're coming back to it. I'm just giving you a sense of how these pieces can fit together. OK, uh, the last thing I have listed up here is indexes and references. I really couldn't come up with a good term to describe what, I'm, what I mean here. But I'm using indexes in the database sense when I talk about this concept of an index. You might have a main data structure, let's say, for example, an array. It's an ordered, you know, sequentially ordered collection of values. Doesn't matter what the value types are, it's just or sequentially ordered. But you might want a separate data structure alongside that array that tells you something about some or all of the elements in there. Here's an example. I want to know all of the elements in the array. I need quick access to all of the elements in the array whose value starts with the letter A. And that's literally like what databases do. When they create indexes, they have this big old table of all your data. And then they create these separate data structures that say, if you're going to look for all the things that start with A, if you're going to look for all the IDs that are even or whatever, we maintain this separate list, this separate data structure that's not a copy of the data. It's pointers, it's references into the data. This is extremely common in data structure uh, algorithm creation, is that we construct a main data structure, and rather than duplicating the data, we construct these other data structures that have references to, that references into these places, and we can access them. You can access it sequentially and by name, if you will. Like those, are, those are generally at odds, but we can have two parallel data structures, one with references to the other. That's what I mean here. That's an, another extremely common technique. So these are things that we will see play out for us. I wanted to give you a visualization of thinking through these different um, mechanisms, these different techniques. There's a logic problem that I was presented on a job interview 20 something years ago. And I, after being presented this, almost immediately started using it myself when I gave job interviews because I just loved the idea of this problem and what it illustrates. And so some of you may have heard it, some of you may have never. It's the problem of the eight golden spheres. And we have eight golden spheres here, and we have a traditional balance scale, meaning that it is only balanced when the weight on both sides of the scale is equal. What we're told about these golden spheres is that they are identical in texture, size, shape, color, everything, except one of the eight, we don't know which, is imperceptibly lighter than the other seven. That's the only thing that we know about the problem. We know that one of them weighs a little bit less. Not enough that you could hold it in your hand and tell, but we know that one of them is less. And the problem is, how do we find it? How do we find the odd one out? How do we find the lighter one? There are multiple ways to solve this problem, but when presented in a job interview, what they're kind of looking for is like, how do you translate a real world problem into an algorithm, into data structure and algorithm approaches? 
So rather than put you on the spot, some of you are still working through your first cup of coffee. Rather than put you on the spot, I'm going to walk you through three different ways to solve this problem. We get three different answers to it. But the basic setup is how do I use this balance scale to guarantee in the worst case that I find the odd ball out? And what's the minimum worst case number of usages of the balance scale to get that? So perhaps some of you are thinking right off the bat, I'll stick one ball on either side of the balance scale. And if they're equal, then I've eliminated those two because neither one of them can be the one. If they're unequal, then I immediately know which one was lighter. It's the one that went up. In the worst case, they were equal, so I need to go on to two more. And in the worst case, those were also equal, so I go on to two more. And in the worst case, I've eliminated six now. I've used the balance scale three times, and on this final fourth time, I'm guaranteed to know which one was the lightest. So in the worst case, we used it four times. And this is an iterative approach to the problem. We took two elements, we compared them, we kept going until we had gone, potentially, worst case, through the entire data set, and we have guaranteed ourselves that we found it. Similar to a search algorithm, iteratively going through, this is effectively a search algorithm, right? So, a lot of times in a job interview, somebody says four. That's the answer. That's the minimum number of usages. And the interviewer might nod and say, that's a good answer. But if I told you that there's a way to do it in fewer usages, how would you do that? OK, so let's flip the script around a little bit. Instead of starting with one on each side, let's start with more than one on each side. In fact, let's start with three on each side. Or, I'm sorry, four on each side. Right? We've got eight balls. Let's Divided in half, we'll put four on one side, four on the other side. Now, what this usage of the scale is going to tell me is that I know that the lighter one is in a set of four. It's, one, it's on one side or the other. But I don't yet know which one it is. I've just narrowed my problem down. You follow me? So let's say it was the left-hand side that was lighter. Then we take those four and we split them in half, and we put two and two. Now I've eliminated two more. I've eliminated a total of six. I'm left with only two balls for sure. I know it's one of those two. I put them on the scale a final time. Now I've used the scale three times. And this is the binary search. It's recursive solution to the problem. So when you're on a job interview and somebody's asked you this, and you, you might jump immediately to the recursive, but many people jump first to the iterative, and then they realize, oh, I could have done it recursively. And so they got it down from four usages to three. We have a more optimal algorithm. But then the interviewer gets a little glimmer in their eye, and he says, what if I can tell you that it could be done in fewer usages? How would you do it in fewer? We went from one and one all the way to the other side, doing it in four and four. We can't do more than that. We can't do like eight and eight, because there's only eight total. So by process of what we call discrete math, there's only two other choices, right? We can't put an uneven number of balls on the scale. That's not going to tell us anything. They have to be even. So we can either put two and two, and you could run through that mental exercise. I didn't create that as a slide, but you could either put two and two, or you could put three and three. So let's just try three and three. We're going to put three on either side. Now, what's going to happen? There's two possible outcomes. Either we're going to see the balance scale completely balanced, which means we have eliminated six of our balls. And in that case, we only have two left. We only need to use the scale one more time to identify the odd ball out. You follow me? But what if one side is uneven? How many have we eliminated in that case? Let me see if you're awake. If we put three and three on there and the scale is not balanced, how many balls have we eliminated by that usage? Five. 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 Good. Five, because we have the three that we know are heavier, and the other two that we didn't even try, we know that they're not it. We know that the problem ball or the odd ball is in this set of three, but that's not an even number. How are we going to use the scale? Well, we've used it once, and now we've narrowed our problem down to three. Now, you simply pick any two and weigh them. If they are even, you know by process of elimination it's the one you didn't try. If they're uneven, you know that it's the one that's lighter. 
So in the worst case scenario, we only had to use the scale twice. What is this algorithm called? I call it the fuzzy search algorithm. I don't know. But can you see how we thought a little bit outside of the box? We asked something more of our problem, which is, is it definitely true that I can only use the scale with an even number? We understood something about the nature of, again, what we call discrete math. You can't divide the balls. So we only have a fixed number of possible balls to ever put into this problem. That let us know that we have one on either side, two on either side, three on either side, or four on either side. That's our fixed problem space. So we could examine that in both cases. A lot of times when somebody's faced with this on the job interview, they kind of tense up and get a little bit frustrated. And something as basic as that, all you have to do is try the four possible things. Right? You don't have to solve for millions of possible combinations. There's only four possible. If you have a computer science background, that immediately jumps out to you as a discrete math principle, similar to the birthday problem. If you heard the birthday problem, which says that if you have 95% uh, of, or if you have more than 30 people in a room, there's a 95% chance that at least two people in the room have the same birthday. And that's, we actually solve that. I'm not going to do it here for you. But the der derivation of that answer is actually discrete math. So when you have a more formal background, some of that might jump out. But even if you didn't have the formal computer science background, you can reason about the idea and ask the question, am I allowed to divide the ball? Or am I allowed to divide the sphere? No. OK. That tells me something pretty important. What it tells me is that I can only put even numbers of things on there. I can't divide the balls and do half and half or whatever. Okay, So asking those questions and understanding the answers to those questions will guide us to very different solutions to the problem. In this case, 4 versus 3 versus 2, not a big deal. But the principle underlying it is the principle that as an algorithmist and engineer we need to get comfortable with. Any questions about that as kind of our warm up to this topic? Take a break now. Take a break? Yep. Uh, 10 minutes or? Sure, whatever. So with the illustration of these concepts out of the way, I want to make sure your brains are fully firing on all cylinders. So we're going to go through some warm-up exercises. These are not actually ones that you're going to be coding, but I am going to pause for a moment in between each and actually want you to spend a little bit of time thinking about writing, coding, drawing, something, uh, how you might tackle these kinds of problems. So here are a few warm-ups that I want us to go through. The first one you don't actually need to code, but I just want you to think about in your mind. Uh, this is actually code, a fun little story that my son wrote. I taught my son how to write this code. Uh, I had to dictate a fair amount of it to him, let's be honest. But he's 12, and he asked me one day, I don't even know how we got on the topic, but he asked me one day about binary versus base 10 number representation. And I said, this is a very straightforward algorithm for how you convert from binary to base 10 and vice versa. And I learned it about his age, maybe age 13 or so. So I was like, let me explain the algorithm to you. So I explained to him the steps that you take. And we did it manually first, where he converted a number from, he just made up some ones and zeros. And then we figured out what the number representation of that was. And then I was like, now that we've written out those steps, we could write that in code. And let me show you how to do that. So it was mostly me teaching him how to do the steps. And then I helped him kind of uh, figure out what code to write here. But if we wanted to convert from binary to decimal, uh, you, you can go back and take a look at the slides. The point of the workshop is not that code. But think in your mind. If somebody asked you convert binary to, to decimal and you didn't already have it, is the only answer, let me look for an NPM package? Sometimes that's the right answer. I'm not saying that's a bad answer. Sometimes that's the right answer if it's something that 
we definitely know there's a lot of gotchas and we don't want to trip over those gotchas and we just need to expediently get a good solid solution. There's nothing wrong with looking for a good solid solution. But sometimes being able to solve that problem yourself is useful. Being able to translate a series of steps that you could do on pen and paper down into code, that's one of the key first steps to becoming a better algorithmist. So maybe on some free time you might try your hand at this and then check your code against mine. There's other ways of doing it. Maybe you have a better way. Here's another problem. Uh, I've actually stumbled across this one most recently. This might look kind of strange. I don't know why, but in my social media feeds, these were popping up for a while. If somebody gave you a set of squares, you were told that they were squares, and they said, how can you pack those squares into a larger square that is of the smallest possible size? Thinking about this, like if we were thinking about this as a shipping container and this is 2D, we're looking at it from, that, you know, from above, how would we pack these boxes into the smallest shipping container? Well, for four, that's pretty straightforward. You just do a two by two grid, that's the smallest. For nine, that's pretty easy, a three by three grid. But what about for other numbers? And this is the question for 17 boxes. And you think to yourself, well, what, how would I make a square? It can't be a rectangle. How would I make a square? What's the smallest square container? You might think a five by five would be the smallest container, and then you just wouldn't use some of the free space. But it turns out that you can rearrange things, and this, I think, is like a 4.356 by 4.356 outer square. And at present, this is not proven to be the best solution, but it is the best known solution to the number 17 square packing problem. There are all kinds of other packing problems, by the way, packing of spheres and packing of other kinds of shapes. This is a whole area of mathematics. But take a moment and think if you were asked to write some code to figure this out, where would you start? Where would you, and I, this is rhetorical, I'm not actually asking you where would you start, but I'm asking you to think about it. Where would you start if the problem was given n number of squares, how do I compute the best packing? Because that is a piece of software that I guarantee somebody has written somewhere. Somebody's written for shipping, you know, manufacturing, whatever. Somebody's written algorithms for figuring out how to pack stuff into the boxes. Although the junk that I get from Amazon doesn't look particularly optimized. So maybe that software doesn't <laughs> exist, but I just imagine somebody's got to have written the software to figure out how to pack things more efficiently. How would you do that if, if you were tasked with it? An algorithmist doesn't shun away from a, a problem like that. And I'll be honest with you, I, d I don't know. I don't know. I don't know that there is code. It's not like I'm withholding the right answer from you. This is purposely trying to get your brain firing on those cylinders to think about what could be a potentially pretty challenging problem. What are the first steps that you'd take? Hopefully, in your mind, you're going back to the list of four techniques that I gave you at the beginning of our workshop. Hopefully you're going back and saying, I need to ask some questions. Is it any number? Is there a maximum number? Uh, <laughs> even am I allowed to go outside of the bounds? Of, like, There's all kinds of questions that you probably want to ask to clarify and go about this solution differently. You might ask, is it only two-dimensional or do I also have to have an algorithm that works three-dimensionally stacking on top? Because it might be very different if I had three dimensions to work with. Asking good, clarifying questions is, should be your first step. Probably step one point B, <laughs> if, I, if I went back and added a little step in between those, is pull out a pen and a sheet of paper. In this case, literally having a pen and a sheet of paper drawing out solutions, but you'd be surprised how often writing out your problem and drawing out your problem helps your brain to organize and get to those first few steps that you might start picking a data structure, picking an algorithm, just being able to organize things visually. It, it is said, and I don't know whether it's true, but it is said that we're all born inherently with visual communication and visual spatial skills, and many of us unlearn those skills through nature and nurture. Uh, I don't know that to be scientifically factual, but I do know many, many people, including myself, who have been able to foster that skill. It is a discipline that you can foster and build. And so if, even if you're one of those who would never
think to pull out a sheet of paper and draw something, I encourage you to try that as, a, as an algorithmist. I think you will find that it will help you unlock and organize better. Okay, let's move on to the next one. I'm going to play this video in just a moment, but I want to give you the problem. This happened to be, I had this problem in my mind, I had written it down, and then I just happened to experience this live having been done. Here's the problem. Let's say that you're working with a geographic map, and you see on here these icons, the ones that are the multicolor with the numbers in between them, these various different icons that have been plotted onto this paddle. I'll explain in just a moment what the icons represent. But imagine if the problem was, at different zoom levels of this map, you need to decide whether or not to individually represent each one of those points of interest as an icon, or at what level of the zoom are points close enough that they should be combined into a single icon just to reduce the visual clutter of the map. This is an extremely important kind of an algorithm and there actually are real algorithms for this and you can go and Google them. But if somebody asked you, hey, our map is too cluttered. When people zoom out to level 11, it's too cluttered. How do we figure out how to make it less cluttered? Dropping the icons is one answer, but merging the icons is another answer. It's a more sophisticated and more pleasing answer. So as I play this, you'll see this was actually uh, a map that I encountered a few weeks ago. And they literally, I, I just accidentally found, you notice as I zoom out, there's pretty cluttered. Notice how they replotted those points and they start grouping them together. And the numbers go up as they've grouped them together. So they kind of indicate to you visually more of these things have been grouped together. So they're applying something like this algorithm in this map. Where would you start? How would you decide how to implement something like that? And while you think about that, I'll give you the backstory of the map. This is a map from a couple of weeks ago. I'm from Austin and we had a historic electrical outage after a historic ice storm. We don't get very many of those in Austin, Texas. We had a huge ice storm and uh, there was a ridiculous amount of power outages uh, I think something like 70% of the city was without power for prolonged periods of time. And some people, it took almost two weeks to get their electricity restored. And this isn't a major metropolitan city. Imagine, you know, the, the rural areas must have been much worse. But this was the power outage map. And this was like day 12. And there were still that many power outages on day 12 in the middle of Austin, Texas. So uh, I just happened to see it that seemed like a really good illustration of what I was describing. But again, think to yourself for a moment. What would be the questions you would ask? What would you do if you were going to draw it out to try to figure out a solution? Where would you start? An algorithmist is not intimidated by hard problems like this. They break it down into smaller and smaller pieces. And they solve each small piece and then they assemble it into larger and larger pieces. I'll tell you one question I would ask. Are all my icons the same aspect ratio? <laughs> right? Because I'm going to need to figure out where my icons overlap. And if they're all circular or they're all square or some of them are rectangular or triangular, I'm going to need to use some different geometry. So that's one of the first clarifying questions. At every level of zoom, are my icons the same or are they different? Here's another little algorithmic trick for you. Um, this is more in, it's, it's often used in game programming and things like that. We have this, this notion of what's called collision detection, which is I need to know if two items are moving across, do they ever overlap? Have they, you know, are they about to basically hit like, you know, a bullet hitting a character in a game or, you know, something like that, right? Like something moving around. Um, collision detection is interesting, and, and I'll just simplify this. If you think about a box that is the bounding box for some element, and you want to ask, does the bounding box of this element overlap the bounding box of some other element? That's effectively how we do collision detection. And it would be similar here. There's some bounding box around these icons, and when I zoom out and I render my icons and their bounding boxes overlap, 
do I want to allow all, any overlap or do I want to immediately merge as soon as there's any overlap? Is it once they're 70% overlapped, then I need to merge them? We, those are questions that we want to ask. But for collision detection, if you have two bounding boxes and they have XY coordinates, this is in 2D, it's a lot easier. Same algorithm works in 3D, but in 2D it's a lot easier. But you effectively have to ask eight questions to see if the X and or Y coordinate of any of the four corners is overlapped with the X or Y coordinate of any of the other four corners of a bounding box. And by the way, more complex shapes are typically made up as a composite of several, several smaller bounding boxes. Bounding boxes, the math is a lot easier. So instead of trying to lit literally calculate the intersection with a sphere, which is much more complicated math, you might just actually approximate it with a bunch of smaller boxes. But anyway, if I needed to know, is it overlap, you know, these two boxes overlapping in any way, you might ask directly, do they overlap? And the answer to that requires you to ask, basically do eight if statements. But here's an interesting observation that the algorithmist eventually comes to, which is we can answer that question in the negation. And it turns out you only need four if statements to be sure that they don't overlap. And then you negate the result. So it's more efficient and it's less code to maintain to write the negation. I want to know that they don't overlap and then I negate that to know if they do overlap. So again, thinking like that, that's part of what an algorithmist has to learn to do. Oops, replaying here. Tetris. Many of you have probably played this game. I've certainly played it. I've made Tetris games for fun before. It's harder to implement than you might think. But I got to thinking, you know, as most people do that play games, what if I wrote a bot to play this? What if I wrote a Tetris bot, you know, that just sat there so I could go take a, you know, snack break and come back and the game would still be going or whatever. And that's a similar kind of question. How would you model the current state of a Tetris board, the next piece that's coming up, and where best to put that piece. There are many places to put that piece. Not all of them are going to produce the same output. So how would you model solving a Tetris or even just playing a Tetris game in some sort of remotely optimal way? What would be the things that would matter? Here are some questions that would come to my mind. What am I optimizing for? <laughs> Am I optimizing for longest gameplay, like prolonging the inevitable? Am I optimizing for as many lines cleared? Or am I optimizing for clearing four lines so I get more of the bonus points? What are the things that my gameplay needs to optimize for? I'd play it differently. Now, truth be told, complex problems like this are rarely solved directly programmatically these days. Most of these are solved through machine learning. You effectively reverse engineer the perfect solution by playing a bunch of really bad games and selecting the best of the bad games and then keep doing that and keep doing that. And then you end up with a style of play that is almost completely unlike what any human would do. But it ends up being the best gameplay. That's how a lot of those kinds of tools work now. But if you were to write a direct non-machine learning algorithm to this, not reverse engineering it, you would translate some of the things that you think of as a player, some of the things that you optimize for, you would translate those into steps. And you'd say, I think if I see one left side of it really, really tall, I try to put all of the pieces on the right-hand side. That might be one of your informal game-playing rules. A machine learning algorithm might literally come up with the exact opposite rule and still do better than us. But the point is, if you were writing your own algorithm, to represent your gameplay in Tetris, what are the steps you'd take? What questions would you ask? What diagrams would you draw? All fundamental steps to being a better algorithmist. Very similar question. During the pandemic, as many people did, my wife and I we did a lot of puzzles. And we did some that were fairly straightforward and took us a day or two. Uh, we had one puzzle that a relative sent us that was really evil. First of all, it was a 1500 piece puzzle, so really tiny pieces. And it was tons of color repetition. So it was going to be a nightmare. 
And I, I, we poured it out and I kind of like looked at it. And then about 10 minutes in, I was like, I, I refuse to do this puzzle. <laughs> First of all, I don't need to waste weeks of my life on this puzzle. Like I'm, I was looking for something for a few hours, not something that I'm going to worry about for weeks and weeks and weeks. But secondly, the pieces, the way they fit, the way they cut that puzzle, and I think this is probably just true, the more pieces that you have, the more likely it is that you have pieces that are almost a perfect fit but aren't. And I tried, I had a few of those, so I had no color clue, and then I was trying to just pair the pieces by their shape, and it was like ever so slightly, I'm talking about like half a millimeter, not quite perfectly correct, and then you're wondering, is it wrong? Or is this just the imperfection in the cutting of the cardboard piece? How do you, know? like, I was like, no, nope, I'm not going to spend my life mad at this puzzle. So we just gave up on that one. But I, I got to thinking, what if I could just, like, take a picture of this pile of my puzzle pieces and tell the computer, tell me where all the edge, you know, at least give me the edge pieces. Give me a head start. How would you, how would you even, not even solving the whole puzzle, how would you just solve the edges of a puzzle? How would you write that algorithm? There's ways to do it. There's image recognition and all kinds of stuff like that. But if you were going to write code to do that, what steps would you take? What are the base conditions that you would want to look at? We know every square, every rectangular puzzle has four corner pieces, so let's identify those first. That's what I do as a human. I identify the corner pieces and then the straight edge pieces. So that's probably the steps that you'd start writing code use your image recognition to find all of those and start kind of shuffling them together. Then you'd probably sort by average color or something like that just to kind of get them approximately. And then you'd probably just start trying permutations of shapes fitting together until you found the right pieces to fit. All right, I've, I've put this up here as a representation. I know we already saw a map, but there's a classic computer science problem which is given a map, and in the case of the map that we're going to be talking about, it's just a two-dimensional array of zeros and ones that represent islands, okay? So here are some islands. Given this two-dimensional grid of zeros and ones, not a complex map like we see here, how would you determine the size of the largest island, which is the size of the largest contiguous group of ones in that two-dimensional array? How would you go through and find that the largest island is six versus four or whatever? This is a classic computer science problem and there's classic known solutions to it. Lots of different applications to this besides geographic maps, by the way. You could think about this in image editing programs like filling of paint find the largest. You could think about it in an image representation, like if you were doing a scaling or a thumbnailing of a picture, and you might take a grid of some pixels and try to find the average colors within it. So you need to find the largest section of contiguous color within a grouping of pixels. Lots of different ways that this kind of algorithm can show up in the programming that we do besides you know, geographic maps. What are the steps that you might take to finding the largest island. For this particular problem, I actually have a link here to a gist where I implemented it two different ways. I'm not claiming that this is good code. This is just my attempt. I solved it first with the recursive approach, the depth first, as we call it, rec recursive approach. And then I went back and resolved it again, and that's what this code here is, is a snapshot of the breadth first approach. And it's very small code, but I just want you to, if you can see there on line nine, you see some for loops. I'm not doing any recursion at all. This is a couple of nested loops and a queue, and I'm doing a breadth first search through the uh, tree or graph of information. You can treat this two-dimensional array of pixels as if it's kind of the graph, and I'm doing a breadth-first traversal through that to find, once I find an island, basically spreading out until I found all the edges of the island and keeping track of how many units I found in that island, 
and then I've got a set in there to make sure that I don't revisit that island from some other direction as I keep going looking for other islands. So that's my approach. Maybe it's a good one, maybe it's a terrible approach. I don't know. There's probably much more efficient algorithms. If this is your first foray into algorithmic programming, I'm going to go out on a limb and suggest that some of you might feel a little bit intimidated by looking at code like that. And the reason I wanted to show you this code is that you will build up code like that in this workshop, and it won't feel intimidating when you build it piece by piece. The intimidation comes when you look at the final solution and you say, I wouldn't even know where to start. Part of the purpose of this workshop is helping you learn where to start. Okay, but you're going to end up getting to more and more complex solutions piece by piece by piece. Everybody feeling pretty warmed up now? You feel like your brains are ready to dig in? We're ready for our first laboratory exercise, our first official exercise. You notice the link there to the workshop repository. This is periodic table speller is the name of this problem. So we're going to dive into the periodic table speller. Go ahead and make sure you have that repository cloned in your local system. You're going to want to be on the start here branch. You're going to want to have your local web server running so that you can pull up the index HTML file in a web page, port 8080 or whatever. We're going to go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and switch from my slides over to that and then we'll dive into this exercise. All right, with that uh, lunch is here, so I don't know if we want to do the exercise. Sure, we can take a we can take a lunch break now. Or it's a little awkward, but we can take we a can lunch. We can do break. the what what are your thoughts? Like we could eat pizza and do the exercise. Does that work? Or um, I are you assigning the exercise? I'm not assigning them? the okay. exercise. This is more of a collaborative thing. There there will be a little bit of let people work, but most of this is me walking people through stuff. So. Okay. So do you want to do this one and then go to lunch then? Uh, now is as fine a time as any, as long as that's okay for other people online that we just introduced the problem. They can take a look at it and over the lunch break and when yeah, we yeah. come back we can dive and in. And we so. can probably just do like a shorter yeah. like 30 minute sure. type lunch yep. break where it's not. Yeah, okay. Um, We'll just go over that like um, one minute of introducing the problem then after lunch, Kyle. Yeah. Cool. So uh, I'll I'll be ready for the intro. I, I was gonna have to do the switching while people waited, but I'll make okay. sure we're ready. So we're gonna take a thirty minute lunch and we'll be back. Okay, so find candidates. Hopefully we feel pretty good about that. Let's look at the check function, which was full of our previous implementation. And I'm going to do one of my favorite things to do in all of programming, which is to delete it all. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I just love that visceral feeling. We're going to write more code in its place, but I love that visceral feeling of getting to get rid of code. So the check function, this is the public API method that's called on our module, and in the check function, we need to get those candidates. So this is going to be where we call, we're going to say candidates equals find candidates for that input word. And then we want to call another function, which is going to be our recursive function, which I will call spell word. And we need to pass in the candidates for it to use for this word and the word itself. You might wonder why we're passing in candidates as opposed to simply referencing it as an outer variable. It's simply to be a little bit more appropriate. We're not going to modify candidates ever, so we don't have any mutation of that value, but it is better to pass that along than it is to reference an outer variable 
just again in terms of trying to reduce the surface area of places where bugs can occur. So what's left for us to do then is to write the spell word function. We know that it takes the candidates and the input word. And you remember that its job is to return, like the worst case scenario, if it didn't find anything, its job is to return uh, the empty array to indicate that we were not able to find something. So how do we know that we definitely can't find something? This is called a base condition when you do recursive programming. You may have heard that term base conditions before. Turns out in this case, it's pretty straightforward to know what our base condition is. So rather than just having kind of like a fall through return, we can actually put this in an affirmative if statement and make the base condition a bit more obvious. We know for sure that if the, sorry, I don't know why I said input word here. This was a mistake. Uh, characters left. We're going to do a different thing. Rather than passing in the input word, we're just going to really have a counter down for how many characters that we need to get. So we'll explain that here in just a minute. Uh, sorry, cares left is the string. The length of it is the is the count. I keep getting myself confused right there. So cares length, do, cares left is what I want to call it, and dot length. Sorry, I got confused between left and length. Okay, so if the count of the characters left or the input word, whatever parameter name you wanted to give that, if the count of those is down to zero, then we're definitely sure that we've got nothing else to do for this iteration, and so we can simply return that empty array. If there's more characters left, then there's more work to do. Now, we said that we want to prefer or prioritize two letter matches over one letter matches, which is part of the reason why we returned them at the beginning of that candidates list. We want to prefer those, and so what we're going to do is check for those first. So we're going to say check for two letter symbols first. That can only happen if the cares left dot length, that is how many characters we have left, is at least two. Oops. So let's get the two leftmost of those characters. So we'll say cares left dot slice zero up to two. That gets our next two characters off of our string. And let's just for convenience, put the rest of them into another variable called rest, or we slice starting at position two. I got a typo here, care is left. <clears throat> so if the candidate includes the two that we just pulled off. In other words, is that one of our candidates? If we had made it into a combined set, then it would just be a dot has call. But here we, again, just to imply the ordering, we kept it as arrays here. And then we can say if, this is similar to our previous condition, we need to know whether or not we have any more work to do after this match. This was a match, so we could put a little code comment here. We could say, found a match, right? So if we did find the match, now we need to know, do we need to do more work or are we done? Remember how we asked that same question before and the way we asked it was, is there anything left in the rest? So we could say if rest.length is greater than zero, that means there's more work to do. So far, making sense? Give me some thumbs up, thumbs down. How are we feeling? 
Or at least thumbs sideways. Give me thumbs sideways. Okay. I'll take it. I'll take the thumbs sideways. I got to stop and go back if I get a thumbs down. But thumbs sideways will keep trudging along. <laughs> okay. So if the length is greater than zero, I think in the checked in version of the repo, I think I have not equal to the empty string. Either one of those checks is equivalent. We're saying, is it not the empty string? So I'll just leave it as the length. I think this one communicates a little bit better if the length is greater than zero. And then we'll say, let's go ahead and make our recursive call similar to what we did before. We're going to say, let result equals spell word. And we'll give it the candidates as is. We're never changing the candidates. We'll give it the candidates as is. And we'll give it whatever's left. But the what's left is rest instead of cares left. If what comes back from this call is equal to what we were trying to match, then we can simply return the result. So this join here is joining uh, an empty string, is joining whatever we passed in. I think this should have been. We'll check this in just a moment. I might have a little bit of a mistake here. We'll check. If what comes back if there's no more work to do, that is, this check fails, there's no more work to do, then we know that we simply need to return an array with only the element in it. Okay, so that takes care of looking for our two character symbols. And you'll notice that we are recursing in here and we're recursing into the two symbol options first. So we'll be looking at all of our two symbol options all the way down first. As I'm thinking about this, I'm pretty sure that I do have a slight mistake, although the end result is still working, but I'll go ahead and call it out because I'm sure somebody will eventually get this. I am checking to see if what comes back from spell word is equal to my current word, which means that spell word has to then go do that work a second time at each level. So what I should have been doing is checking to see if what comes back from spell word is rest and returning the result, uh, returning to with the dot, dot, dot result, like we did in our first version of the solution. Either of those is going to end up producing correct answers. This one's going to produce a few less iterations. In our case, it's not going to be that big of a problem, so the other one is not necessarily super wrong, but it is doing unnecessary work, so I'll just make this little change. That's slightly different from the code that you'll see in the repo. Okay, so now we want to check for the one letter symbols. And it's a very similar process. We only want to do this if Kara's left is greater than or equal to one. It always should be because if it was zero, we would have not even come into this branch. But this is just doubly making sure to communicate. This is the one character symbol's length. Technically, that if statement's not necessary. Just trying to make code that makes a little more sense here. So we're going to do the same thing with the two as we did with the one as we did with the two. 
which is we'll get let one equals and we'll get the characters cares left at position zero, the leftmost character. We'll get the rest is equal to cars left dot slice. Quick poll, do you say it chars, cars, characters? I, I don't know how to the, what's the correct pronunciation? I guess chars sounds best to me, but I think I always like to say cares, as in characters, but I think chars maybe is better. I don't know. Anyway, if um, candidates dot includes one. So is the thing that we've just sliced off the single character one of our one letter characters? candidates, is it found in the candidates list? We can do the not equals to this, or I again, above, I kind of liked the greater than zero. Either way, you want to do that check. Oh, I know how I got off track on the two letter one. We'll go back and fix this in a moment. So in the above one, the way that we did this was we said let result is equal to spell word and we did candidates. Now I know how I got, it was a copy paste error that got us off. Okay, so we can do let result and then we can say if result.join is equal to care, uh, we wanted to say rest, return, in this case we want to return one, and whatever came back in result. And if we didn't have any work left to do, one second I'll get to the question, if we didn't have any work left to do, then we would simply return one. So those two if blocks, if you compare them, they should look exactly the same, except one's doing it with the two character candidates and one's doing it with the one character candidates. But algorithmically, they're doing the same work. Question, yes? If you're just checking that it's an array, or in the array, sorry, let me try this again. If you're just checking that it's in the array, does it even matter which match it found? If you're just checking for inclusion, and you're just checking for the two little two letter symbols first then the one letter symbols doesn't that fact the fact that you're doing the two letter symbol check before the one letter symbol check ensure the order the order is ensured by this the it's a it's a it's a fair question maybe what if you I, could repeat the right. question without my okay fumbling so the question is did candidate, the, basically the question was, did candidates really need to be in an array? I mentioned earlier, remember, we had this discussion, what if we'd done these with sets instead of with arrays? And I suggested to you that the cho choice for the array, there were multiple factors that I put into that choice, right? One of the reasons I put that into that choice is that we want order, and a set implies no order. You with me? So if I were to have done this with sets, I would end up with two sets here, and I could concatenate the two sets together, which requires iterating over the two sets and then creating a new set from their iteration. There's no like set append operator in JavaScript. So you basically have to drop down into arrays, combine the two arrays together, and then produce it back into a set. The way I'm using it is indeed as a set. I am not actually going through the candidates list in order. So we don't technically need the ordering to be preserved. But what I was trying to suggest here was that one of the factors for me choosing an array over a set here was that I wanted to communicate ordering matters. It is not the case that Strictly speaking, the ordering in this array matters. But overall, order does matter, and in that case, it is, in fact, the order of if statements. You know, the way that we go through it, it's, it's kind of like if you're thinking about traversing a tree, if you go down the left branch versus the right branch, you are going to get a different traversal. We're going down the two branch versus the one branch. That's going to give us the ordering that we want in our recursion. If I had made these as sets, I think it communicates when somebody's reading fine candidates that ordering doesn't matter to the candidates. 
and it would be harder to spot that the if statements are what's applying the ordering. So that was one of the reasons why I chose the array. The other reason I chose the array is because I know that JavaScript cannot concatenate two sets together without dropping it back into an array, which is slightly more expensive. Not a big deal, but slightly more expensive. Whereas with these arrays, the dot, dot, dot array concatenation is very highly optimized. So it's really, you know, to be honest with you, it's kind of 50-50. It is not the case that had we chosen sets, it would have been wrong. And if you had preferred sets here, probably would have gotten a perfectly fine answer. The final impact of all of this, or the final kind of swaying point for me, was that candidates is never more than a half dozen, maybe a dozen entries total for any word that you type in, which means that the array includes is going to be just as fast as a set has. So we're not really losing any performance by making this choice, and I felt it was a slightly better one, but it's entirely reasonable that you might have chosen to do it with sets. Hopefully that answers the question more fully than I had answered before. All right, now let's go back to my mistake. Everybody likes to talk about mistakes, right? Let's go back to my mistake. You'll notice if you do a comparison to what I've got typed out here right now and what is actually in the repository, it is slightly different because what I have typed out in the repository is that I went ahead and did my array concatenation right here. I did it ahead of time, in which case we do want to compare this to chars left. And we do want to return only result. Those are functionally equivalent pieces of code, just doing one operation before or doing it after. But functionally equivalent pieces of code. Where I got tripped up in my copy-paste preparing the repository is that I did that for the one block, but I didn't do it for the two block. So let's just, to make things consistent for what you're going to see, let's make sure that we do this same approach up here, which is to put two in there, spread out the spell word into an array. We want to check this against cars left and then we want to return result. So those blocks should now mir mirror each other. This block will slightly differ from what you currently see in the repository. Maybe by the time you're watching this video, I'll, I'll have already patched the repository. But anyway, those two blocks should look the same because they're doing the same thing. It's just that we're doing it with two and then we're doing it with one letter candidate. Yes? Could you use two sets, like one letter candidates and two letter candidates in spell word function? If you had wanted to pass them as two separate sets, sure. That would have muddied up the function signature to spell word to pass in both candidate lists, but there's no reason why you couldn't have kept them separate. this other one. Okay. In the check function, before calling spell word, I think we can pre-validate the input word by checking if we have any character in input word having it never appeared in any element of candidates. For example, let input word equals meow. Our candidates is O and W, two characters M and E didn't exist in any element of the array. So we can conclude right there before calling spell word. How do you think about this approach, whether the trade-off is acceptable? All right, so let me restate the question. They're basically saying, should we special case a pre-check for these before we attempt to do the spelling of the whole word? Should we look for all of the single letter candidates and match against any of the single letters in our input word and do a pre-check for those before invoking 
the recursive spell word function, which will then favor two letter versions over one letter versions. Um, I do not agree with that, and I actually think that would be functionally incorrect in some circumstances because I do believe there are periodic table elements where there is a character that appears only as the second character in a two letter symbol and never appears as its own individual letter. That would be, I think, the biggest functional trap. I'd have to validate that, but that's my instinct that that would fail. But even if it was functionally okay to do, I think a further special casing of this, the question was, what do you think about the trade-off? A further special casing where we pre-check for stuff that we're then already going to check for later is um, a, that is a premature optimization, we'll say, or an immature optimization. Our algorithm already checks for the one letter candidates being in there by default. And I don't think avoiding a few iterations before we get there on the whole is going to end up, it's not going, it's definitely not going to change or improve the big O order of magnitude of this solution. It might trim off in some cases and might not trim off in others. There's another question. Uh, well, I, to comment on that, uh, I would say that is the wrong way to go because you want to rule out your large sets first because we want to return the largest set possible. So we want to get all of those out of the set that we're iterating before we match. So we can use, we can use implicit negation Yeah. because we know everything that we've already matched. We only look at single characters for what isn't matched and that is a much lower uh, overhead flow. I agree with you. However, in fairness, what was being asked from the chat room is a valid question. Yeah, oh yes, totally agree. Because it's very similar to the when, I, when we were talking earlier in the workshop about um, boundary box overlaps. And I mm -hmm. said, if you check for whether they are overlapped, that's more conditions to check than to check for the reverse. So they're effectively not checking for one letter candidates, they're checking for the absence of one letter candidates as a way to short circuit not even going into the spell word function. Mm -hmm. So it's a valid approach in the similar way. We're checking a negated case to see if we can short circuit out early. I just think in this particular case, duplicating that logic into a special case, first of all, duplicating logic then ends up creating either a maintenance overhead or a performance overhead if you then have to call it as a separate function. And secondly, I think if you were to, it probably if, my instinct is if you were to work out the math on that, it doesn't actually create any uh, statistical increase in your performance. It increased your code overhead and you didn't get anything for it. This would be my instinct here. So what has this changed versus the way that I solved it before? What has this, well first, before we ask that question, let's just double check to make sure I didn't make any mistakes because I probably did with all my typing and retyping. Let's just double check. So we're going to slide on over to our browser here. We're going to refresh. No JavaScript errors, that's a good sign. Let's try because. That still works. How about accept? How about pancreas as I showed before. Oops, uh-oh. I did have a JavaScript error. What did I do wrong? Spell word. This is why you run tests. What does that say? Give me just a moment here. Or its return value is not iterable. In what case would that not have returned an array? I can, ooh, let me think here. If we put a final return empty there, I think that will fix the bug, but I'm not, I'm not entirely sure why that bug exists. I feel like I left it. No, that didn't fix it. Hmm. Let me think here. How does spell word ever come back as not iterable?
Sorry for this. Give me just a moment. I just want to verify what is coming back since it's saying it's not iterable. Oh, this isn't where it's failing. Okay, well. There's a couple comments from chat. Is it when there is no match for the, a letter, the data type is wrong? For lorem, there's no element with the symbol L. I don't know how to answer that question right yet while my brain is stuck on trying to solve this one, but I will try to come sure. back to that question here in just a moment. I'm still surprised. And then uh, someone said if result.join equals equals rest instead of equals equals char is left. But I have, I mean, even if we put this here, I'm trying to figure out how a result could ever come back as not an empty array. Because that's clearly I thought I did that and I thought that didn't fix it. So this here's what I want to do. If I get here in what case do I have cares left but I'm still returning an empty array? That's That's the real problem here. I had E A S so I would have attempted and ah. yeah I think that's actually the problem I mean I I don't know why I left this off, but I think that this is definitely needed because it is the implied else condition that I didn't put up here. I probably should have put those else conditions in more explicitly. I think I was just trying to save space in what you saw in the code. But I'll explain here in a moment. I think that's the real problem is that there's an implied else condition right here. And it should return an empty array in that case because it wasn't a match. And rather than putting that else condition right there, because I don't actually want to return right there because I want to allow the one candidates to go forward, so I'd have to like, kind of like figure it around. So I don't put the else candidate here either. So if either one of those, or if both of those fall through, then we get down here and we return the empty array. So I think my only problem is that in my rush to my rush to remove lines of code I just should not have removed this one I don't know what I was thinking so sorry about that let's try this again just double check make sure that it works
Okay, so what's a takeaway from my mistake here? A takeaway from my mistake is that it is very important that you have that reference implementation to go back to because if I couldn't have figured out this bug or if I had been banging my head on this bug, what would I have done? I would have pulled back up my reference implementation and tried it with the exact same example and seen if I got it to succeed or fail. It might have been the case that I had some corner case that I had not come across. So I would have gone back and tested against the reference implementation to verify that something about my, my optimization had caused the problem as opposed to my algorithm. So in this particular case, the mistake that I made was as I was reading off the code that I needed to do and I deleted code a little too aggressively, I should not have deleted line 91 here because that Im is my implied else condition. If, either of, if both of those two matches fail, that's my implied else condition. And I just accidentally deleted that line. And that's why what's coming back from spell word in that particular case is, was in that case it was undefined instead of an array and that's why we were getting the JavaScript error that we got. So, I thought this base case was catching everything. Clearly this base case is not catching all places where I need to do the empty array. And that's why this one is also necessary. Truthfully, no matter how long you've been doing this coding thing for six months or 60 years, you still make boneheaded mistakes like that. So, Any questions about this? Now that we see that it works, let's go back to the question that I started to ask you earlier, which was, what's the performance implication? the difference that we've now made? What's the implication of the difference in performance? It is still the case that we are recursing against the input word, right? And so the length of the input word, the longer the input word, the more levels of call stack recursion we're going to end up doing. So in both solutions, option one and now option two, we're going to end up recursing over the same number of input characters. But for each one of those input characters, notice what we're now doing differently. Instead of effectively searching the entire elements list every time, we are searching the small subset of candidates that we already know to be possible to be in it. And we're ignoring all the other ones that could not possibly have been in it. Remember in the previous solution, we had a for of loop over elements. So if we took n to be the size of the input characters that you type in, which is fixed somewhere between 6 and 12 or whatever somebody wants to type, if we take that as n and we take the number of things that we need to look at worst case for each one of those characters and we call that m, the big O of this solution is O of n times m, and the big O of the previous solution is O of n times m. So in a theoretical sense, I think we could say that these two have the same theoretical performance. But in a practical performance sense, we know that the candidates list is significantly shorter than the elements list. Perhaps even an order of magnitude shorter. So there's another takeaway that I want you to get from this workshop, which is it is important to be able to evaluate your solutions for the theoretical characteristics. It is also important to be pragmatic about things. For example, you could say theoretically that big O of 1 and big O of 2,000 in theoretical terms are equal. One unit of work and 2,000 units of work are equal in the theoretical sense because 
those never grow no matter how big your data set or input is. You either always do one operation or you always do 2,000. And so in the theoretical sense, we, both consider, we consider both of those to be constant time because they don't grow with the inputs. But I think you and I both know that doing 2,000 operations versus doing one operation is actually going to be measurably different in performance. Even if it's not theoretically different in performance, it's measurably different in performance. So algorithmists definitely play in this space of theory and they validate and design algorithms based upon the theoretical things. We cannot forget the practical implementations. If I run an algorithm that can do O of n, and I run another algorithm that can do O of 100n, theoretically those are the same algorithm. I'm going to choose the O of n, because it's 100 times more efficient than the O of n. Right? You follow the difference between what we're talking about? You do want to first consider the theoretical space, but don't ignore the practical consideration. In this particular case, in, theori in theory, these are the same big O, as far as I can tell. But in practice, there would be a difference. Would it be a big, measurable, you know, seconds delay? Absolutely not. We're talking about maybe a dozen milliseconds, maybe. <laughs> Probably not even that much, right? So not, we're not talking about a giant difference. But like we said, uh, paper cuts add up. So we don't want to do the extra work if it's unnecessary. It's a separate question whether this code in option two is more well written, more well designed, better names, better organization, more maintainable, more readable than option one or vice versa. That's a separate question and an important one. One that algorithmists don't tend to spend as much of their mental energy on asking if I came up with a more performant solution but nobody can read the code is that the better version of the code, right? So I would say that as an engineer, even more than as an algorithmist, you need to make those kinds of, you need to have those kinds of discussions, have those kinds of thoughts, ask those kinds of questions. If you came up with an implementation that was measurably better, but was significantly harder to read, I wouldn't necessarily say that that means abandon that solution. I would, however, say you probably have more work to do on that solution until you can get a piece of code to the point where you believe it is readable and maintainable, that code's not ready yet. I don't care how performant it is. At the end of the day, code is still a communication from one human to another. And if it's unreadable, but it's theoretically the most you know, super performant algorithm that's ever been invented, I'm still gonna reject it in a pull request because I can't read it. Okay. Any questions about this first exercise? Hopefully it got your feet wet with working through thinking about the algorithms and then translating them to code. Yes? Several people asking for a quick recap. A quick recap over the, over the algorithmic approach? Or are they wanting me to recap how I made that dumb mistake? <laughs> This is a good question. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'll be happy to talk about my my mistakes over and over again. I'm not I'm not ashamed. I'm not getting the approaches we used so far. Ah, the two algorithmic approaches. Fundamentally, the algorithmic approaches were very similar. Both algorithmic approaches, option one and option two, recursed over the input strings. The big difference between option one and option two is that in option one, for each candidate, we'll say, each chunk of the input string, we matched it against the entire elements list, which was the most naive way of doing it. It's saying, if I look at this one character, go see if I can find it there. And we didn't even have an index in place, by the way. Don't forget the whole index thing to make it an O of one lookup. So we didn't even have an index. We just like looked it up in the most naive, dumb way possible. In the second approach, we said, 
we don't need to look at all the elements for each one of these characters. We can actually do a pre-pass through the inputs and collect any of the possible candidates that ever could match. And only if we found those, those are the ones to look at each time we recurse down. So we have the same theoretical big O, but in practice, we're doing significantly less work for each of the input characters. And the penalty that we paid was one loop through. You'll notice that the find candidates function has, has an O of N complexity to it. So what we end up with, and this is a subtle but important point, is we end up with a big O of N plus rather than N times. We had, a, we had to pay the N penalty, N being the size of the number of uh, elements in the periodic table, which you could argue that that's not even an N. They're not coming up with new periodic table elements. It's pretty fixed. So you could argue that this is O of 118 rather than O of N. But we did have to pay 118 iterations to construct our indexes effectively. You know, we're constructing effectively a one letter and two letter symbol indexes into this array, but only the ones that we care about. So it's a partial index. That's effectively what candidates is doing. So you know, we had to pay an O of 118 to do that. But think about potentially the longer the word that you write, the more times there's a call stack recursion happening. All of that saved work of having to go back over the elements list over and over and over again. Many hundreds or thousands of operations saved in doing that. There was another question? How do they compare in terms of space complexity? Uh, so in memory, Remember, there's always a trade-off between the performance, the raw time performance versus the memory usage performance. We still have the main data structure elements the same between the two options. That would be like the big usage of memory that we've talked about, and that's equal between the two. Option two did construct a little bit more memory usage in that we created this symbols object, which had properties that were references to those other objects. So we had an object with 118 properties on it. And then we created two arrays, one letter symbols and two letter symbols, total of which probably has on average, I'm just gonna guess, I haven't actually calculated it, but I'm gonna guess on average for these words, there's probably 10 candidates max. So we're creating an array with 10 elements and an object with 118 properties that just have references on them. That's a tiny bit more memory, but it is more memory. Uh, notably, from the algorithmist perspective, that's still O of 1 memory. None of our memory grew pro n proportionally or more based upon the input size. Slightly more candidate growth, but it's definitely not linear. It would be, I don't even know how to, what it would be, but it would be sublinear. It would be logarithmic, approaching, fixed. All right, final check in here. Give me some thumbs up, thumbs down. How do you feel about this exercise? How do you feel about having got your feet wet using some recursion and some algorithmic thinking and translating into the code? Do we feel like the approach made rough, rough sense or do we feel like there's still some difficult parts for us? Okay, I see a few good thumbs and a few wavering thumbs, so that's all right. I think somebody asked me right before we started the workshop, and uh, I'll say for the benefit of those watching the recording, you're being presented a highly compressed zip file. This information is something that many people spend weeks, months, years learning. And you're watching it over the course of eight or 10 hours or whatever it ends up being. It's highly compressed. So if you have that feeling of, I kind of get it, but I really don't fully get it yet, you're in exactly the right spot. You're in exactly the right spot, so don't feel bad. 
it will take a while to re-review. I'll take this moment to remind folks of what I always say in my workshops. Take more time. Go back over this. Try it again from scratch. In fact, I'll give you this suggestion. Right now, wherever you are and whatever time it is that you're watching this, open up your calendar and pick a date a week or two in advance and mark yourself off a couple of hours of review time for this. And then do another one a couple of weeks after that. If you wait until those days come, I promise you your calendar will fill up. But if you reserve it now, reserve time out in the future now so that you have an opportunity to come back and try this stuff at a later time, you will thank yourself because your, your future self will thank your current self Sorry, that over again. that. Because it does take time for our brains to unpack and review and it is important for us to go back. We didn't have very many slides for this segment, but go back over what we've gone over so far and retry the code from scratch for yourself. Hearing or seeing no more questions, if this feels like a really good time for us to take a quick break, we'll be transitioning to our next exercise after the break. Can you say uh, your future self will think SL? Your future self will paint. Will, your future self will thank your current self. There you go. Because I like dinged to the glasses when you said that. <laughs> All right. Repo. Do I need to start over? Okay. Take two. Just give me a thumbs up. We're good. All right, I think we're ready to dig into our exercise, periodic table speller. Hopefully you already have the GitHub repo cloned. You're on the start here branch and ready to go. What is this exercise all about? Well. Don't be scared if you're not, like me, not one of the science folks. Like when I look at a periodic table, I'm like, I, I know like oxygen. That's about it. Like I don't know what all this stuff is. My kids actually have more than half of this periodic table memorized. I'm like, we didn't do that when I was a kid. They didn't ask us to learn the periodic table. My kids have a song that they sing all the periodic table elements. It's incredible. Anyway, I got inspired because my daughter had a little assignment um, where they asked her to spell out some words that were meaningful to her using only the symbols from the periodic table. And I thought that was a cool little assignment. And so she had come up with a couple of different words and I was trying to think of words to help her with. And then of course my programmer brain went to, this has got to be a thing that's solved or a thing that can be written. And it turns out there is a website that does this. You can, you can find that website, you can type it in. But it was a little bit annoying to me that they use not only the periodic table elements, which was her assignment, but they also use like uh, physics char you know, characters like epsilon and stuff like that from other parts of science, not just the periodic table. And that wasn't part of her assignment. So I got annoyed by that and I was like, I'm gonna write the code to do this just from the periodic table. And so that's the little uh, code, the tool that we're gonna build a periodic table speller. So the word because can be spelled out with these I don't even know how to pronounce it. Is it beryllium? Anybody know? Yeah, calcium, right. uranium, and selenium. Uh, it spells out words. So you can't spell all words, but many, many words that you can spell out. And we're going to write the code to do that. Immediately, I want your brains, as you're listening to this, to go to, how am I going to do that? Where would I start? What is the first questions that we need to ask about this? Remember, I'm trying to help you learn the discipline of approaching problems, thinking as an algorithmist, thinking in algorithms before you start to write the code for the algorithm. So as an algorithmist, what should you be thinking? What should you be asking yourself? Anyone have any suggestions for questions that we should be asked? If given this assignment, given this task at work, for example, what are the clarifying questions that we ought to be asking? Yeah? I do. Are we allowed partial matches, or are we required to spell the entire word? Ah, are we allowed to leave off letters or spell only part of the word? Great question. I think we're going to assume that you either spell the whole word and nothing but the word, 
Uh, but that's a great question. Maybe we ought to allow it to leave off the trailing characters or the leading characters or something. But for this exercise, we will either match the whole word or none of the word. Good question. What else? There's a real obvious one on the screen here. I'm I just wondered if anybody would pick up on it. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> doesn't seem like capitalization matters. Ah, see? Casing, right? Do we want to require the capitalization of the first letter? Do we want to allow any casing? Here we're going to assume that we're going, whatever we input, we'll make sure that that's all lowercase and we'll match the symbols case insensitive. That'll make our problem significantly easier, but you absolutely could identify that. See, you're already asking exactly the right kinds of questions. This is going to lead to very different algorithmic outcome. These are not minor details afterwards. These are very important things that we have to catch up front because they may take us on a very different path. Any other questions? There's some from chat. Yeah. What do we got? Can we repeat using an element? Ah, very good question. Answer for this one, definitely. We want to allow repeating an element because the same series of characters might end up appearing multiple times in the word. Absolutely. Yeah. Do all the element names have one or two letters? Ah, very good question, which leads to a question may not have yet been obvious to any of you. All of the periodic table elements do have one or two characters, but how are we going to decide whether we want words that are the longest possible, meaning the most number of elements? That would be one where we prefer single letter elements versus the two letter elements. Or do we want to spell the words with the fewest number of symbols? So we're going to prefer the two character. Those would lead to potentially very different outcomes. In some cases, the same outcome. But in some words, you would get a very different spelling of it if you optimized for more symbols or fewer symbols. All very good questions. There's probably more to it. Here's one of the most practical ones that I started with. Where am I going to get the data from? I don't know the periodic table. Where am I going to get it from? I googled around and I happened to find a JSON file that had the whole periodic table in it and I did a little bit of processing on it to filter out some of the data that I didn't care about and keep only the data that I did and that's included with our project so you don't need to go find that but sometimes it's as simple as where do I find my data set to start with and in this case thankfully it wasn't that difficult. All right I'm going to switch over to the actual speller here. I've got this loaded and running. I've got a web server again in the background. I've got this loaded and running. You'll notice that when I type in the word because and I click spell, it couldn't spell it because we haven't written the algorithm yet. So that's what we get on the start here branch is a functional but not complete project. I want to orient you a little bit to the code, but this basically is the same as the instructions that are in the readme. So remember that there's a readme on the main branch that has these instructions, and I'm just going to kind of walk you through the same stuff here. So if you need to refer back or you miss anything, that's what we're going through. So I'm going to switch over to the code editor, and I'll just orient you in our start here branch. We start with an index.html file, pretty basic stuff. We're not going to make any changes to the HTML in this project. But just so you're aware of what it's doing, it's got an input box to enter in the word. It's got a button to spell it. And then there's a div for us to place the word spelling. We load up our app module, which again, all of this code's already written for you. You don't need to touch any of the code in app.js. But just to familiarize ourselves with it, we grab some references to those functions. And we set up a couple of click handler and key down handlers. We do a little bit of validation here, which is that you have to have pr provided at least three characters. We could have allowed two characters, but it just doesn't seem that interesting to have a single one. So you've got to have it at least three letters long. And then we invoke the speller.check. That's in another module, and that's the code we're going to write. And then to spell the word, we once we get back a list of symbols, an array of symbols, if it matched, to spell the word, we need to be able to call the lookup method on that same module to pull out the element. So we have the symbol, but I want the whole element. I want its name, its atomic number, and its symbol back. So we need to have a lookup. 
So we see those two methods. We see the check and the lookup method. And if we switch over to the speller module, speller.js, you'll note here that it automatically does the work of loading up our JSON for us. So that file is already in your project and already loads for us. And all we need to do is handle these to-do comments. There's the check function and the lookup function. Should be fairly straightforward and self-explanatory. Again, refer to the readme if you're curious about it, but the check function should always return an array, empty if it's got nothing, and full of the symbols as strings if it was able to spell the input word. The lookup takes one of those strings and returns the object. So I open up our JSON file. You'll note that each entry has a name, number, and symbol. So given the symbol in lowercase, we need to return this whole object. That's what the lookup function does. Before we dive into starting to do some of this code, are there any questions about the orientation, the setup, the what we're supposed to do with the project? All right. I figure we start with the easy stuff first, the little bit lighter work, which is I've got an array. Remember, I just had that. I should have left it open. Remember, I have this JSON file. This is giving me an array of objects. And we know with an array, the positioning of elements, that's numerically indexed sequentially. right? Given a lowercase h, for example, how do I find and return just this object? That's what the lookup function's job is to do, is to find the element in the list and return it. So let's, for example, well, let me do a, a shorter word. Uh, I like this word. It's funny that you can spell words like this. All of those are single letter elements. You can spell the word yucky. So let's imagine that that's what we had typed in and we somehow found those symbols. So we're just hard coding that for now and we're going to test our little lookup function. We need to be able to find each one of those symbols. Okay? So let's write some code to do that. I'm going to give myself some space here so it's easier to read. We have an array. It's not indexed on or property named on the symbol name. So we don't have that available to us to just look up and say, in a kind of single operation, give me the element of y. We're going to have to look for it. So let's just do that work. Again, remember that my suggestion is always to write the most naive and straightforward implementation first, and then optimize. Thinking, of course, about optimization as you go, but don't get wrapped up in optimizations too early. You do want to have a good reference implementation. So I'm going to do a for of loop here to go over, I'm sorry, not of element symbol. The variable that we have is called elements. So I'm going to do for let element of elements. Sorry. So each one of those is those object in that array. And I'm going to say if element dot symbol, that's the property name in there. The app already takes care of sending this one to us in lowercase letters. That part is already taken care of, so you don't need to worry about lowercasing the input. But you'll notice that the symbols here are not lowercase, so we do need to take care of to do a case insensitive comparison. There's a couple of different ways to do that. You could use a regex. We're going to just lowercase the symbol, so I'm going to say dot to lowercase on that symbol, and I'm going to see if it's equal to the element symbol that was passed in. I always get people asking me why I use double equals instead of triple equals, and I've got a multi-hour answer to that in my other deep J JavaScript foundations course here. But the simple answer is, when I'm comparing two strings, the double equals works exactly the same as the triple equals, and I just don't want to type the extra character. So since I know how the types work, I'm going to use double equals here. But if you want to unpack that more, check out my other course. OK, so we're going to go through this whole list of elements. 
This is the most kind of naive algorithm we can think of. In the worst case, we're going to have to go through all of them. There's 118, so it's not like we have to go through millions of elements in the periodic table. There's only 118. But in the worst case, we have to go through all of them for each symbol. So if we spelled out a word with five symbols, we worst case, we'd have to go through about 570 something times. OK, so let's talk about, uh, so once we find the element, we know that it is matched. All we need to do is return element. OK, and we could probably do an empty object return here. We're going to assume that lookup has never passed anything that we don't already know is that because all the inputs to the lookup function come from the check function. So it would not have given us a symbol that we don't know is there, which makes line 31 technically optional. We know it's going to find it somewhere. But if you wanted to make this slightly more robust, you could come up with some kind of default thing that returned with properties or a default thing. Maybe that's helpful for error checking, like return a default so that it's obvious that your thing didn't find or that it returned something it didn't find. But for now, we know that the only thing we're going to pass to that lookup. So I'm just going to save that. I'm going to switch back over to my browser, and I'm going to refresh. And it doesn't matter what I type here, because we hard-coded it to the word yucky. But let's just check to make sure that we are, in fact, pulling up all of those. And that, in fact, was showing up correctly. It doesn't all fit on the screen at once, but there you go. So we know the app rendering part, and we know the lookup is working correctly. As a little side note, one thing that an algorithmist should always be asking themselves, and I think this is true of really all engineering, but especially the algorithmists, we have a lookup function that with one test worked correctly. That does not guarantee us that it will work under all conditions. We can reason about, we can infer that the conditions where it would fail are not conditions that our function needs to support, which is why we left off that return statement or default. But that's not really a good test suite, that I ran it with one hard-coded thing and it returned what I expected. So we should ask ourselves, at every time that we write some implementation, how much do I need to do to write a test suite for this? Like, what, what is the minimum number of work that I need to do? And the reason I call this out this question of testing algorithmic work. I've run into this problem many, many times in my career. And I think you will run into this problem. If you haven't yet, you will eventually run into this problem, which is that you write an implementation of something. You write some algorithm for something, some code to do some task. And you want to test that it is doing the right thing. And the generation of a sufficient number of test cases is impossible to hard code, right? Here, there is only 118 symbols. So we could make a test case for each one of those. You could hard code those out or maybe programmatically generate those test cases. But if our data set was in the thousands or tens of thousands, there's no way you're going to probably write a test for every one of those 10,000 different cases. You don't necessarily need a test for all of them, but you need more than a couple to have a guarantee that all the different variations of one and two letter and one symbol and 12 symbols and is there a max. You want to test all of those cases. And what you run into and th that I have run into on many occasions is that you run into this problem where the only way to generate the test cases is to use the algorithm that solves the problem. In other words, you end up in this problem where you're basically testing does 1 equal 1. I run my code to generate all of my possible test cases, and then I run my code against those test cases, and they all work. Is that testing anything? Quick story. Years ago, uh, actually before I even started teaching here, so many years ago, I got one of what I thought was a dream job. I got hired to work on the developer tools team at Mozilla for the Firefox browser. And this was 
before Firefox 4. This was actually, I, my, my starting day was the second day of Firefox 4 being in existence. So this was way, way back in the day. First external hire that Mozilla made to that team, and I thought this was going to be awesome. I'm going to work on the developer tools and get to interact with developers and make better tools for them. For those of you that maybe have been around long enough, at that point, the only developer tools in the Firefox browser were made by a third-party non-Mozilla employee. Uh, actually, a couple of employee, a couple of people made this, but they were not employees of Mozilla, and it was called Firebug. And that was the only developer tools we had for Firefox for many, many years. And Mozilla had finally said, we're going to build in developer tools. So they had already had a couple of internal employees working on the task for a little while. I was the first external hire to the team. And to get my feet wet, they said, OK, we're going to give you a couple of bugs to fix. And so the first bug that I ended up tackling as an employee there was related to the Zoom that when you had zoomed in and they were rendering the developer tools, it was the, the developer tools were rendering incorrectly. And I think it was actually the overlay where you're inspecting a DOM element and it draws a little square around it. The square was drawn in the wrong spot if the page was zoomed in. So it's a, yeah, it's a fairly straightforward kind of a problem. And so I go in, I dig into the code, and I figure it out. Solving this bug was actually pretty straightforward because there was this uh, property exposed on the document object like zoom ratio or something and I just put in document dot zoom ratio as multiple multiplying all of the calculations that the developer tools were doing to draw stuff by the zoom ratio and boom it worked now all of my squares are being drawn in all the right places so it was a couple of lines of code not that big a deal but to put in this code I also have to put in a test for it they have very strict guidelines no code without tests like they got all kinds of guidelines there, like no performance regressions, all kinds of stuff. But put in your code, you got to put in a test. So I'm like, all right, how am I going to test this? And it turns out that there was no independent way to verify what the zoom ratio of the browser was from JavaScript other than this property. So my code is multiplying everything by zoom ratio, and then my test cases are dividing everything by zoom ratio. So I was quite literally writing tests to see if one equals one. And I submitted those tests, and they were like, yeah, that's fine. I'm like, no, it's not fine. I had like code comments like, this is dumb. This, is, this can't. These are my tests, but this is not sufficient. This is not actually testing anything. We're just testing if in one place I multiply by it, and in another place I divide by it. That's, this is pointless, right? The end result of that story is that it turned out that to write actual tests for that required us to create this whole mechanism by which we could take screenshots of the page at the zoom ratio and compare pixels. It was bonkers. I wrote hundreds of lines of code for the test that took like two lines of code in the app. And it taught me this lesson, very painfully, that thinking about how you're going to test stuff as you're writing it and, and what, what am I going to test this against and how am I going to get an independent implementation of this to test against. It can be challenging and it is never more challenging in my experience than when we deal with algorithms. When you start dealing with large data sets and algorithms, we've got people here that are into machine learning, you know this, right? The only code that exists to produce the data set in question is the code that's solving it. So how do I use that to generate my tests? All right, so little side note on testing. Just be aware of those kinds of problems. But we feel pretty good for now that lookup is working. So let's now shift our attention to a little bit more of the heavy lifting, which is the check function. OK, so we're going to switch back to our code editor. And we're going to take out this hard coding of return yucky. And I'm going to make it go back to the empty array because it is, in fact, part of the specification that in the case that we do not find it, we want to re return an empty array. That's how we indicate it failed to spell it, is that we return an empty array. OK, so the first thing that we definitely want to check is to make sure, this might not seem like it's super useful, but you'll see why in a minute why we're going to want this. We need to check that we actually have been given something. The app is going to make sure that we do that, but you'll see why in a moment. Um, because we're going to invoke some recursion here. We need to check to make sure that we actually have some input word to look at. So first thing, we definitely need that if statement kind of bounding 
what it is that we're doing. Now, we want to go through all of the elements and figure out how do I start spelling this. So what is, if you were to pull out a, a pen and a piece of paper and you had the periodic table image up, which you know, I've linked to in the project, you could just sort of hand do that, right? You could say, all right, I'm gonna start with the first letter and I'll see if I find an element that matches the first letter. And then you might go back and say, well, actually what I wanna first do is check to see if I find the first two letters as a symbol because I want to prefer fewer symbols. That's, that's the interpretation we'll take. I want to prefer fewer symbols. So maybe I'll first go through the periodic list and see if I find any two-letter matches. But even if you find a two-letter match, it may end up being that the next letter you don't have. And so actually having a one-letter match. So you're going to have to do some backtracking. As soon as you start to write this out on a piece of paper, you're going to immediately notice some examples where the greedy approach of let me take the two symbol every time ends up not being optimal or it ends up putting you in a corner where the solution doesn't work. So sometimes you want to start with the two symbol but be able to backtrack and try a single symbol. That'll end up happening a lot if you try that out on paper. So I'm short circuiting a little bit of that work for you but try it yourself. Take a couple of words and try it. Oh and by the way I should have mentioned this before. Let me switch back to the app JS. I gave you some test cases here. These are all words that can actually be spelled with just the periodic symbols. And I want to highlight even words like the word irresponsibilities. Like some really interesting words that you might not have expected. Dynasties. Like all of these are words that can be spelled with our speller. And there are, I'm sure, many more. Ostentatious. Uh, viscosities. I told you about yucky. I like that one. So there's some fun options in here. Anyway, you could pick any of those as you're kind of testing on your paper. Try spelling those out and see that you'll end up needing to do some backtracking from the two back to the one, that sort of thing. So we're going to need to handle that. And as soon as you start realizing that your problem is going to need to backtrack, that's the first mental bookmark that tells you, I'm going to need to manage a stack of states. I'm going to need to go down in a problem solution path and then I might get to the end and everything's great, or I might realize I need to back myself back up. So I need to remember those states and back up. And as soon as you're managing a stack of states, the first thing that should come to your mind is maybe I want to solve this with recursion. I could do it with a loop and managing my own states, but this is probably going to be a case where I want some recursion to make things a little easier. So we do need to go through all of the elements. There's no short circuiting this, short circuiting this. So I'm gonna of elements. We need to go through the whole list of our elements to see uh, to inspect each one. And the thing that we want to guard on is if the input word has enough characters in it for whatever symbol we're looking at. The input word at this moment could have only one character in it, and we might be looking at a symbol that has two characters in it, in which case we don't need to pay any attention to that symbol. You follow me? So we're going to do an if statement here that says if the symbol length, sorry, uh, sorry, let me do this. Let's save ourselves a little bit of typing by assigning this to a variable. We're going to say element dot symbol. And we're going to need it to be lowercase for our comparison, so I'm just going to go ahead and lowercase it. So we're just saving off that property. There's a question? Yes. Should we divide input by two and recursively cover both cases and do mm -hmm. that for each possibility? That's a great question. So you remember that we talked earlier in the workshop in the primer about that notion of divide and conquer, that recursive search. Remember the eight golden spheres. If we did four and four and then two and two and then one and one. The nature of that problem allowed us to eliminate half of the possible things that we needed to look at. Does the nature of this problem allow us that same strategy? Imagine if we took the first half of whatever the word is and the second half of the word. We are going to have to do both, so that's not really removing part of our problem, but it does make the problem easier. So it does still fit generally under the concept of divide and conquer. If I can find out the symbols for the first half and the symbols for the second half, that seems 
on the surface to be a plausible approach. And then for each one of those, you can divide and divide. So it does seem on the surface that it works, but there is a wrinkle here that will make this probably not the right strategy for us. I wonder if anybody can spot the wrinkle. Why, why might that not be what we want to do? Yeah, exactly. If you chose to split, first of all, we have the question of what if my word is not an even number of letters? So then I'm going to have a four and a three, for example. Not that big a deal because we can still handle those independently. But if I chose to divide it at four and three and figure out symbols for the four and then symbols for the three, what if the symbol that actually works to make this a match needs to span that gap? So I'm actually going to need to potentially pick multiple pivot points for that splitting and do the work multiple times. Do, do the work in one way, and if it doesn't work, then try splitting it in a different way and see if I can make it work there. So we're going to end up potentially doing more work that way. So that's the wrinkle that we want to worry about. Yes? I would say that you also have to duplicate your reference data set somehow. If you are running two checks, you can't assume that the lookup table can be halved. So if you have if you split one array into two, you either need to have two references to the same lookup, ah. or you need to ship that lookup table to both points, because you can't make the assumption uh, that you know how to split up your data. Yeah, so another way of stating, stating that is that we have a state management yes. problem, yeah. which we have anyway when we're doing this like recursive and backtracking thing, but we have a reference problem, which is just passing the array to the next level or keeping track of the array at the next level might not work because of the references to the array might survive across those function calls. So you're right, we'd have to be more careful with our state management in that scenario, absolutely. So we're going to go a different approach here, which is what our strategy that we're going to take. And you may have arrived at this already, but this is, again, we're going to do an implementation is the naive way. And then we'll come back and try to rethink if there's a better way. So when you look at this solution that I'm going to try, you may think, oh, this is awful. That's the point. We want something that works. And this was the most naive that I came up with. Others may come up with different ones. This was the most naive that I came up with. What we're going to do is we're going to take off a symbol off of our element list if it matches the first one or two characters in our in the input word that we're considering. We're going to take one of those and attempt it. Basically, we'll think about it kind of like a candidate. We're going to have a partial match. So we'll take that one, and then we'll split the word into what we matched versus what we have not yet matched. So it's kind of like divide and conquer, but it's not a binary thing where we're doing halves. We're going to split it into what I've already matched versus what I have not yet matched. And we're going to recurse into matching what I have not yet matched as the new word. It's a partial word that gets smaller and smaller. So it's a implementation of divide and conquer, but it's not your strictly half and half kind of thing the way we typically think of in a binary search. Okay? And we're going to try that and go all the way down. So we're going to sort of depth first recurse all the way down to try to find that answer. And if we succeed, great. But if we fail, then we have to kind of back our way up and try a different symbol. At each one of those steps, we have to keep trying to go down and back up and down and back up until we either have exhausted all possible options or we found a match. So that'll be our basic strategy here. Make sense? Hopefully, at least roughly. I'm getting a couple of nods, so we'll hope that that makes at least rough sense. Let's try this with some code. So let's say that we need to double check, as I was saying a bit before I got ahead of myself, we want to double check that we actually have enough characters left in the input word to match the symbol that we're looking at. So we want to say that the symbol.length is less than or equal to the input word.length. Remember, as I recurse down, this parameter is going to get a smaller and smaller string. We're going to be slicing off more and more off the front of it and leaving only the remaining characters in the string. So we're going from the front. We could go from the back, but it turns out it's better to go from the front. It's less work to go from the front. So what we're checking here is for this given symbol, do I have at least enough input word characters to make a match? 
And then we're going to ask, did I actually make a match? So if the input were dot slice, and we're going to take the number of characters that we need off of the input word. I could do this with a regular expression, but since people don't like regular expressions, we're going to avoid those. So we need to get the slice of that, and the, the way I know how many characters I want is to do input word dot slice starting at position zero, going for the number of characters in the symbol. It could be one or two. But I need to get that many characters off of the input word string. So take the first one or two characters off the string and see if it's equal to symbol. In other words, did I make a match? Put a code comment here so we're not losing track. Did the symbol match the first one or two characters in input word? Some people hate code comments. They think that it is a smell that your code is not written, those people are wrong. Code comments are extremely important, and they are a thousand times more important when you're trying to figure out how to write an algorithm. So absolutely write code comments. Leave breadcrumbs for yourself. Yes, it does require you to maintain those code comments. That's just part of the job. OK. So we do have uh, a match, but now we have another decision point, which is, have we finished or not? Did the match that we just make fully sufficiently match the whole word? In our base case, if we passed in a two-character word like the word B, B-E, and we found the symbol beryllium, B-E, I, I think that's beryllium, B-E and B-E, well, we've made a match. We found enough symbols to cover the word, so we need to ask, have we made that full word match. Are there any characters left? So that's how we're going to ask it is if the input word, remember this slice, it's just pulled a substring off. It didn't actually mutate the string. So we still have the full word here in input word and we need to say if the input word length is greater than the symbol dot length, then we still have characters left. I'll make another code comment for that still have characters left. If input word length is greater than symbol length, that means there's still characters to, to look at. And this is where we eventually now have arrived at our need to recurse. Okay? We cannot do a return of the recursive call. Many, many times you see recursive examples, they'll do return and then a function call. But here we can't return because we have to conditionally decide whether what we got from the return worked, in which case we can return it, or did it fail, in which case we need to let the loop at this layer of the stack just keep going. So we're going to save this off into a variable. I'll call it res for result. And we're going to recursively call our same function. And here's where this becomes recursive because we're going to say input word, but less than what the input word that we received at this level. This is where we shrink our problem. This is our divide and conquer approach. We're shrinking the word. So the shrinking of that word is to take input word dot slice starting at this position, starting at symbol dot length and going to the end. And I don't need to put a second argument to slice because it will automatically go to the end if I provide only one argument. So this expression here says get all the rest of the characters. I could assign that to a variable called rest of characters. And I'm calling check on the rest of the characters. There's our recursive call. We matched off two characters and we've got seven left. So check, go figure out how to spell the the, these seven characters with the periodic tables elements and then I'll combine your answer with my symbol for passing back up to the next level. The last thing that we need to check is whether or not that succeeded and we said that we return an empty array in the case of failure, a non-empty array in the case of success. So if res.length is greater than zero matched successfully.
Thumbs up, thumbs down. How are we following so far in the logic? Is it making sense? You can give me thumbs sideways if you're still iffy. I get it, all right? Some of you haven't coded a lot like this before, and that's okay. Someone said, I can see where comments help a lot for an algorithmist. Thank you. I'm glad that point is clearly made already. I could not write code without code comments. If I was in a language that didn't allow it, I would give up and find a different career. All right, if, if this was successful, then we know that everything to the right of our pivot point, all the rest of the characters, we've got an array of symbols that match those. And we know we have a symbol for the first one or two characters of what we were passed. So we know we're good. So we, the, we finally now can return an array with all of that in it. We return symbol and we return and that dot 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 there is saying spread out everything that not rest res spread out everything in res maybe i should have called that rest i don't know but this is going to spread out that array of whatever was returned to us one element or 20 elements and then it will append this to the beginning and return that new array we've got another else condition to consider which is, what if we had just gotten to the end? Remember, I have this if statement here that says, do we have any characters left? What if we don't have any characters left? Well, then we know we're done. So what do we do? We just return an array with only the symbol in it. It's like returning the first part of this answer. Here, we only need to return the, the only thing that we have to return is the symbol is the symbol that we know we matched. And if you run through this in your mind, do a couple of mental executions with a couple of those test words. For example, take the test word yucky. Just think through it in your mind. We're going to go through a whole bunch of elements until we find one that has a Y in it, or a YU. I don't even know if there is a YU, but we know there is a Y, okay? So let's assume that there's only a Y. We're gonna find the Y element. That's gonna be the first time that this if statement passes, is when we found the element where the first character of the word yucky matches the periodic table element Y, which I don't even know what that element is. It's like, it's on the, on the other screen, I'm not going to switch over to it. But whatever that element is, it's the Y, OK? So what's going to happen here? We're going to say, do I have any more letters in my word to do? Yes, I still have the UCKY part. I did the Y, but I still got the last four. So we're going to go into that branch, and we're going to say, give me the symbols for the UCKY word, as if somebody had only typed UCKY, right? I know I've got Y. And I need you to figure out if you can spell the rest of this word with periodic table. We know that eventually, through all of that recursion, multiple levels deep, in this case, four more levels deep, it'll eventually get to a branch where the final Y is returned, because there weren't any more characters. That Y will get concatenated one level up in the, the call stack with the K and the Y. The K and the Y will get concatenated with the C and it'll be CKY. And then the CKY will get concatenated with the U and it'll be UCKY. And finally, we'll be back to our original invocation of this check function at the bottom of the call stack where we will get back from res an array that has CKY in it and we have the Y that we just matched. So we spread out the CKY, the UCKY, sorry, and the Y that we got. And that's the final return, and that's what comes out to our app. Good chance that some of you watching this still feel pretty iffy about recursion. Maybe it's the first time anybody's pushed you to really think recursively. Unfortunately, I cannot teach you an algorithms course without forcing you to get more comfortable with recursion. There is just far too many things that we can't do if we can't wrap our brains around it. And if I showed you the iterative approach to this problem where we had to manage our own stack, I promise you it would be much worse.
managing all of that stack yourself rather than letting the JavaScript engine do it is not something you want to do. That's not something for the faint of heart. It can be done. That should not be your first algorithm that you write, <laughs> managing your own call stack. So we want to take advantage of recursion when we can because it's doing a lot of work for us. Why do the work when somebody else can do the work for us? I know it's a little smaller to read, it's harder to fit on there, but I just want to zoom out so we can approximately see the whole thing on the screen all at once. This is our whole first solution now. We've got to test it here. But if I did things correctly, hopefully you were able to go through the reasoning of it and you have a sense that this is probably correct. But we're about to test it. I'll save that file and we'll refresh here in a moment. I'm just letting those of you that are still typing catch up. Again, remember, you've got the GitHub repo with these solutions in it, so you can always do your diff checks if, you're missing, if you missed an if statement or something, if I move too quick. Side note here, a little question for you to ponder. We think this is going to work. But what if we were not allowed to run a test? Do you know that there used to be a day when the the process of writing code was not as simple as save and automatic hot load refresh, rerun my test. People would write programs and spend days waiting for those to get all punched out onto a bunch of punch cards and then spend another several days waiting for some operator to put them through and then they'd get in the mail the results of it. And imagine if you had waited all of that time and you got back something and it was like you missed a semicolon. Right? or you had an off by one error, and you started over with that whole process. For us, it's real nice. I just type a character, I'm gonna go refresh the page, and we'll check if it works. How would you get to the point where you had a level of confidence over this code that you knew what it was gonna do before you ran the test? These are rhetorical questions. There's no absolute right answer to this question. But I am taking an opportunity to give myself another little plug, which is that I have another workshop here at Front End Masters called Functional Light JavaScript, which teaches functional programming principles in JavaScript. And one of the premises of that course is we should be able to get to the point where the code that we write, we have confidence enough over that code that we know what it will do before we run the test suite. Doesn't mean that we don't test, but we don't run the test with our fingers crossed hoping for a green. We run the test knowing that we're going to get a green. That's a level of confidence that is difficult to achieve with code, but I'm just providing the little plug that it's worth it. This code is not that. We would need to do code very differently to get to a level where we were absolutely certain at first glance what this was going to do. But there is a way to do that. And that's... Uh, the way of the functional programmer, I guess I'll call it. All right, so that little side note aside, let's switch back over to our browser here. And we're going to refresh. I didn't get any JavaScript errors there, so at least I didn't miss a semicolon somewhere. Let's try it. Our running example was yucky. Let's just see what happens. That worked. But that doesn't show you anything because that was my previous example. Let's try a different one. Let's try the word because. Okay, that's good. What about the word unicorns? I love that one. That worked. Here's a really strange word, and you're going to wonder why on earth am I going to try the word pancreas, which can be spelled. Here's why I know that the word pancreas can be spelled with the periodic symbol elements. My daughter, who's just about to turn 10, two and a half years ago she was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, which was right in the middle of the worst of the pandemic. And it was a pretty rock our world, upside down our universe kind of event. And we're still digging out from that. We are tremendously blessed that what we have to be able to provide for her, you know, all the technology and the doctors and all of that stuff. But 
we wanted to come up with a phrase that she could spell out of the periodic table elements that was meaningful to her. And we ended up suggesting, and she submitted in her project, yucky pancreas. <laughs> so there you go. That's why I know that yucky and pancreas can be spelled. All right, so we have a working solution to our problem, or at least it seems like that. We've tested several problems, and they we're seeing double and single letter responses coming back. So it seems we're developing a little bit of confidence that it seems like we've arrived at a working solution. How many of you feel confident that we've arrived at an optimal solution to this problem? Anyone? That's a leading question, obviously. I wouldn't ask that question if I didn't have a contradictory answer. But I now want us to shift our thinking up another gear from I just got it to work to now I know why it's doing what it's doing and why there's potential downfalls to the way it's working. So I want to go back to the code now. This, by the way, is our current state effectively, I might have typed a comment or variable slightly differently, but this is basically what you see on the option one branch. So this is our option one solution. We're now going to talk about redoing this in a different way, and we're going to talk about it as the option two solution. We'll be working towards option two, which is a more efficient way of doing this. So you want to start with option one, and if your code happens to not work because you missed an if statement or a variable name, just stash your changes and check out the option one branch. That's our starting point for doing the next set of work. So I want to talk about several things that are less than optimal, we'll say. And again, I want to start with the lookup function because that one was a little bit easier to reason about. We didn't have to do quite so much thinking to get to that solution. The fact that we had to do anything in the lookup function should be a little bit of a code smell to us. We have all of that information there. We know all of the symbols up front. That's not a thing that needs to be computed later. We know all of that, and we're not saving any of that information. We're not remembering any of that information. Just think about the fact that we call the lookup. You could call it multiple times with the same symbol, and it would research every time. It's not remembering any of its work, and it's having to search potentially through the whole list every single time. So there are red flags that should be going off all over the place, just about those few four lines of code. This is not going to break anybody's performance bank. This is not going to be the reason why your app fails something like this. But it's a paper cut. In fact, it's a couple dozen paper cuts. And we know that paper cuts add up. You've heard of that adage, the death of a thousand paper cuts. We know that they add up. And an algorithm says, if I can avoid the paper cuts, I should. Can't always avoid them. Not going to get a perfect solution. But if I can look at something and I got a red flag that tells me there's a paper cut there that I could avoid, then we should think about it. And in fact, here's another principle. It could have been one of the ones that I put on the slides earlier in the, at the beginning of the workshop, in the intro to the workshop. Here's another one of those takeaways. If you know something up front, remember it. Don't throw it away and recompute it later. Don't be lazy and be like, oh, I can always recompute the answer to that question later. If you've discovered it, remember it. <laughs> That's going to be a key to developing more optimal algorithms. So when we load up the whole list of elements here, we effectively know all of the mappings between an element symbol name and the element entry, but we're not remembering any of that when we throw it all into an array. So the first thing that we're going to do is remember that. And you might recall that I discussed this notion of creating indexes. We're not going to duplicate our data structure. Our data structure is what our data structure is. That's how it comes from the JSON. There's no reason for us to construct a new data structure in this case. We're just going to leave it that way. But we are going to construct an index that allows us to look up something with a single operation rather than having to loop through the whole thing. 
constructing an index sounds a whole lot more complicated and sophisticated than it actually is. So go back to your coworkers the next time you're at work and say, I constructed an index and it increased the optimization of my algorithm. And they'll buy you lunch that day, I promise. You're like, oh, cool. Constructed an index to optimize the algorithm. That's pretty cool. All we're going to do is create another object with some properties in it. It's not that fancy, but it is going to get the job done. All right, so the first thing I want to do is in addition to this elements, I'm going to create a variable here that I'm going to call symbols. That's going to be my index. It's going to be an object. It's going to be my index. So I'll go ahead and initialize it to an empty object. And this is the right place to do that work. I'm not going to lazily discover these indexes. I'm going to upfront do the work. I, technically, you could lazily discover and build the index as you go, but we're just going to build it all up front especially since it's only 118 elements, no big deal. So what am I going to do? After I got that array, I'm going to go through the elements. I'm going to do a four of them. I occasionally get questions, why don't you use like four each, or why aren't you doing maps and reduces here? I'm not doing any maps and reduces because this is not the functional programming course, and that would be more mental context for me to throw at you, hey, now you got to go learn what a map reduce is, if you, or map or reduce or filter or whatever. I don't use those unless I'm doing functional programming, so that's the answer to that. I don't use for each because that's not, it's neither good imperative coding nor is it functional programming. It's just the bastard child, so I don't use for each. I'm going to use a for loop 9,000 times out of 10. All right, so I've got my for of loop here. Let me zoom back in because I had zoomed out a little bit. It's a little hard to read. We've got our for of loop here. This is about as straightforward as you could probably make it. Remember, we have symbols, which is an object. And we're just going to store properties in this symbol. And what property name do you think we ought to use? Anybody think what property? Well, let me show you what we're going to assign. We're going to assign the element. So what are we going to put here for the property name in this symbols object? Anybody got an idea? What's our task at hand? What are we trying to do? What is the lookup function trying to do? Yes. I've got a couple of different answers here. Okay. Symbol, element dot symbol, number. Could use number, but those are not probably the best keys for us to use, and I'll explain why. Any others? Lots of people saying symbol. Okay. We are going to want to use the symbol as the key, but I just want to make sure everybody understands why, because that's what the lookup function is doing. The lookup function is mapping from a symbol to an element. So we're going to create an index that maps from the symbol, the string, the lowercase one or two characters, which is unique to the element entry. So that's what we're going to do up here. We're going to say symbols of, and the property name that we're going to use is element dot symbol dot to lowercase. So at the end of that, if we were to log out that object, we're going to have an object with a whole bunch of properties in it, 118 properties to be specific, and each one of those is a string property that has a value that is not a copy of the element entry. It is simply a link, a reference into our main data structure, our array. It's pointing at each one of the entries in that array. And now, with this separate data structure, I'll call it, with this index having been created, this code gets real easy. Return symbols of element symbol. You see why this is better, because we did all of that looping, we did 118 iterations loop once up front and remembered some information instead of re-looping for every time we needed to do the lookup. A little hard to show both those snippets on the same screen, but this is the important stuff. We're doing that loop here. This is effectively building an index. I'm using some air quotes here. That's not quite as sophisticated as 
a database index might be, but we're basically doing a helper data structure that's going to allow us to index into the main data structure in what we call an O of one operation. That's a fancy way of saying it's a single operation. There's no built-in complexity in it, at least at our level of understanding. In our layer of abstraction being JavaScript, a property access is a single operation. Between JavaScript and C, or whatever you know, language layer you want to think of that the JavaScript engine is implemented in, Rust, or whatever they build them in these days, it may not be a single operation because they may not be using a perfect hash map as the backing for their object. So there's an assumption here that we're making that only holds for our layer of abstraction, which is the JavaScript language. And that assumption is that when I do symbols of element symbol, that's a single operation, a single unit of operation. That's my unit of cost. When I say O of 1 for something like that, big O notation, which we'll come back to um, a bit later in the workshop, but big O notation is a way that computer scientists talk about the complexity, both the time processing complexity and the memory complexity that a particular algorithm takes in best case, average case, and worst case. It's a way of describing what's the worst possible outcome if this algorithm was given the worst possible data, what's its worst possible performance, that's what we call this big O. O of 1 is what we call constant time because it's a single operation, single unit. We'll talk about all the other ones that are above it, but it doesn't get any better than constant time other than no operation at all, which I guess the best operation is one you don't perform. But if you've got to perform an operation, the best performance is O of 1. Yes? So we just turned this from O of n to O of 1. Uh, yeah, exactly. So actually, it was a little bit worse than O of n because we were doing O of n for each letter or for each symbol, I guess. So it was really kind of like O of n times m, m being the number of symbols in our return value. And we went from whatever n times m was, which wasn't big, but whatever it was, to 1. So that's good. So that's our first improvement to this, is that we improved our lookup by storing and using this index. I, want, I now want to switch attention to evaluating the check function, our recursive implementation of the check function. We are absolutely still going to use recursion here. But the fundamental question I want us to ask ourselves is, do we really have to keep recursing over the entire elements list? Is there something that we could recurse over that would be much smaller. Effectively, what this technique is going to work out to do, we are going to pre-process our data set or our problem set. That's another one of these techniques that you end up seeing is like, if I did an initial pass through some stuff and figured some things out, and then I had a new set of data to work on from that first pass, my second pass through might be a lot more efficient. That's the general strategy. Mark, you had a question from the chat room? Uh, yeah, a couple comments. One thing would be to start with the right letter. Like the N letter. The right most letter? Yeah. For what? The search, the lookup. Uh, that, the big wrinkle with starting with the rightmost letter. Are you talking about, are, are they talking about the check function or the symbol lookup? I imagine they're talking about the check function. And the big wrinkle with that, why you probably don't want to do that, is because you might end up getting to the beginning of your word and you have no symbol, right? So it's not like you can add another character onto the beginning of the word. In the general case, you're going to end up probably doing the same amount, uh, big O-wise, the same amount of work. 
I think a code's going to be have a few more special case conditions in it. Would be my instinct. Uh, it's definitely not going to be less work that way. Clarify the correct letter, not the rightmost letter, like a tree or a nested object. Nest all symbols starting with the same letter into a shared object. Mm. So that's constructing a more sophisticated data structure, which might actually be a good solution, but we're going to come back and do that kind of thing on another exercise. So I'll, I'll leave that as an exercise for readers if they would like to look at more sophisticated data structures. Yes? The smallest set you have in any individual execution.function is your input work. Uh, and the pairs that make up your input work. You mm -hmm. have at most a two arity pair because that is the maximum uh, length of the tuple in your periodic table data set. So you are looking at pairwise combination, ordered pairwise combinations. Uh, so if we're looking at input word, it would be I, N, N, P, P, U, U, T. Those are your, uh, that is your max input set is the, uh, is the IJ pairs mm -hmm. that's, that you iterate through. True, except there's more complication to it, which is we also have the single letters. There's not uh, just well, pairs, I, but yes, yes. You're right. I, you are right. My, I, I am handling that after we have failures of two arities. Uh -huh. that, that's my, I didn't say that, but yes, you're you are, right. You are correct. So to put this in terms that are going to map to the code that I'm about to write for you, what we effectively can do is look at any given word, like the word yucky, and say that there are only a fixed number of possible elements that could ever match for us. We don't know whether and in what order and whether they will actually match up, but we can actually take that list of 118 and drastically reduce it to a list of candidate symbols that could only possibly match. Because there's a whole bunch of symbols that could never possibly match. And in our current algorithm, we are reconsulting all of those every single time, which is to say, just like I said earlier, we are learning some information, which is to say we, we learned that there was a non-match, and we forgot that information. And then we relearned it over and over and over and over again. Let's not do that. <laughs> Let's find the list of possible candidates uh, the attendee here was using much more formal language than I'm going to use, but let's find all of the candidates that are two-letter or one-letter candidates that could possibly be in our word. And when we recurse, we're going to only consider those candidates and not the whole element list. Does everybody see why that's going to drastically reduce the amount of work? And not only the amount of work, but really to, to uh, an order of magnitude in big O terms, it's going to be less work. It'll actually move the needle in terms of our work complexity. OK, so I'm going to write us a function called find candidates. And it will probably be a very similar translation of what the attendee was just describing here, which is we're going to create two lists that we're going to then concatenate together, the list of all the single letter symbols that could be in our word, and the list of all the two letter symbols that could possibly be in our word. As he described, the, the IN, the NP, the PU, and the UT, those are the two letter ones that could possibly be in our word. We're going to find all those different candidates, and the order in which we concatenate them together is going to create that preference that we have expressed which is that we want the shortest outcome. We want to spell the word with the fewest number of symbols. If we change the order of candidates, we would end up with a different response. Everybody follow me, generally? Sounds more complicated than it is, so let's just write some code. I'm going to set myself up with a couple of arrays. Another side note, I often get asked by people, somebody may ask, why you use vars? Um, because the var keyword is still superior for some tasks. Despite what you've been told that you should only use const, var, let, and occasionally const are all three useful in a program. And I've got a multi multiple hours long 
dialogue on that again in my JavaScript foundation, deep JavaScript foundations course. But you'll notice that I use let in places and I use bar in places. That's on purpose. It's not just because I'm trying to keep people on their toes. Okay, so what I'm doing here is I'm going to go through the input word one letter at a time. And I'm going to use the really old school for loop way of doing this instead of a for of loop because I also want the indexes. I could have done a for of loop with the entries and I've done that in other places, but here I'm going to go ahead and do a for of loop so that I have that I index. And it's going to allow me to step through at different uh, levels. Okay, so the first thing is that we want to collect, this is the most obvious, is that we want to collect all the one letter candidates. How are we going to do that? We're going to say if our input word is in symbols. So this is saying, does that single character appear as a property in the symbols object? We could have done symbols.hasown property if you like, but I like the in operator here in terms of its semantics. We're saying, is that there? And is it not the case that one letter symbols already has it. I'm going to split this onto two lines because it's a little easier to read here. So our condition is, is the letter that we're consulting in our input word, does it exist as a single letter symbol? Yes or no? If it does exist, have we have we not already found it? Because I don't want to unnecessarily stick it into that array. Now I want to pause for a moment. Does anybody spot a potential suboptimal or less efficiency with what I just described? I made a deliberate choice here, but there are some consequences to the deliberate choice. Does anybody spot what they might be? Uh, we are using, oh well, it, and this might not be the one you're thinking of, but we're using not on line 1 to 29, which if you have a very large set you're checking against is going to be incredibly expensive because it's going to have to exhaust the set every time. To, uh, to run that operation. You would probably want to optimize it by matching explicitly there instead of using a not operator, but that's getting really pedantic and I think I'm missing your... Uh, I think you're, you're, you're uh, in the right direction but not quite on it, so let me say it this way. I'm effectively checking to see whether or not it's unique in that array, right? Did I have a data structure that we talked about earlier today in our workshop whose job it is to keep track of things that are unique sets. sets so if I just tried to stick it into a set and didn't check whether it was in the set the set data structure would make sure that I didn't reinsert it a second time so that could avoid my condition here so you might ask well why don't you just use a set I want to see if anybody can spot why I don't use a set here. It's subtle, but it's important, yes. Because it, because it doesn't have indexes? Or was it? That's not quite it, no. Okay. Yes, Mark? This would cost a lot of memory work because we don't have a unique reference to the symbol? No, that's not so. I, I, I think I kind of see where that comment is coming from, but that's something that we should leave to the JavaScript engine anyway. That's at a lower layer of optimization. Yes, here. Well, in the example, Yaki, we needed the Y twice, right? We did need the Y twice, but that's okay because we're just constructing candidates here. We're not constructing the actual answer. Mm -hmm. So good thinking, you're right. Yes? Several people said you need order. Yes, thank you. I'm glad. Sets are unordered. And the order here matters, right? Remember I said that the order that we put these things in is going to matter in terms of what outcome we get, whether we get the longer or the not. 
Within each one, the order doesn't super matter, but it is kind of important. But moreover, the set is the wrong data structure when order matters. If we're going to discover these in order, and we're going to concatenate them in order, we should not confuse the reader of this code by using an unordered data structure. Even if it worked, it would create the wrong communication in this code. Since order matters here, I'm going to stick with the array and do the array includes. One other small subtle thing that is really a JavaScriptism rather than an algorithm sort of thing. If I constructed these as two sets and I then wanted to iterate over them, the iteration over a set is a more expensive operation in one of two possible ways. I can either render the set out to an ordered array, and the order of the array that comes out of the set is a predefined in the specification how it knows what order to do. But there is a specification defined ordering if you enumerate a set. I could render that out to an array, or I could construct an iterator over the set. Either one of those is going to create more memory pressure versus just keeping these two arrays around and using them. So there is a trade-off that I'm making here, which is to say the includes method does need to do a lookup that's not quite as efficient as a set has would be. But we're only going to have a maximum of like a dozen, maybe two dozen candidates. If you think about it, there's only 118 symbols, so we're never going to have any more than a few dozen candidates in any word. So I make the determination that for both code readability, communication, and for performance, memory performance reasons, the array was the right choice. But I just wanted you to see that there's a choice being made here versus the set choice. And in other cases, the set might have been the right data structure. Okay, so now that we have checked to see if we can stick it in, then we just simply push it in. That's collected the one word candidates. We now need to also collect the two word candidates. Or, sorry, two letter candidates. Doing it in the same loop, as we go through, we can collect those two letter candidates. So we're going to say if i is less than or equal to, this is just a little bit of math to let me know that I need to stop one before the end rather than at the end. Because I can't get a two letter candidate starting at the last letter of the word. I can only get a two letter candidate at the next to last letter of the word. I'll go ahead and get that so I don't have to just keep re-slicing it over and over. So we'll say slice starting at i and going to i plus 2. And the slice is non-inclusive on the end. So it goes from i to i plus 1. And then when it gets to i plus 2, it does not include it. So this is only getting those two characters. And I'm going to say if 2 in symbols. Same kind of if statement as above. If two, that is those two characters in the word, or as the smarter gentleman said, the pairwise here. If the two in symbols and this is not already something that we put into the two letter symbols array. Oops, oh, includes. Two letter symbols dot push two. So one loop through our input word, which is at most what it was going to be like five, ten, fifteen characters that somebody's going to type. At most, five or ten or fifteen characters that they're going to loop through. And we're going to collect 
the one letter symbol candidates and the two letter symbol candidates as we go. We've got them in two separate arrays and we want to return one final array with all of them. And this is where the order matters because we want to order the two letter symbols first and then the one letter symbols. That is to say that as our algorithm progresses and recurses over this list of candidates, we want it to prefer a two letter option first over a one letter option. double check and just make sure. How do we feel? Give me thumbs up, thumbs down. How are we feeling about find candidates? We're going to take a break here in just a moment and what I want over that break is for each of you to take one of our one or a couple of our test words and I want you to run this algorithm in your head and come up with all the candidates from our list. If you need a periodic table, look up and just, but I want you to do that actual work yourself. Convince yourself that this algorithm for the word yucky is going to produce the Y, the U, the C, the K, and the Y, and there might also be a couple of two-letter symbol ones that it produces in there that will be candidates, but we don't end up using, okay? Do that for maybe a couple of those words like that we've tried. We've tried accept and because and yucky and what pick, just pick a couple of those short ones and try it for yourself. Try running this algorithm for yourself on a pen and a piece of paper. Convince yourself that we're going to get the right list of candidates in the right order. Any questions I can answer about that before we take a break? All right. All right we'll be back break, in a few minutes. Ten minutes. All right, the next exercise that we want to tackle, it's going to be a little bit of a change of pace. Hopefully that'll be a good thing. We're going to mess around with a few things that you may not be super familiar with messing around with, specifically the DOM API. Most people these days only work with these frameworks that have heavily uh, abstracted away working with things. And we're actually going to work with the direct DOM API here, so hopefully that doesn't scare you too much. This exercise is chessboard diagonals. Again, there's the link for the repo. Hopefully you have that cloned and changed to the start here branch. What we're going to be doing is dealing with a chessboard and specifically highlighting the diagonals when you click on a particular tile. So if I were to click on any particular tile here, I want you to note that there are actually two diagonals that any square on a chessboard participates in. And you know, some of you are probably chess fans. From the chess world, there's actually a name for these two diagonals. So the diagonal that starts on the top left and works to the bottom right, if it goes in that direction, that's called a major diagonal. And you'll note as I'm kind of moving my mouse cursor to here to illustrate um, as a pointer here, you'll notice that this diagonals going from top left to top right, that there are 15 of them if you count them out. This square right here is a diagonal that only has one square in it. This one has two squares in it. This one has three squares in it, and so on. So those top left to bottom right diagonals are called the ma major diagonals, and then we have Another 15 diagonals going the other direction, which are the minor diagonals going from the top right to the bottom left. So this one's a top right, this one's a top right, this one with three white squares in it is a top, is a minor, this one's another minor. So we have another 15 of those minor diagonals. So any square that you click on or put a piece on, if you will, in a chessboard, for example, the queen, you put a queen on any square on the board and there are two diagonals, one major and one minor, that that piece can move on. In our case, we're going to just be highlighting these diagonals as you click on them, much like you might do if you were clicking to show all of the places that you know, a bishop or a queen could move on a chessboard. Make sense? 
All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to think about what, what is the conceptual basis for how we're going to solve this. In other words, what, what is the mental model that we're going to create for the chessboard that we're then going to translate into code? Can anybody suggest a data structure that might be used to represent a chessboard? This is not a trick question. Matrix. A two-dimensional array, right? That might be what the people in the chat room were about to say, Mark. A two-dimensional array seems like a fairly reasonable first assumption at a data structure. We have columns going across here and rows going across here, and you could have a, an array of rows, or you could have an array of columns, and the columns could have elements in them. But either way, you could represent a two-dimensional grid as a matrix, as a two-dimensional array. Since that's the most natural thing, and also since we need to ask ourselves, how are we going to draw a chessboard on our web page? And there's a heavy emphasis on elements being inside, you know, child elements being inside of parent elements. There's a hierarchical grid structure just implied by the way the DOM elements are going to sit on our page. So that seems like a place to start. Everybody agree with that? We're going to see that it maybe is not the best data structure for our problem, but we're going to start there and then work our way forward. So at any given point on this chessboard, well, well, we'll come back to the diagrams. Let's go ahead and take a look at some of the code and orient ourselves to that, and then we'll look at some of these diagrams here. You're going to have an index.html, and you'll notice that we have a div ID for the board, but there's nothing in it yet. And it has a little to-do that says remove the text, so you should go ahead and remove the text, just like I did just there. But the reason that to-do comment was there is because it reminds us that we need to write code to fill in those elements. Whatever elements are going to be used to represent the board, we need to fill in those elements, and that will be part of what we need to implement. If we look at the chessboard module, which is where we're going to be doing all of our coding, we won't be making changes other than that little change to index.html. We won't change the CSS or the app.js. But we do have a draw function here, and indeed, that's where we're going to write the code that creates eight rows of eight tiles each. We're going to use divs inside of divs. Nothing fancy, no. There's not a chessboard element, and we're not going to make a custom element here, so we're just going to make divs inside of divs. Now, what are we going to do to make it colored in the way that a chessboard is colored? If I come back to this diagram, you'll note that we have an alternating pattern on the first row that just goes white, black, white, black, white, black. So you might think, well, if I just create it, and, and it's an 8 by 8 chessboard, so there's 64 elements, you might just think, what if I just created 64 divs and had them alternating odd, even, odd, even, white, black, white, black? Does anybody spot a problem with that approach? That's going to be some gnarly CSS to keep them aligned. Uh, Potentially, but the biggest problem is that when we get to the eighth element and then we get to the ninth element, they are both black. And then this element and this element are both white. So what we have is an alternation not only across a row but across columns. We have an odd-even relationship in the columns and an odd-even relationship in the rows. It turns out there is actually a pretty straightforward trick to doing this in CSS, and it won't take, you don't have to write any CSS, I've already written the CSS for you. But it turns out that if we simply do eight rows of eight elements each, rather than doing all 64 and letting them just sort of float into the grid or whatever, if we did eight rows of eight divs each, we can target the row individually with a CSS um, index selector and then target each tile inside of it individually. And so we'll be able to very easily, with one CSS rule, create this alternating pattern. 
So all we really need to do, since I've already done the work of writing that CSS, we just simply need to create eight divs, one for each row, and then inside of each row, create eight divs for the columns. And the CSS will do the rest. If we go and look at that code, just so in case you're curious, here's the trick. We use the nth child selector. So you notice this first div is the row because that's the direct descendant of the board is the row. And what I'm saying is the two end divs, and we'll come back to that in just a moment. And then for all of those rows, we want to target the two end plus one cells or tiles. And we want to target the two end plus one rows at the position two n in the tile. That's what we're saying here. So it's a compound selector. For any of those, make them black, the rest of them leave white, okay? Quick little note on this 2n thing. n being, of course, the indexing, you know, the counting of the child elements. But here's a little trick that you may not know about CSS. CSS is one-based, not zero-based. So whereas we might think of 2n as being even, or 2n plus 1 as being odd, it's actually it's actually different. So we're targeting the odd row and the even tile and the even row and the odd tile. It's kind of a, just got to keep straight the whole N is one based in CSS. That always trips me up. I don't know if it trips anybody else up. Okay, but that CSS selector, if we create those divs, the CSS selectors are going to do the coloring for us, which is great. So all we need to do is write that code. Now here's where I promised that we were going to actually spend a little bit of effort in native DOM work. First thing I want to do is I'm going to need, uh, and you'll become, it'll become obvious later why, I'm going to need to keep a reference to the board EL, the DOM element that is the parent element for our board. That's being passed into the draw function and I need to save that off. So I'm going to say uh, very first thing, original board EL is equal to board EL. To construct eight rows of eight tiles each, the most straightforward way of doing this is two loops, a loop nested inside of another loop. So we're not going to do anything more complicated than let i equal zero, i less than or equal to seven, i plus plus. Quick little note here, since I'm using less than or equal to seven, we know that this is going to uh, do eight iterations. I actually think this is a little bit more semantic because it shows the eight. Some people like the less than or equal and then the number because they, they don't like it to think about it as beyond the bounds. But I just think the eight kind of communicates. So you can do less than or equal to seven or less than eight, whichever one. It's going to do the same number of iterations. But just from a code communication perspective, I like being able to see eight there. I would, for example, use a constant for this. I might say something like num rows equals eight. And then I would want to use that num rows there. I wouldn't want to do num rows minus one. You follow what I'm saying? So to me, that's a little bit of a more semantic signal to use the eight. I'm going to leave off the constants just to keep a little less code uh, that we're digging into. But you, you get the point there. OK, so our nested loop, i being the row index, and j will make as the we're good algorithmists. We like to use single letter variables for everything. We'll use, we'll use better variable names elsewhere. But for right now, we'll just use i and j for row and tile index. I think column index, tile index, those will be interchangeable for us. OK, so we need to create a div. Some of you have never done this before, but document.createElement div. It's not quite as cool looking as JSX, but it gets the job done. JSX compiles to document.createElement, so it's the same thing. We also need a row element. I neglected to do that one. For each row, we're going to need to create a parent row element. So let's go back and do that. Same way, row element and tile element. 
What do we do with a tile element? We append it to the parent row element. So we do row element dot append child tile element. And after we've appended all of the tile elements to a row element, what do we do with the row element? We append it to the board element. Make sense so far? Let's switch over to the browser. I've got a web server running on this code, and when I refresh, boom, there's our chessboard. One other thing to note is that uh, our chessboard isn't clickable yet, but it will be clickable when we write our code. So the idea of this is that I come along here and I click one of these and that's when it should highlight. How many of you got a chessboard drawn for yourself? Did it work? Give me thumbs up, thumbs down. Do you have a working chessboard or at least a visible chessboard? If you're missing it, if something didn't quite work, remember you can always diff against the option one branch. That'll show you in option one how we draw the chessboard. All right, our second task, our much more interesting and important task, is to handle that when we click on one of the tiles, we are going to highlight the two diagonals that that tile participates in. Note in this code comment, which is also part of the readme instructions in case you deleted it, but note in this code comment that we are given the tile element reference that has been clicked on. That is taken care of by app. So we're not going to change any of that app code. We are going to be given a tile element if you are given no tile element, in other words, if it comes in as undefined, that is basically the same thing as clearing the board. So you saw that there's a clear button. So if tile element comes in as undefined, then we're going to clear it. In other words, we, we're going to need to clear it always, and then if tile element has been set, that's when we're going to highlight its diagonals. Okay, so first question is, how do we know what possible where that tile was on the board so that we could possibly start to figure out what diagonals it's in. What does where it is even mean? Well, if you think about the DOM elements as participating in a data structure right now, a two-dimensional data structure where the values are references to DOM elements, we have an array of rows that that array happens to also be a DOM element, but it is conceptually an array of rows. That's the board element. And then within each one of those, we have an array of DOM elements, which are the tiles. So we have a two-dimensional array. It's a data structure. It just happens to be DOM nodes, but that doesn't make it not a data structure. So how do we find out where in our data structure the specific tile that was clicked is, and what does where even mean? To answer that question, we're going to go back to the slides. You'll note that if I clicked on this one, for example, that it has a position that we could think of like a coordinate. Think about this grid as if it's a coordinate system. You're probably familiar with XY coordinate systems, two-dimensional coordinate systems. We could think about the position of the thing that was clicked as having a coordinate. And what would that position be? Well, if we numbered the natural number indexing, zero-based as they would be in arrays, if we num numbered the rows and the columns 
and we click on a specific element, then it has a coordinate that corresponds to the row number and to the column number. So we could say that its coordinate is 4, 2. Now some of you might be surprised that I did 4, 2 instead of 2, 4. Because in traditional Cartesian coordinates, we typically list the horizontal component first, and then the vertical component. And so in a typical co Cartesian coordinate system, we would have said 2, 4 instead of 4, 2 for the same position. There's a one key reason why I did the 4, 2. And that is because we already made a decision with whether we were cognizant of the decision or not. We made a decision that we were creating rows of columns rather than columns of rows. And when we made a decision that we were making rows of columns, then we automatically said that the row index, the vertical index, is the first most important. It is the highest order of the two coordinates. So that's why we got 4, 2. Had we gone back and redone that where we did uh, columns of tiles or columns of rows, then it would be 2, 4. But we would have more CSS to deal with to get them to stack properly. It turns out that it's really easy to make them stack the way we wanted to make them stack when we did rows of columns rather than columns of rows. So we made a decision based upon some constraints that the DOM and or the CSS engine gave us, and that may or may not have been a good decision, but it's the decision we made nonetheless. At this point, we could be feeding back into, as an algorithmist, asking questions like, was that a good decision? Should I have made that decision? Should I have made a different decision? Everybody following me so far? Okay. So if we have the coordinate 4, 2 that represents where we have clicked, let me temporarily switch back to the code for just a moment. How would I get the tiles that I need to work with? We have this original board element, but that's just a DOM element. How would I get an array, a two-dimensional array of them? How would I construct the JavaScript data structure that we could interact with? There's a couple of different ways to do it. I'm not going to suggest that there's one right or wrong way, but let me show you one way of doing it. Original board EL. This is, again, some core DOM API stuff that most people never get exposed to. We have this thing called query selector all. Anybody ever heard of query selector all? This is like the less powerful built-in version of jQuery. That's how I like to think of it. But only the CSS selector part. We can give it a CSS selector, and it'll go find all matching elements to that CSS selector. So I'm going to give it div div. That's going to say, go find me all those tiles and return me an array. It's actually not technically an array. It's technically like this nodeless thing, which is array-like. And we'll have a couple of places where we where that's OK, and a couple of other places where we need to turn it into an array to use it. Let's clear the currently highlighted items. We don't know where they are. We haven't stored them in any way. So the only dumb approach that we can do to clear them is to go through all of the tiles. I'm going to just say, we'll clear all currently highlighted tiles. If we didn't clear them, each click would highlight a different row and then eventually the whole board would get red. So we got to clear it every time. So I guess we could have done the whole React thing, which is to redraw the whole board every time. I'm not a big fan of that. I'm not a big fan of re-render the whole page with every change. So we're going to go ahead and just clear them. And here's another DOM API that you maybe haven't worked with. The class list gives us uh, an API for dealing with the classes that are currently on a DOM element. And we're just going to remove the highlighted class from any of them. So we're going through all 64 of the tile elements and removing all of the highlighted elements. Here's a quick little quiz to make sure everybody's awake and paying attention. You ready for the quiz? How many DOM elements are we using to represent our chessboard? I wish I had the Jeopardy theme music to play. Does 
64. I've heard 64. I've heard 65. You said 72? Yeah, like the divs. Then okay. Nine plus one. What's that? Eight times nine plus one. Eight, eight times rows nine. Of nine elements plus the container for the. Nine story. elements? Yeah, because you have the div container for the row. Uh -huh. And you have the div container for each element in the row. Okay. And you have the global container. Okay. So that's getting, yeah, there's probably more that the, they stick on us, but that would be the minimum we're creating. Okay. Lots of 65s, a couple of 73s. Yeah, 73 is. 73 is the correct answer. We have 64 tiles. We have eight parent rows. That makes 72. And we have one board element that contains all of them. So that's 73. You got their, the different math, but the same answer. OK. So we're going through only the 64 tile elements and removing the highlighted from all of them. That's a bit of a brute force way of doing it. You can already uh, probably imagine that it might be nice if we had a reference to which ones were highlighted and we only removed the class from the ones that had it. But is it that big of a deal to go through 64 versus 15? Here's another one of the questions that we probably should have asked about this problem before diving into the code. Does our code need to handle arbitrarily sized chessboards? In this particular case, we're going to say we're only dealing with 8 by 8 chessboards. But sometimes you get presented with a problem and they're like, well, what about the 317 by 317 chessboard? How does it work then? There, there are problems like that. There's like classic algorithmic problems like the n queens problem and stuff like that that deal with arbitrarily sized boards. That's a question that we need to ask. Those are fundamental principles. Uh, uh, characteristics of the problem that change the way we approach this. If we had to deal with n-sized chessboards, we might not just be willing to do a loop over all the possible tiles if it could be millions. Here, we know it's m fixed at 64, so not that big a deal. We still want to fix it, but it's not that big a deal. Okay, so fundamentally what we need, if, if tile element has been clicked, because we're going to clear it every time, but we're only going to do highlighting if tile element was clicked. Fundamentally, what we need to do here is figure out the coordinate of the tile that was clicked. Does everybody agree with that? Does that make sense? I need the row index and the column index of the tile that was clicked. So I need a row index, and I need a column index. How are we going to figure that out? So let's go back to the slides for a moment. And let's observe that the row index, that is the 4 here, if that's the thing that we had clicked on, the row index is the position of that tile's row parent in the board element. The board element only has eight children. This one, 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 and this one, right? The, if you were to do the DOM inspector and expand it out, you would see that the board element has eight row elements in it. So if I wanted to know what is the index, then I just need to know what is my row parent. And then I need to ask, of the board, what index is this row element in the board's child nodes? You follow that? Once I, excuse me, once I find the row element, the column index is pretty straightforward because the row element has child nodes in it. And I just need to ask, which index are you at within the row element's child? So really all that we need to do is actually find the row element. Row element for the tile element. Turns out this is quite convenient. There's a thing called parent node. Just to be slightly more precise here, I'm going to just change these variable names to row index and column index. Now, remember that I said that this thing is not a real array. But I want to do some index searching in it. So I'm going to need to turn it into a real array. So the way that I'm going to turn it into a real array is to say, or actually not that thing into a real array. I need the, 
for the row index, I need to turn original board element dot child nodes. I need to turn that into a real array. And then I can call find index on it where the element is equal to the row element. Put that onto a second line so you can see I'm calling. First thing I'm doing is turning it into a real array and then I'm calling find index on it and I'm giving it a function that only returns true once I find that particular row element. A smaller, more compact way of doing this is index of row element. So whichever one you prefer. We can do that. Column index is pretty straightforward. We just need to take the row element dot child nodes and do the same thing. So that'll tell us our index. That'll tell us our four two coordinate. Questions so far? Does this part make sense so far? Now the fun stuff. How are we going to turn that into highlighting our diagonals? Well, let's look at the relationship of coordinates of the thing that we clicked and the thing that we want to highlight. Here's our starting element that we've clicked on. And here are the first four coordinates that we need to highlight. Got a little bit of spacing off here. But we are highlighting this element at 3, 1, 3, 1, this one at 3, 3, this one at 5, 1, and this one at 5, 3. Do you see those coordinates, how they match up? This is row 3, column 3. This is row 3, column 1. This is row 5, column 1, and row 5, column 3. What do you notice about the relationship between the coordinates of these four elements that are on the respective diagonals? What's the relationship between those coordinate values and the coordinate value of the thing that we clicked? Subtracting? Yeah, it's just off. It's just off. different by one, mm -hmm. right? Take four two and go to three one. That means we subtracted one from the row el index and we subtracted one from the column index. Take four two and go to three three. That's subtracting one from the row index but adding one to the column index. Same thing going in the downward direction. We add one to the row index, subtract one from the column index to get five one. We add one to both the row and column index to get 5, 3. The same would be true all the way up and down all four directions along those diagonals. Each thing along the diagonal is just a plus or minus of one from the previous one. You following that? So that kind of suggests to us an algorithm for highlighting the diagonals, does it not? We could start at the selected tile, at the clicked tile, and run some loops in the four directions, increasing indexes of row and column or decreasing accordingly in the four directions. And that would give us the indexes of the elements that we need to highlight. Wouldn't give us the elements yet, but at least gives us the indexes that we need to highlight. Make sense? Let's switch back to the code editor. We're going to do four separate loops, one for each of these directions, okay? I'm going to highlight in the up left direction, okay? You'll see me sometimes just pointing at my computer and making sure my lefts and rights are not, not getting backwards or something like that. Uh, 
So highlighting in the up left direction. For you it's this, for me it's this. The up left direction, okay? So what, does, what do we know in the up left? We know that both the row index and the column index decrease in the up left direction. So we're going to set ourselves up with a, a two variable for loop. Some of you may be aware that this syntax can be done. Others may be seeing this for the first time, but we're going to have an I and a J. The I starts at the tiles row index and the J starts at the tiles column index. We want to keep going while and these are going to be decreasing. How do we know when we've reached the edge of the board? We've reached a minimum or a maximum. And what is the minimum for the row index and column index? Zero. Zero. So while i, which is our row indexing, while i is greater than or equal to zero and j is greater than or equal to zero, we want to keep going in that direction. And we're going to decrement i and decrement j. Single for loop doing both decrementing of the row and column indexes. That is going, the i and j in this loop is going to give us the indexes of those elements along that diagonal, but it doesn't give us the elements themselves. So to get the element themselves, we're going to need to call a function, which I will call find tile, that we pass in the row and column index to, and it gives us back the DOM element reference. And assuming that that function exists, which we'll write in a moment, once we get a reference to it, we just need to add the highlighted class to it. Does everybody understand how I wrote that for loop? Does that one make sense? It's one of the for loops that we need. It is the one that is going in the upward and leftward direction. I don't know if left word is a word, but I'm going to use it. To save some, myself some typing, I'm going to duplicate that loop. And I'm going to do the up right direction. What is different about going in the up right direction? My row indexes still decrease, so I still want to do greater than or equal to zero for my row indexes but my column indexes increase when I'm going rightward, right? So I don't want j greater than or equal to zero. What do I want? j, what should this be? Not greater than or equal to zero. It should be less than eight. Or less than or equal to seven if you prefer that form, but I'm going to use the less than eight. And j is not minus minus. What should it be? Plus plus. That's the only thing I needed to change was the condition of when it finishes and incrementing that one. And now I'm really lazy, so to do the other two loops, I'm just going to duplicate both of those loops. For these loops, what changes? We're changing from up to down. And that's going to change our i's, right? So our i is no longer greater than or equal to zero. What's the condition for i when our row index is increasing? Less than or equal to seven or less than or eight, if you like that, right? So for both of these loops, I'm going to change the i condition to i less than eight. And for both of these, I'm going to change it from i minus minus to i plus plus.
I've taught this workshop a dozen times now, and every workshop, including me, people get these wrong. Okay, so even though you're trying very meticulously to get the less than or greater than, this is one of those places where it's easy for us to trip up and get wrong. Even when you're looking at it and looking at yours and you're like, it looks right, it looks right. I don't see what's wrong. If we try this and yours breaks, don't waste any more time on it. You understand how this works. Just grab the copy from the repo, all right? I don't want people sitting here frustrated because they missed a minus minus or something, okay? As long as you understand conceptually how I constructed the four different loops. We're simply either incrementing or decre decrementing the row and the tile, tile indexes respectively so that we go in the four respective directions. And the last thing that we're going to need is just this little old find tile function. Following? So let's write our find tile function and then let's we'll test and test everything and see how we did. Okay? Remember that find tile receives a row index and a column index. I'll just call it row and column to keep things short here. How are we given a numerical index going to pull out a reference to the respective DOM element? There are multiple ways to do this. Some of them are better than others. I'm only going to show you one of them, but this is not certainly the only way. You could loop through all of them until you find an I and J that match row and call. You could do. I'm going to use the CSS engine to do it because we have the nth child selector and I have these indexes and I'm just going to construct a CSS selector that pulls out the respective element. So that is going to look like this. We're going to use our, our friend query selector all. Or I'm sorry, query selector, not selector all. We got to do it on document um, and We're going to select the parent element board and then div. This will be our row. So we're going to do nth child and remember that CSS deals with indexes in one based. So we're going to take our row plus one. So if our row index was 4, then we want to actually pass the selector 5, because that's how CSS will see it. And then we'll do another direct descendant. Actually, since this is a template, I'll just, a template string, I'll just do these on separate lines. So it's easier for you to read. So this was selecting the row element. Now we want to select the tile inside of that. So we've got another direct descendant. And we'll do nth child. And we'll do column plus one. This offloads to the CSS engine all of the work of finding the DOM element. And it goes on the assumption that the CSS engine is going to be more efficient at doing that than my for loops would be. Does that make sense? If we haven't made a mistake, hopefully we should be able to save this file and switch over to the browser. Refresh our page, click on an item, and there's our highlighted tiles. First try. No mistakes. Doesn't happen very often. No, they call them first try Kyle. So, so, somebody, somebody mark this date.
because we'll, we'll want to remember the date that I wrote code and didn't make a mistake. Doesn't happen very often. How many of you also have a working solution? Do you have highlighting tiles when you click? Someone online said it works. OK. At least one person was able to get it right. You know it's not just a trick on my machine. I'll switch back to the code so that people can do another quick little check here. It's hard to fit it all in one screen, but there's at least most of it in one screen. Like I said, don't bang your head against too much if it's like, oh, it's missing one of the diagonals or it's throwing an out of bounds error or something. It's almost certainly you missed doing a minus minus or you missed doing a less than or something like that. That happens all the time with this stuff. This is not the kind of code that I'd like to check into production and say, hey, please keep this code around forever because it's hard to read, hard to maintain. But what does it do critically? It gets us to a first step, a working algorithm, which is our baseline that we can work from to improve the code, improve the optimization, improve the readability. Any questions about our option one solution? This is the code as it sits in the option one branch. So if for some reason yours missed a character somewhere, or it's not quite working, as long as you feel comfortable with how we did it and what the concept was that approached it, stash your changes and check out the option one branch so that that's the correct starting point for the next work that we'll, that we'll do. Any questions before we move on to applying some more optimizations and changes to this code? Would another way to do this road call stuff be based on arrays without the CSS selector, which approach would you use? Yes, you could have done this with the child nodes arrays and use those indexes that way. So you could have said board original board element dot child nodes of row dot child nodes of call. You absolutely could have done it that way. My, my impression or my guess is that both of those are going to perform about the same, which is to say that they're quite fast because they're using built-in stuff. I don't think that the CSS selector is going to be any less slow than the array reference because those aren't real arrays. Those are DOM node lists. If they were real native JavaScript arrays, then it would be much faster to access the real native JavaScript array element. But we don't yet have an array in JavaScript of those. What we have are these DOM lists, these DOM element lists. So I don't think that there's going to be much of a performance difference between the two, but it's certainly a valid approach if you like that style of code better.
Okay, let's observe a few things about our current approach. Let's see if there's any low-hanging fruit, any paper cuts that we could easily eliminate. For me, the one that jumps out the most, and maybe it's just because I've made this mistake many, many times, but every time I click the highlight, I re-query the DOM for the list of 64 tile elements. You see that? That is something that never changes. Once we draw the board, that is fixed. But every single time I click on it, I am recomputing the answer to that question. That's unnecessary work. To me, that's the lowest hanging of the fruit here. There's other things that others might have changed first. That's the first thing I want to change is I don't want to recompute that every time. I want to save that work. So instead of the original board element, I'm just going to maintain an array of the tiles. It is that DOM element, so it's not a real native array, but I'm just going to maintain that list. So instead of saving off this reference to original board element, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to set this right here. Right after I've drawn the board, I'm going to do it once and save it. Now, I know I'm using the vehicle of DOM API calls that almost none of you ever work with anymore because of frameworks. I know we're using that as the vehicle here, and it may feel like this is somewhat old school or out of touch, but I don't want you to worry about the DOM API usage nearly as much as I want you to think about when is work being done and how often is it being done. DOM work is one of those things that is exceptionally costly because the DOM is still always the slowest part of our JavaScript apps. And so it's a way for me to illustrate the problem here, but it's really about when that work gets done and how often it gets done. Why not do it once up front and remember that information instead of waiting until much later to do it? Does that make sense? There's one other little change that because we don't have this original board EL, we're not going to be able to do that one. And so we're going to need to do let board EL and get that from row EL. And then we're going to put in board EL here. All right, let's talk about this find tile function. Let's think about yet another different way that we could have done it. Maybe not better, but a different way that we could have done it. Instead of relying upon the built-in ones or the built-in node list, maybe what we do, because we now have that tiles array, maybe we just simply loop over the tiles array and use the indexing to find the element within that tiles array. So, if I were to loop over this tiles array, I'm going to get an element that I could ask it, what is your index? And I could compare that index to the index that I'm looking for, and if I found the right one, I could return it. Did I lose you, or did that make sense? Remember how we computed the index of any given element? We did it just right, right here. This was computing the, an, a row and column index for any element. So we could copy that logic down into here or even put it into its own function to recompute an element's index and ask it if its computed index is the same as the one that we're looking for. That's a way of doing this. But that's a big old waste of time to recompute the index over and over again because... I already know the index. When do I know the index? 
when I'm constructing the board. That's information that I know at this moment, and then I throw it away. And I recompute it later, over and over and over again. What if we saved the information of what each tile element's row and column index coordinate is with the tile element? You follow that? Don't throw the work away, save the work. That's an algorithmist's best friend. Now, how are we going to save a piece of information with a DOM element? It turns out another part of the native DOM APIs that many of you have not been exposed to is what we call data set. It's a special mechanism for associating data with a DOM element. There is a gigantic caveat that you need to pay attention to, so don't miss this. The only data that you can associate with a DOM element in this way through the data set is string information. If you try to save a number, guess what's going to happen to the number? It's going to get turned into a string. And that will create a gotcha for us later. But we'll deal with that when we get to it, OK? So we can store information with an element in its data set. Question? It's just a personal note. Um, I, you can use a set and then like pass in the element, and then you can associate any arbitrary data with an element. Uh, you're talking about map? Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Or, sorry, we can map use the DOM set. element as a key in a map. Yeah. Absolutely. Map dot set, I meant. Yes, we absolutely could do that. We're not going to do that this time, but we absolutely could construct another data structure, capital M map. Remember I talked about at the beginning of the course, what is a map? A map is a hash map, meaning any object can be a key, including a DOM element. And then within the map, if we save as the key a DOM element, we can save whatever values we want. Right now, we're going to take a much more narrow approach, which is the data set. And the built-in HTML5 data set capability, it can only store stuff as strings, and the, re and the way, if you want a mental model for why it can only do strings, it's because it represents it as attributes on the DOM element. And we know that attributes can only be string values. So that's, that's your mental model. It's literally like serializing it as if it's an attribute on the element. But nevertheless, that's still going to work okay for us. So that's what we're going to do, is we're going to say tile element dot data set dot row is equal to i and data set dot call is j. So I've created two data set properties, row and column. They are going to have the values i and j respectively, but note the caveat that it will have turned those into strings, even though we assigned it numbers. So you cannot assign it a function or some complex circularly nested object or anything like that, that's going to fail because it can't be stringified properly. So we can now use that information, can't we? As we loop over our tiles, all we need to do is say if el.dataset.row is equal to row and el.dataset.column is equal to column, return el. I wonder if anybody spots the rather important large caveat here in line 64. Maybe I'll make it super explicit and put the cursor here.
What would happen if I wrote the code like that, the way so many people write their JavaScript? The type would be different. It would fail because we're passing in numbers and the thing that's in data set has been turned to a string. So you could either cast it back to a number, or you can do as I do and let JavaScript's coercion mechanism take care of that implementation detail for us. And if your linter yells at you, just turn your linter off. Again, I'm not saying that this is the right way for fine tile to be written. Indeed, we're eventually going to refactor it so there is no fine tile function. I'm just simply showing you different ways of approaching this and letting you see the trade-offs, the good and the bad in different ways of doing things. Let's do a little regression test. Let's switch over to our browser, refresh, and make sure that it's still working. It's not an automated test, but it still appears to be working correctly, even for the quite literal corner cases. Pun intended. Y'all must be too asleep. It must be like the post-lunch, uh, what is he talking about, chessboards? Even my good jokes, nobody laughs at. Well, maybe they're just not good jokes. I don't know. This code represents the option two branch. If your code happens to not be working, you missed something, missed an equals somewhere, don't feel bad. Stash your changes. Check out the option two branch. I promise there's going to be a payoff here in just a little bit. I know it might seem a little bit tedious and boring, but there's a reason why we're doing this. Moving on from option two as our starting point, why are we still recomputing these indexes? We don't need to recompute the indexes, do we? Because we saved it with the tile element. Let's get rid of these index O's. Now we don't need the board EL anymore. That's nice. Nor do we need the row EL. I love it when I get to delete stuff. It's my favorite programming activity. Does anybody spot the problem with this code? Hopefully you're paying attention. What's going to happen right here? Or actually, let's, I'll be even more specific about it. What's going to happen right here? Someone said strings. Yep. We still have the same problem. These things are coming out as strings, and we're trying to do numerical addition with them. And depending on what, which numerical uh, math, mathematics we do with it, we might end up getting string concatenation instead of incrementation the way that we want. So. Quick little fix. We can just force those to be numbers. Number is my favorite way to explicitly cast a string to a number. Other people like the plus operator in front of it. I think that's harder to understand.
Okay, next thing that we want to change, I know we're kind of going back and forth on a number of these things, but that's okay, we're kind of doing this on purpose. The next thing that we want to change is let's get rid of having this as a DOM, a single dimensional DOM list, and let's make a data structure that is a two dimensional JavaScript array that is a native JavaScript array that is going to run much faster because we're still touching the DOM with every access of that tiles array, every iteration over the tiles array, we're still touching the native DOM. Let's go ahead and just get references to those DOM elements into a real two-dimensional JavaScript array that represents our grid. It represents our chessboard. It's the data structure that we probably should have done at the beginning, but we got away with just using the DOM as a data structure to start with. And now we want to create a real data structure that is a two-dimensional array. Turns out it's not going to be nearly as hard as you think it is to do that. We're just going to construct that two-dimensional array as we construct the DOM. So I'll make tiles into an array. I will, for each row, construct a row array. We'll call it row tiles here. I will append into row tiles a reference to the div that we just created. So row tiles dot push tile el. I think for good measure I'll put that at the end just so it's more obvious where that's happening. And then after I've appended, I don't need to append anything because row tiles is all, uh, it needs to be pushed into tiles ahead of time. So tiles dot push row tiles. Now I can get rid of this line. I love deleting things. There's we, we got rid of that whole query selector call, query selector all call. So now we're just pushing into this array a set of row arrays and into those row arrays respectively the tile element references. Can everybody see that the end result of the draw function is that we now have a DOM built up of a two-dimensional matrix of DOM elements, and we separately have a two-dimensional JavaScript array with references to those DOM elements. It's kind of like an index, like we did in the other exercise. Our JavaScript array is not holding any new data. It's just holding references to the DOM elements that are in the DOM. So we've constructed ourselves a nice little fast index to get at the elements that we want. Unfortunately, it is going to slightly, temporarily, slightly complicate our loop here. So we're going to need to do a two-dimensional loop to be able to go through them now instead of a single-dimensional loop. So our clearing of the highlighted is now going to be row of tiles and tile, I will just call it el of row. And we'll do the same thing down here with our find tile. We need to adjust this. But here's a little bit of a payoff. I'm more excited about this payoff than you are. But I like that this is just now that. And in fact, you look at that and you say, well, if the only thing that find tile is doing is simply accessing that position in an array, maybe we don't even need a find tile function. JavaScript would do the inlining for us, but I would argue that this is just going to be clearer code to get rid of find tile. And unfortunately, I'm going to have to change those parentheses to square brackets. I mean, take out the parentheses. I, I should have done. Let me back this up. I should have done tiles. And then, oops. G 
change these to square brackets. And now we can just delete find tile entirely, which gives me even more joy. Oh, I can't do comma that way. That's not JavaScript. It should be, but it's not. I got to do the two square brackets thing. I'm going to regression test my code to make sure I didn't make another dumb mistake. Hey, look at that. It's still working. There are undoubtedly other optimizations that we could make to this code. But I got to be honest with you, I'm getting a little bit tired of trying to polish what is basically just an ugly piece of junk. And at this moment, I as an algorithmist am asking myself, did some of those early decisions I make sort of paint me into a corner? Did they force me down a road that I now wish I wasn't down? And I'm going to do as any good algorithmist should do. At some point, you need to take a step back and potentially rethink the whole problem. This code roughly minus a few potentially slightly different variable names. This is option three. So that's your new starting point for the final iteration that we're going to make on this code. But before we make that iteration on this code, we've got to go rewire our brains. And we'll do that immediately after this break. If you find yourself banging your head against an algorithm solution, one of the questions that you should somewhat regularly revisit is, did one of my earlier decisions put me into this position? And could I have made a different decision that might unstick me? Ironically, it's somewhat like the backtracking and recursive descent algorithms that we've already kind of seen that you might go three-fourths of the way down the tree to one particular solution and then only then discover that that wasn't the optimal path and have to do some backtracking. And sometimes you got to backtrack all the way to the beginning. Thus far we've been trying to convince ourselves that maybe if we just keep plugging away at this we're going to get something that looks like a more graceful or more direct or more straightforward kind of solution that's optimal. And I think we definitely have improved the performance of the solution insofar as is possible. Maybe there are a few tweaks here and there. But I really think that the mental model that we used is the problem. And that's okay. We learned some valuable things, lessons along the way. But sometimes it does make sense to go back and start from scratch. So I want to show you this next slide. You remember I told you about these at the beginning of this exercise. These being the major diagonals and the minor diagonals. We fundamentally chose a data structure that was oriented horizontally and vertically. And why did we choose that? Well, it was quite convenient to use the data structure of the DOM as our earliest bootstrapping steps. The DOM is oriented in that way. It's kind of very hierarchical, nested in that way. In other words, the DOM has no notion of diagonals. So what we have been attempting to do is retrofit onto a data structure that is horizontally 
and vertically oriented, a problem that is quite literally 45 degrees askew. You follow me? And it's not a surprise that that only becomes apparent when you draw it out. I said earlier in the workshop, don't be afraid of pulling out a pen and a sheet of paper. And when I was working on this problem and trying to come up with better ways to do things, I pulled out a sheet of paper and I started drawing it out. And I don't know exactly what it was, why it happened, but I'm going to tell you a story as if it is. I'm, I'm just telling, I'm telling a story as if this really happened, even though it technically didn't. The paper, a little tuft of wind, blew the paper just so it turned 45 degrees on my desk. And the light bulb moment went off. And what went off for me was, why am I doing arrays of rows and columns instead of doing a matrix of my diagonals? Why don't I construct a data structure that is shaped and oriented to the problem that I have? instead of trying to take the problem and retrofit it to a data structure. You see that? So I want you to notice that I have arbitrarily indexed these major diagonals, 0 through 14. The 15 major diagonals, I just chose this ordering. You could have picked a different ordering, but this was convenient. I ordered these major diagonals 0 through 14 as such. And notice that when we look at the minor diagonals, I started their indexing at 15 rather than at 0 and ordered them from 15 to 29. So there are a total of 30 diagonals, 15 major and 15 minor. And I chose to put them in one list, 0 through 29, as opposed to two separate lists. Is that a good or a bad choice could be debated, but that's just a convention I chose. Okay? And we're going to see what we can do with those numbers. Sometimes it's literally just an arbitrary decision that you make. You put a stake in the ground and you build the fence around the stake. And that's all I did. I looked at these diagonals and said, I'm going to treat them as a data structure. And rather than doing like a two-dimensional set of diagonal data structures or something. I'm just going to have one dimension of all my diagonals. The first half of my data structure is the majors, and the second half is the minors. That's it. That's all I did. It's not very sophisticated. But I numbered them as such. And here's what that further got me. Because going back to the coordinate system, if this is my, we'll call it the Cartesian coordinate or the DOM coordinate for 2, I need to translate that coordinate into the diagonals coordinate system. In other words, there's an index of the major diagonal that 4, 2, square participates in, and there's an index of the minor diagonal that 4, 2 participates in. Specifically, it participates in the major diagonal at index 5 and the minor diagonal at index 21. So in other words, I need a way to convert the coordinate 4, 2 to the coordinate 5, 21. This is not going to turn out to be very much rocket science. It's pretty straightforward math. It might look slightly arbitrary, but if you follow along with this math, you will see that I can take the coordinate 4 minus 2, and subtract that from 7, and I get 5. And you think, oh, well, there's a lot of ways that you could have done it. But notice that if I do that same thing for all of the other coordinates along that diagonal, they all have the exact same pattern, which is that if I subtract the column index from the row index and then subtract that from 7, I get the major diagonal index of 5. I was just messing around with numbers, and I was like, yep, that works. And then I tried it on the other rows, like on row 4 and, I mean, diagonal 4 and diagonal 3 and all of them. And it turns out that math works for all of those diagonals. And then I said, okay, well, I've done half the problem. I've converted my 
row index into my major diagonal index. Now I need to convert my column index into my minor diagonal index. That being the general formula for converting. And that general formula is only the general formula based upon the arbitrary decisions that I made about how I structured my data structure. So I inferred it from looking at the diagram that I drew out on paper. If you make different decisions in your data structure, you end up with a different formula, but it can be the exact same concept. You follow me? So then we switch to the minor diagonal, and it turns out that I can compute 21 as taking the row index plus the column index and then adding 15. And the same is true for all of the tiles along that diagonal. And so I have a general formula for converting from the column index, the row and column index, to the minor diagonal, like that. That means that if I had a data structure that kept track of all of those diagonals in those indexes, and I click one specific diagonal and I know what its tile and row, I know what its index is, then it's a trivial computation mathematically to find out what indexes of the two major and minor diagonals I have. And then I just need to loop over all the elements in each of those two diagonals. I don't need to do any math of like minus ones and plus ones and less than or equal. It's just all the elements in the major diagonal co collection and all of the elements in the minor diagonal collection add highlighted to them. That's it. No math at all. So let's do it. First thing is that our list of tiles in the two-dimensional grid, which we thought was an improvement on the previous stuff, we're going to get rid of that. Actually, we're going to do a lot of deleting, it's going to, so it's going to get kind of fun here. I love when I get to delete things. We do need to add something, which is that we need to keep track of our new data structure, which I'm going to call diagonals. Okay? And diagonals is going to be an array indexed 0 through 29, so it's going to be 30 diagonals in this. Okay? So we need to set up those 30 diagonals. There might be more clever ways of doing it, but I want to be super obvious about it. I'm going to create 30 diagonals by pushing an empty array into it 30 times. This is setting up my diagonals data structure. Everybody following so far? I can get rid of the row tiles and tiles push and row tiles push. That's stuff we can get rid of. And indeed, I can get rid of the data set row and data set column stuff. And you'll see why in just a moment. I need to compute from the row and column index which of the two diagonals, which of the diagonals, the 30 that are there, which ones do I need to store a reference to it in? Which index do I need to put it in? You with me? We have those uh, formulas on the slides. I'm just going to type them out here. If I were to say the major diagonal index, you recall that it is 7 minus the quantity row index, which is i minus j. You remember that from the slides? And minor diagonal index is 15 plus i plus j. So, I need to store the, el the tile element reference at in inside of those diagonals. So I can say diagonals of major diag index dot push tile element. 
and diagonals of minor diag index dot push tile element. That is the constructing of my new data structure. Everybody follow that? Each time I create a new tile element, I make sure to insert it into the appropriate diagonals. Order doesn't matter within these diagonals, because all we're doing is highlighting all of them or clearing all of them. We don't care what order it is. OK, everybody with me so far? Let's move down to the highlight function. And we'll, I'm going to temporarily comment this out. That reminds us that we need to come back and fix that. Let's come down here. We know that we were previously getting the tile row index and tile column index. And we were pulling that out from the data set, right? So we could still store it into the data set. And then here, we could recompute the major index and the minor index. You with me? I could copy these computations down here. And then I would know, based on the tile that was clicked, I would know what major uh, row index, or major diagonal index and minor diagonal index that particular clicked tile belongs to. You could just copy the math and do it here. But even that is redoing computational work. It's not that much computational work. It's trivial math, but it is redoing work that we already did. So I'm going to go back up here, and I'm going to further rethink things. Why am I computing the index and then pushing it in, only to then have to later recompute the index? Earlier, somebody mentioned that if we want to store more rich information with a DOM element, we could use a map. And that's what I want to do. I don't want to store the index that you're in and then have to go retrieve that index. I actually want to associate with each tile element a reference to the diagonal that it belongs to, the two diagonals that it belongs to. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to, cons we're going to create ourselves a variable We'll call this tile diagonals. And we're going to make capital M map, an instance of capital M map. This is different from objects because remember, this is going to allow us to use anything as the key. And in this case, we're going to use DOM elements as the key. You with me? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Have I lost you yet? We're doing OK? All right. So at this moment, I want to insert an entry into that tile diagonals map that includes references to the two diagonals that it belongs to. You with me? And I'm going to key it by the tile element. So in other words, I'm going to do something like this. I'm going to say tile diagonals dot, I think it's add, I'm sorry, set. Tile diagonals.set, that's the method on maps. Tile diagonals.set, what's the index? It's the tile element. And what is the value? Well, why don't we just make, collect the two references to the two diagonals? So how are we going to get those two diagonals? Well, here's what I'm going to do. Let me actually move this down. I'm just going to combine this, instead of saving it separately as indexes, I'm just going to get a reference to the major and minor diagonals. So now I have my major diagonal and my minor diagonal. And those are the two things that I want to put their references in right here.
Does everybody follow how we did this? We took our tile element and used it as the key to store a two element array, a tuple, that includes the major diagonal and the minor diagonal in it. The major diagonal and the minor diagonal are references, so this is just merely more indexing. These are references to the actual arrays that we created up here that we stuffed the tile element reference into. So it's kind of making like a double linkage, like the diagonal knows about the element and the element knows about the diagonal. You see that? And we're using the map as a way to create that, well, you might think of it as like a third party association between the two. We have a DOM element and we have an, a, a tuple array and we want to create a relationship between the two and we store that relationship in our tile diagonals map. Thank you, map data structure. That's a nice, good solution for us. It's going to be nice and efficient. Well, now that we come back to highlight, this is where the fun stuff starts. What do I need to do with a tile element? To get its major and minor diagonal, which I might call the things that I need to highlight, so I'll call this like to highlight. That's going to be my little tuple array. I'm going to call tile diagonals dot get, and I'm going to give it the tile element. Everybody with me? There are two elements in there, so I'm going to say for let diagonal of to highlight and then for let tile or so sorry, let EL of diagonal. I'll spell this out instead of diag. el.classList.add highlighted. That should look familiar. That's the same way we've been highlighting the tiles all along. So that's nothing new. The only thing new is this outer for loop is now going over our new tuple from our data structure, our tuple index into our data structure. But otherwise, this already looks exactly the same kind of loop that we were doing before. Just go over all the el references and add highlighted to all of them. Are you ready for the fun part? All of this we get to delete. I just love that. That's all gone. Because this is it. This for loop is literally all we need to do to highlight the diagonals for a tile element. So take just a moment. We're not quite done, but take just a moment. Make sure you understand how we were able to remove all that other stuff and how this, all it's doing, it solves the problem. We are storing in the map a reference from a tile element to the two diagonals that it participates in. And when we are clicking on a tile element, we retrieve that, that tuple to know which of the two, it, to know the major and minor diagonals that it participates in, and we're simply looping over any elements that are in either of those two diagonals and highlighting them. We don't need to keep track of any indexes or you know row and none of that. We don't have to keep track of any of that. We've already stored a data structure that gave us a flat reference to the elements that we'll, that we will need to care about. But there's one last little detail, which is that I commented this code out so that we would remember that we needed to come back to it. How do we know which elements that we need to unhighlight? You remember that up until this point, we've only had this basically dumb algorithm, which was just try to unhighlight all of them. But now spot this. This tuple represents the stuff that we highlighted before. And that's information that we're trying to basically recompute or ignore. Why don't we just save that? 
In fact, instead of declaring this as a variable, I'm going to rename this to highlighted. I'm going to declare that as one of the variables that I have in my module scope so that I can remember it over time. And here's the fun part. This code right here, this for loop, this nested for loop, I'm going to copy it. I'm going to paste it right here. Uninvent it one level. And change add to remove. That's it. That's our entire solution. How many people think that we drastically simplified the way that we solved this problem? And indeed, haven't we improved the performance of this because we are now only looking at the tiles that we care about and we don't even need to recompute which tiles those are because we save that information as we construct the board. To me, this is one of the clearest of the various examples that I could give you. It's one of the clearest examples of how powerful it is when you have a data structure that is aligned with your problem instead of trying to align your problem to your data structure. Sometimes that means finding a data structure that somebody else has already written. Go get the NPM package, install it, use it, boom, you're done. Sometimes we have to get a little bit creative and construct our own list of diagonals arrays. You shouldn't be scared of that. Was this painful code? I feel like by this point, most of you should feel pretty confident that all we did was construct some arrays. There wasn't any sophisticated algorithmic thinking here. The only light bulb moment that I had to have was turning the problem by 45 degrees, and that was it. to make sure that we didn't make a mistake somewhere, which does happen. Let me go do our regression test to make sure we didn't make a mistake. Hey, it works. Nice. It's important for you to have fingers on keyboard with this stuff. If I had simply told you this, it wouldn't really click. So having the fingers on keyboard is an important characteristic. But I will say that the bigger takeaway from this exercise is not the code that we wrote. It's not the code that we deleted. It's the discipline and the willingness to ask questions about our problem, to backtrack and ask different questions, and to attempt things, in this case, at a 45 degree angle. I don't know if any of you have ever looked weirdly at your code before. I've done that before. This is a literal manifestation of the, what is it doing? Oh, now I see what it's doing. OK? Any questions I can answer about this exercise, the things we did, things we didn't do, things we skipped over? Some of you might have been frustrated that there were earlier optimizations that I left on the table, and it's because I knew that we were about to delete all the code anyway. Uh, just people saying, awesome, 
very elegant clap. Uh, went over to, it went over my head a bit at the end, but I loved it. As I said earlier, there is no substitution for you trying this, so you're going to have to go back and unzip this zip file later and retry it from scratch. And it would be beneficial for you to first try to do any implementation. Use the for loops approach if that's all that you can figure out how to do. But try to get something working. And then try to figure out the approach of the diagonals and see if you can make it work. I'm much more interested in if the mental model, the conceptual approach makes sense than I am that you got exactly the comma in the right spot or exactly the right calculation of the index. <coughs> Any last questions before we transition to our next exercise? Why don't we take like a two minute break and let me do the resetting. Just like two or three minutes just to reset. All right. Hopefully, at the midway point through our exercises, you're starting to develop a little bit more confidence, a little less uh, tenseness over tackling these algorithmic challenges. And hopefully, the takeaway that you're getting here is that there's no writing the big algorithm all at once, top down. That it's always a tiny little series of increments and improvements and additions. It's little tiny Lego pieces that we build on top of each other. And that's how you see me writing the code. That's exactly the best that I can recommend for you as algorithmist as you, as you go forward. We're going to transition into the next exercise, which is called Knight's Dialer. This is a classic problem. And it has been used in various big name company job interviews. Fang type companies have at one time or another used problems like this. So it's one of the classic ones. And there are, in fact, linked in the project repo on this workshop, linked in the readme. There's a link to a series of blog posts that an interviewer from Amazon wrote about it and about ways to approach it. So. I recommend you go and check those out, read through those as further research on this topic. I've put my own little twist on the Knight's Dialer, and I think it's going to provide some nice, meaty stuff for us to dig into. And so we'll be settled into this exercise for a while. There are se several different concepts that we want to explore, and, and we will push the envelope quite a bit. But you're on firm ground now, so even though it might start to look a little unfamiliar, don't. Don't lose that confidence. You can do this. What is the Knight's Dialer? Building off of the concept of the chessboard before, it's kind of a nice little extension. What if our chessboard was actually the numeric keypad from an old school phone? Uh, I'm old enough to remember when phones actually had push buttons like this. And I remember that there were phones that didn't even have the little asterisk and the star button. They were literally just blank spaces like you see here. So this is the theoretical setup, obviously. It's kind of a silly example. It sits in a more theoretical space, but it is going to help us to learn a lot of different concepts within the broader DSA space. The premise of this problem is the night piece the K-N-I-G-H-T piece in the game of chess. For those of you that are familiar with chess, you know that the knight moves in an L pattern, one over and two down. And so we might think of the knight, if it were moving on a numeric keypad, if it started on the one key, it might move from the one key over to the six key, or it might move from the one key down to the eight key. Those are the two places that you could move as a knight 
if you started on the 1 key. Hopefully that makes sense. If you start on the 6 key, where can you move? Not four. You said four? No, seven, one, or zero. Oh, you said or zero. Okay, yes. I thought you said four, zero. Gotcha. Minnesota accent. <laughs> Correct. Okay. Correct. Seven, one, and also zero. Zero is a valid move. Okay? So what about the five key? If you were on the five key, where can you move? Nowhere. Not a trick question, it's pretty straightforward. There's nowhere to move if you're on the five key and vice versa, there's no other key that could move to the five key. So we could have just left it out, but then that would have looked like a really weird dial pad. So we leave it in, even though we're all gonna admit and agree, the five key doesn't really matter in this problem. So there are 10 numbers, but really only nine of them actually matter. You with me? All right. The key question that we need to start with is what are the nearby keys to me? In other words, what are the places that I can move? If I'm on the one key, the answer is six and eight. If I'm on the two key, the answer is seven and nine. If I'm on the sixth key, it's one, seven, and zero, right? So this notion of determining what are my nearby keys, that's going to be one core thing that we need to solve. That'll be one of our things. And indeed, if you look at the code in the repo, you'll see there's a to-do for us to figure out what are my nearby keys. The second part of the problem is knowing that information, once I know what my nearby keys are, if I started on any given key, like the one key, and I told you that you could make a certain number of hops, like four or 20, what are all of the possible different paths that you might take making all those jumps. In fact, how many different paths could you take if you started on a given key and you made a certain number of jumps? And the first thing that you should observe about that is that I could start on the one key and jump to the six key, and then I could jump right back to the one key. That's a totally valid move. So given only the count of hops that I can take and the starting key, Tell me the count of how many possible different paths I could take around this dial pad. That's the classic statement of the night styler. It's a counting problem. You with me? We're not really asking you to like draw out all the paths or anything like that, list them all out. We're simply asking you to count them. There are a lot of counting problems in algorithmics. And this is one of them. But here's where I've extended things, because there's a third kind of problem that we might tackle within the scope of Knight Styler. It's one that I find more interesting even than the counting, which is what are all of the play what are the paths that I can take from any given starting key without ever hitting any repeats? In other words, I'm not going to allow 161. I'm going to have to go from 1, 6, and then to 7, and then to 2, and then to 9. What are those paths? How many of those are there? You with me? That's an extension to this problem that is not part of the normal classical statement, but we're going to track that. So that'll be our third part of this problem, is we want to compute the unique paths. Or there's another way of saying this in DSA and computer science terms, which is to say that the paths that we're counting are what we call cyclic paths, meaning we allow cycles, and we also want to enumerate or go through all of the acyclic paths, meaning paths that do not have cycles. So we are counting the cyclic paths because there are many, 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 many more of those, and we're going to actually enumerate the acyclic paths because there's actually a very small number of those. If you think about it, there's only nine possible numbers to jump to, so what is the longest possible acyclic path? Nine, right? That's the longest possible, actually eight jumps, but nine numbers that we would visit. That's the longest possible path. So we want to list out all of those acyclic paths from a starting number. Everybody understand the problem that we'll be going through? Yep. 
Okay. Let's switch over to our code editor. And in our dialer module, you'll note that we have the three functions that correspond to the three tasks that I just described to you. And our to-do comments there quite helpfully explain to us what we need to be returning. The reachable keys function is called by the app. You with me? It's called by the app. And when we go to run our app, we're going to need it to be able to respond correctly because in our app, when you hover over a key, it, the app uses the return from reachable keys to highlight the possible places that we can jump. So it's just a little like usability thing. So reachable keys is not just an internal utility. It's one of our public API methods used by the app. We'll look at the app in, here in just a moment. Okay. We also want to implement the count paths. That's their counter. And you can probably guess that this is where we're going to have some pretty deep and moderately complex recursion going on. All right, because there's a lot of paths and a lot of backtracking that immediately evokes the idea that we're probably going to want to be doing some recursion. And then we have our listing out of our acyclic paths. And again, we're probably going to end up using some recursion to do that. Lots to tackle. We're going to do it one by one, so don't feel too intimidated. Let's just start with the reachable keys. The first thing that we want to do is start with some basic data structure that's going to allow us to build off of. It may not be the data structure that we finish with, and in fact it definitely won't be, but let's just pick a place to start. It's putting a stake in the sand and saying this is what I can start with. And I want to just describe what I think is the most basic and obvious of possible data structures, which is that I want to represent my dial pad as a two-dimensional array. I'm going to leave spaces here <laughs> for those empty ones and put the zero in its location just so it's obvious what's going on. Dial pad is my starting data structure. And the purpose of reachable keys is given any specific input starting digit, any one of these, return me an array of all the possible places that I could move to, the reachable keys from that location. So let's dive in. I do want to declare a thing which I'll call nearby keys. This is my array that I'm going to return. And I will fill, fill it in with any keys that I discover that I'm able to. If you think about our dial pad, I'm going to go back to the slides for a moment so we can get some conceptual backing here. If you think about our dial pad, the coordinate system of our dial pad is not that unlike the coordinate system we initially started with on our chessboard. Unlike our chessboard, we don't have any diagonals going on here, which is nice. But we do have this sort of horizontal and vertical movement by coordinates that was very similar to the horizontal and vertical movement that we made on the chessboard initially. And you'll notice that if I start on 1 and I go over to 6, then I increased my row index by 1 from 0 to 1, and I increased my column index by 2. I went from column 0 to column 2. So we went from the coordinate 0, 0 to the coordinate 1, 2. And notice that if I were going from 1 to 8, it would be going from the coordinate 0, 0 to the coordinate 2, 1. That increased the row by 2 and the column by 1. You might start to see a pattern here. Similar to how in the diagonals, the coordinates changed both by 1, the row and the column index by 1. Here, we have a bit of asymmetry, which is that in any given move, we always change one of the two coordinates by two, and we always change the other coordinate by one. That is, we never do a 1-1 one, one move, and we never do a 2-2 two, two move. 
it's always 1, 2, 2, 1, negative 1, 2, negative 1, negative 2, etc. Everybody follow that? We're always changing by one of the coordinates by 1 and the other coordinate by 2. So we can just simply exploit that. Matter of fact, we can just simply brute force this. I can start, if I was given the starting key of 1, I can try all combinations of increasing my row and or my column index by one or two respectively and check to see if there's a key there. And if there is, put it in the array, and if not, don't. So I can just brute force an answer to this. I don't even need something super clever. We can just simply start with any index and try all the possible coordinate connections and see if there are keys there. And that's what we're going to do. Just plain old brute force. Everybody make, that makes sense to everyone? Okay. So let's do it. What we're going to do is start with an outer loop. And I'm going to do something some of you are familiar with. I'm going to do a destructuring here of the dial pad dot entries. So this is giving me an iterator that returns me tuples with the key and the value in it instead of only the value. You've seen four of loops before, but here I'm going to get the key and the value, so it's going to be row index and row. Entries will return us back these pairings of the index and the value, the row index and the row, and we're just simply destructuring those into individual variables here so that I don't have to have a temporary variable. Okay. Now, what I need to do is ask if the starting digit is in this particular row. Whatever iteration we're on is the starting digit in this row. So we could say, is the column index because we know row is going to be an array of numbers. If you give me two on the first row that I look at, we definitely will have two there and its index will be one. Zero based index will be one. Everybody follow that? Did I lose anyone? If starting digit is 2, the first iteration is going to look at this row, and it's going to say, what is the index of starting digit 2? And it's going to find it here, and the index will be 1. So here we'll have row index 0, column index 1. Give me thumbs. How are we feeling about those? Did that math make sense on those column and row indexes? Okay. I don't want to lose you. So how do I know if I found it in this row? Well, it's if call index is not equal to negative 1. If it's 0 or above, then we know that we found it. Otherwise, this is not a row that we care about, so move on. So we'll just wrap an if statement here. We'll say if call index is not equal to negative 1. I prefer the not equal to negative 1 to the greater than or equal to zero approach. Other people see it differently. However you feel, stylistically. Okay, so we know we have found it. We have the row index and the column index of the thing that we've been asked for. Everybody follow that? By the way, we could have done that with math, but we were gonna need to loop anyway, so it just made sense to use a loop to get to this point. But we could have done it Strictly speaking, we could have done it with some modulus math, but we needed a loop anyway. Okay, so let's look at the, uh, the column. I'm sorry. Let's look at the possible moves that could happen from the perspective of changing a row index. A row index could increase by 1 or increase by 2. Or a row index could decrease by 1, or it could decrease by 2. Follow that? That doesn't mean that it's on the board, but that's just theoretically that's what could happen to a row index if we were making a move. It could either increase by 1, increase by 2, decrease by 1, or decrease by 2. I'm going to write that out. I'm going to say let, let's do a for loop for all of those moves. Let's do let row move of, and I'm going to list those out. Negative 2, negative 1, 1, and 2. So row move is like my delta. 
right? Same thing with my columns. My columns can change by plus 1, plus 2, minus 1, or minus 2. That's right, the same kind of for loop there. All right. First of all, we know that a 1, 1, a 1, negative 1, a 2, 2, a 2, negative 2, those are all invalid moves, right? Those are not night moves. So of the 16 possible moves that are happening here, not all of them are actually even night moves. Does that make sense? So we're going to need an if statement to filter out the things that are not even valid night moves. And that can be, we're going to take the absolute value of the row move has to be not equal to the absolute value of the column move. That is, one of them's got to have an absolute value of 1, and the other one's got to have an absolute value of 2. I know we're getting super deeply nested here. Part of the reason why we're doing this, by the way, just to give you a little hint, I want this code to feel super ugly because it's going to motivate what we do in a little bit. Okay, so we definitely have valid night moves, but they may not be on the board. We need to make sure that we're only looking at moves that are actually within the geometry of the board. So we need to say we need to have several conditions be true to make it a valid move. We need to say that our current row index plus row move has to be greater than or equal to zero. In other words, we have to stay on the board. And our row index plus a row move has to be, how many rows do we have? We have row index 3. We have four rows, right? So that has to be less than or equal to 3 on my row index. And my column index plus my column move has to be greater than or equal to 0. And my column index plus my column move has to be less than or equal to, there's only three columns, so less than or equal to 2. And one final little wrinkle is that we don't want to end up in the bottom left or bottom right, which aren't keys. All right? So the last little part of this condition is that the dial pad of row index plus row move and call index plus call move cannot be undefined. Because it would be undefined for the two bottom empty corners, otherwise there would be a value there. All the way down, deeply nested in here, if we get all the way down to this point, we know for sure we have found a valid move that we could make from whatever the starting digit was. Because we brute forced our way to that. Does everybody see why that would guarantee us one of our possible valid moves? So now I need to simply stick these, stick this into nearby keys. Whatever is at that position is what goes into nearby keys. slightly more readable by moving that on to another line. I don't know if there's a way to make this line slightly more readable, but I'll try. All right, there is our reachable keys function. Everybody with me on that solution? It's ugly. It's brute force. 
but it gets the job done. And we want to test that it gets the job done. Just one moment, because I didn't restart my server over there. So. Hopefully they can edit that little part out. Okay, now that we've restarted our server, we're going to go and test it in the browser. Refresh. And we have our Knights Dialer here. We haven't done any of the counting stuff yet, but if we hover over the keys, we should see the nearby keys being highlighted in blue. If your implementation of that reachable keys function did not work, don't fret, because I'm about to delete it, okay? Just like one of those mean teachers back in school that makes you do work and then shows you that it wasn't even for a grade. I want you to notice something about reachable keys. It is brute force, it is ugly code. But I want you to notice something about the output of reachable keys. Does it ever change depending on anything about the user's actions? Is there anything about the user's actions that affects the outcome of the reachable keys function? The answer is no. In fact, what we are doing is brute force computing something which is already pre-known by the geometry of the board. You with me? Why don't we just make a data structure that has the reachable keys in it? Instead of making a data structure that is the dial pad that we then have to go and compute some geometry information from, why don't we just start with the data structure that is the list of reachable keys? It's fixed information. It's going to be very easy to compute. Why recompute it every single time we hover over a key? Everybody follow that? I'm going to show you how easy it is to pre-compute. I'm going to copy that code, and I think only that code. Let me make sure. Yeah, only that code I'm going to copy. Just going to drag over my little console here so we have a little bit more space to put some code in. I'm going to put that code in here. I'll It's a little harder for you to read down there, but maybe I can zoom this in so it's a little easier for you to type. All I'm going to do is create a for loop that calls this function once for each of the possible keys. And I'm going to call that nearby keys for let i equal 0, i less than or equal to 9, i plus plus, nearby keys dot push reachable keys called with i. This for loop is simply going to call that function once for each of the possible digits 0 through 9. Whatever it returns we're just going to push it into this nearby keys array and then just for good measure I'm going to pretty print out the nearby keys. You'll see why here in a moment. So we run this code. 
Oh, I didn't. I meant to do a JSON stringify. Sorry. <laughs> Console.log JSON.stringify was what I meant to pretty print it. And now I'm simply going to copy paste. I'm going to copy that. And I go back to the code editor. And I'm going to delete all of that. And give me just a moment to manually type all this. I could probably do this with a regular expression, but I'm going to type this out even quicker than I could write the regular expression. Just kind of annoyed by how it looks, and I don't want to do that. I don't want to leave it looking ugly. The truth is, in about the same amount of time as we wrote the code and then wrote the code to drive it, we could have just manually written this out. You could have just looked at the board and said, I know if I'm on key uh, zero, I can go to key four and six. And if I'm on key one, I can go to six and eight. And if I'm on key two, I can go to seven and nine. You could have just written this out probably a lot quicker than it took for us to go through writing the code. But I did that because I want to reinforce the point that in many algorithmic problems that we tackle, there is fixed known upfront stuff and you should pre-compute as much of that as you can. You should not defer until the runtime that which can be figured out pre-runtime. There's absolutely nothing about that knowledge of those nearby keys that needs to be recomputed. And so we should pre-compute it. And it turns out that the nearby keys is going to be a much better um, data structure for us to start from, from the dial path. We do still need that reachable keys function because, again, it's a public API method. But look what it now does. Instead of all that other junk that it was doing, now it just simply says nearby keys of starting digit. Ooh, that's a lot better, right? How many people like that solution better? If you like the previous one, no shame, but I, I don't understand why. <laughs> Just as a little bit of a heads up, because I like this code better and because it gets rid of a bunch of clutter in here. I jumped ahead a little bit. This optimization that I just made wasn't until one of our later branches. So in the branches, when you diff, you'll see that I still left in that uh, older version of reachable keys. I just jumped ahead because I didn't want to keep seeing all that ugly code. Our next task is to implement the count paths utility, but to implement that, we need to augment our conceptual understanding of the problem, how we're going to approach this. And so I'm going to switch back over to our slide to do that. Actually, before, I, before we do that, actually, let's just take a look at, or let's just double check that our reachable keys is still working exactly the same. So I'm going to switch over to the browser, get this out of the way. Let's zoom that back out a lot. Let's Okay, refresh, and we just wanted to double check that it's still working. So that should still be working for you, the hovering to show you the next keys. All right, now let's tackle learning about how to do the count paths. Fair warning, might stretch your brain a little bit if you're not super familiar with the notions of recursion, if that's newer to you. This is another one of those stretch your brain things. 
but it really is actually the same concept as what we've seen before already a couple of times, which is take a bigger problem and divide it down into smaller problems. Almost all recursion is like that. If I asked the count paths function takes as its first input the starting digit and as its second input the number of hops to take. So if I called count paths four of six, what I'm asking is how many possible paths can I take starting from four where my path length is six, my hop count is six. Technically, I guess the path length would be seven since the hops are six. Okay? How many paths can I take of length seven where I've taken six possible hops? That's what's being asked here. So how could we break this down into smaller problems? If you pull up on your screens a picture of the dial pad, you can tell me what are the three possible digits that I could go to from the digit four? Somebody say them out loud. What are the three digits that I can get to from the digit four? Three, nine, and zero. Three, nine, and zero. So we could say that the number of places that I could get to from four with a hop count of six is exactly equal to the number of places that I could get to from three with a hop count of five, whatever that is, plus the number of places that I could get to from nine with a hop count of five, whatever that is, plus the number of places that I could get to from zero with a hop count of five, whatever that is. Whatever those three things are, if you add them up, they have to be equal to whatever count paths four six is. There's a mathematical leap that I'm asking you to make that some of you that will be an easy leap and others you will be like, whoa, I don't believe that. But I want you to spend a moment, if you are doubting that, look at that pad and convince yourself that it has to be true because there's nowhere else that we could go from four other than to go to three, nine, and zero. So this has to be accounting for all of those possible paths. This is, again, we referenced this early in the course, this is one of those fundamental principles that when you study something like discrete math, you just start getting really good at. You start getting almost this spider sense intuition of, oh, I know that this is equal to that because it couldn't possibly be divided any further. There are no other options, so it has to be this. Or the reverse of that has to be this. You know, we get these intuition points from a study of discrete math. So it is worth thinking about and looking into. That's a good foundation for a lot of your algorithmic work. Now, we have not yet answered how do I figure out what count paths 3, 5 is, 9, 5, or 0, 5. We haven't answered that yet. We're going to answer that in just a moment. But whatever that answer is, do we now agree that if I add those three numbers together that it has to give me the answer to count paths four, six? If you're still doubting it, just keep looking at that dial pad and looking at the possible ways that you could go and convince yourself, is there anything else that I need, is there anything else that I would need to account for other counts and hopefully you'll eventually get that light bulb moment where you realize, yep, this has to account for all of them. So how would I answer the count paths 3, 5? Oh, by the way, these are what those actual numbers are. There's 168 possible paths that I can take from digit 4, making 6 hops. And here's the breakdown of those, 52, 52, and 64. How do I figure out something like count paths 3, 5? How I figure out count paths 3, 5 is I look at all the places I can go from digit 3. What are the places that I can go from digit 3? 4 and 8. 4 and 8. And I'm going to take one fewer hop count from those places, right? 
So starting from digit 4 with hop count of 4, and starting from digit 8 with hop count of 4, the amount of paths that I can do there has to be equal. The two together have to be equal to the 3, 5. And so we, on we could continue. We could say 4-4 four, four would break down into what its three constituent ones would be, and count paths would break down into what its two constituent paths would be. We could keep going until when would we stop? When hop count was zero, because there's nowhere else to go. We've made all the hops. You follow me? In other words, if I were to call count paths 3, 0, what should the return value be? This is a very critical point. Think to yourself, if I call count paths 3, 0, starting from digit 3 with no hops, how many possible paths are there? Zero. There's only two rational answers, 0 or 1. I'm going to suggest to you why 1 is the right answer because... If they were all zeros at the end, we would never add anything up. So we have to define the base case as if I am on the key and I can't move anywhere, there's only one path for me to take, which is to stay right put. So we define that base case as one. If we define it as zero, all of our math is going to add up to zero. <laughs> you follow me? So we actually already now have the constituent, and it's not that much code. We already have the constituent pieces that we need to be able to calculate this. We have the constituent pieces because we see the recurrence relationship, which is the count paths of any starting digit with a hop count is equal to the two or three possible sub count paths with one fewer hop count. That is the count paths from all of my reachable keys with one fewer hop, hop count. And we know that the base case is that when hop count comes in as zero, what do we do? We return one. So from that conceptual basis alone, we now have what we need to be able to solve this. I want to give you one further set of diagrams for you to understand what's happening. In this diagram that I'm about to do that's going to animate out, F is the count path, but I just replaced count path with F because there's a bunch of stuff and it's, I needed to save space, okay? But when you see F of 4, 6, that means count paths of 4, 6. There are two kinds of ways that we could traverse through all of the possible paths to do the counting. We've referred to these before. We've referred to breadth first and depth first. You may have seen those terms before. But this animation shows you the difference in ordering. So this would be a breadth-first traversal through all of those possible counts. And you can see that we are going to the leaf level and going all the way through the possible leaves and then going to the next level and checking out all of their leaves and then going to the next level and checking out all of their leaves. We are going wide before we go deep, and that's why this is called a breadth-first traversal. But you see there that the count path 4 of 6 is the same thing. I wish I had a red mouse cursor here. But the count path 4 of 6, this root node, is the same thing as visiting the count path of 3, 5 plus the count path of 9, 5 plus the count path of 0, 5. Who in turn are the same thing as f of 3, 5 is the same thing as visiting f of 4, 4 and f of 8, 4. F of 9, 5 is the same thing as visiting F of 2, 4, and F of 4, 4, and so on. Does everybody see that? This isn't an actual physical tree. It's a conceptual tree for the call stack. These are all the function calls that we would make recursively as we went through it. Because counting addition is commutative, it doesn't matter what order we go through in this tree. But that would be the breadth-first traversal, is looking at all of those and looking at all of those. 
As it turns out, it's going to be much, much easier to write a depth-first computation of this. Far fewer lines of code. So here's the animation for the depth-first traversal. Oh, by the way, we could write this. We would write it as a for loop with a queue. Breadth-first traversal is an iterative for loop with a queue. And I hinted at that when we talked about the islands problem before, you remember. Okay? We're not going to write that code, but you could write a version of this with an iterative in queue. It's just more work. So the depth first traversal looks like this. Look at where we go first. We go from 4, 6, down to 3, 5, down to 4, 4, down to 3, 3, all the way down to the leaf, and then we backtrack up, and then we go down to the leaves again, and then we backtrack up, and we go down to the leaves again, and so on. And that's why you can see with that animation that we're going depth first rather than breadth first. Both traversals would visit every node, and therefore both traversals would make every function call, and therefore the entire resolution of this would be the same, which is 168. These are two different ways of conceptualizing the problem, and it turns out that even though they would both give the same answer, one of them is drastically easier to code than the other. Follow me? But they are isomorphic. You could write them in either way. It's just the recursion is going to be a lot easier, make a lot more sense. So we're going to do this approach with recursion. So hopefully you now are getting enough of the sense of that that we can tackle writing the recursive version of count paths. So let me switch over to our code editor. And while that was a lot of words for me to describe the algorithm, it might be somewhat anticlimactic that it's only going to be a handful of lines of code. Okay? Remember in recursion, we always need a base case. What was our base case? What did I say we were going to simply define as happening at some point? Return one when there's no hops. When the hop count was zero, zero we defined it as Return one. a path count of one, right? We just stay in place. So if hop count is zero, return one. I now need a variable that I will increment. I'll start it at zero, and I'm going to call this path count, and that is going to be the thing that I return. Now, from a given starting digit, how do I know which nodes in the conceptual call stack tree I need to visit? What thing tells me the answer to that question? Given a starting digit of, say, 4, how do I know where I need to visit? I need to visit a certain set of digits from what? The reachable keys? It's calling the reachable keys function, yes, but we don't even need to call that function in this case. We can literally just do nearby keys of starting digit, right? Because they're the same thing. Let's just skip the function call. Yes, the JavaScript engine would probably inline it, but there's no reason for us to call it unnecessarily. So if we were starting on digit 4, then this loop would do three different iterations, right? It would do an iteration with 3, an iteration with 9, and an iteration with 0. And so digit would be 3, 9, and 0. So, you ready for the big reveal? Path count incremented by count paths with the digit that we're looking at, in this case 3, 9, and 0, and 
hop count minus one. So hop count starts out as six, and then on the next recursive call stack, it's five, and then it's four, and then it's three, and eventually it gets to zero, and what do we do? We return one. I had to spend 15 minutes explaining through slides and diagrams and all kinds of complicated uh, animations that which only took us a grand total of six lines of code to write. Still, if you were presented this problem in a job interview and you wrote those six lines of code correctly, I think it's probably an instant hire <laughs> because 99.9% .9 of people would stare blankly at the screen, they'd fumble around and maybe eventually get something kind of on the path. But this illustrates how important it is as a skill that we engineers need that we be able to think this way. Because once I taught you to think this way, it didn't actually take much effort to code that way, did it? What was the real challenge? Helping you to understand the mental model, right? If you can think algorithmically, you can code algorithmically. You follow me? Let's test it. Let's go back over to the browser, refresh the page. And we said that we wanted to check starting, we wanted to take six hops, and we wanted to start from four, and we know that the answer should be 168, right? Let's try it. And there we got our 168. We're not doing any of these parts yet because we haven't written that code. That code's a bit more complicated, but we'll tackle that in a second. But we just know that we got six hops. And I want you to notice something that I didn't tell you about before, but I inserted into this exercise a little bit of rudimentary performance benchmarking. It's very, very crude. But notice that that operation took us 0.3 milliseconds. It's pretty quick. You can probably imagine that as we increase the number of hops, it starts to take longer, right? So I went from 10 to 11. I want you to see what happens from 2.7 to, well, that was probably not a good example. I think the other one was an outlier. Let's go from 12 to 13. Actually, I, I know that this doesn't start to really show up until we're at a slightly higher number, so I'm gonna start at 20. That was 0.19 seconds, that's 190 milliseconds. What happens when I go to 21? So we went from 0.19 to 0.46. That's a little bit more than double, isn't it? What happens when I go from 21 to 22? Any predictions? Point 0.94. A little bit more than double. 23? A little bit more than double. You spotting a pattern here? It's doubling, a little bit more than doubling each time. We have a word for this in computer science. We call this exponential growth. It's problematic, isn't it? We're only at 23 hops and we're already taking 2.31 physical seconds. What do you think predict is going to happen when I do 24? What's it going to be? Approximately like five, maybe 5.2, 5.3 seconds, we'll see. It's painful to wait. Oh, slightly less than that, all right. My math wasn't great at estimating. Where are we going to be here? A little bit over 10 seconds, maybe? Maybe slightly over 10 seconds? We'll wait the 10 seconds, it's worth it, just to <laughs> prove it. I'm not going to go any further than the 10 seconds, but I think you get the point. It's steadily growing slightly more than exponential. I was up to 12, all right? 
So we have a working solution that's completely impractical for any arbitrarily large data sets. This is where the theoretical math starts to kick in. It's where the theoretist, theoreticist of the algorithmic job kicks in because we could have looked at the code before we ever ran any tests and known that this was going to be true. And I want to help you see that. I want to help you understand that. So I'm going to go back to the slides. In fact, it is an O of N of not 2 to the N, which is exponential, but 2.222 repeating forever to the N, which is slightly more than doubling each time. And how do I know that it's 2.222? Well, I can actually do the math because I, uh, I read this. But there's another way that later we'll come back to, and we'll see that 2.22 coming back to us. There's another way of verifying that, but I'll just give you a, a quick little preview. If you think about all of the places that I can go from any digit, some of the digits have two places that I can go. Some of them have three places that I can go, right? If you average out the number of places on average that I can go, guess what the average is? 2.22. And there it bears out for us. It's rare, actually, that we get something that is so crystal clear, the empirical evidence that we have matching with the theoretical theory that we have. But we could have looked at this problem and said, even before I ran it the first time, I could have said, I know for a fact this code is going to run at slightly above exponential growth. You follow me? Because I can just look at what it's doing. I know that it's doing, for everything, it's doing an average of 2.22 more things. So it's definitely going to grow slightly more than exponential. We call this exponential. Now, I've used a couple of different terms. I've used constant, I've used linear, I've used exponential. What are these? These are ways of articulating the severity of the theoretical worst case growth. This is a chart that I stole directly off of BigOCheatSheet.com. You should totally go to that website. Uh, it's got a lot of great information about this, so it's good foundational material and back reading. But I want you to look at, I've listed up there in the top, we've got, starting from the top, we have kind of like the worst of the big O's, at least the worst of the most commonly named big O's, all the way down to the bottom, constant being the best. So we have like, Constant time is like awesome. I guess the best is, again, technically the best is zero because we never did it. But if you have to do some work, the best growth is the growth that never grows because it just flatlines, right? That's that black line there at the bottom. Or the next step up is what we call logarithmic. That's that darker green. It's almost horizontal, isn't it? No matter how far out we go, it's almost horizontal. There's barely any growth at all. And then we have the O of N. Uh, is up there at that line, you see that it just kind of steadily grows up. It's not growing super fast, but it's growing in a line. Then you look up at O of n log n, that's what we call linear logarithmic. So it's ever so slightly starting to bend up. It kind of looks like mostly like a line, but it's starting to bend up, and the further out you go, the higher it's going to get quicker and quicker. It's growing a little bit faster than O of n, actually fairly faster. We're into that orange. That's kind of like the warning sign. Like if you're in this area, you should be a little bit concerned that maybe it might not be practical in production. <laughs> Once you get into the red, you're almost never going to see one of those deployed in production unless you have a pretty fixed constraint on your problem set where you know it doesn't matter. It could grow of n squared because n never gets above 5. Big deal, right? But if n can ever get out of out of our control, then we have to be really concerned about it. So we have O of n squared, which is our exponential. I'm sorry, that's our poly, po, that, I just did it. I was about to tell you, I always mix this up. That's polynomic, n squared. And then we have two to the n, that's the very close one that we just looked at, that's exponential. Polynomic and exponential, n squared, two to the n. I always mix these two up, and I did it just there. I was even trying not to mix it up, and then I mixed it up. N squared is polynomic. Same thing with N cubed or N, N to the fourth or whatever. 
2 to the n or 3 to the n or 4 to the n or 2.222 n to the n, that's called exponential. And then the worst of all is factorial. And there are technically worse than factorial, but they don't really go by any commonly known names. So these are the commonly known names that you need to be familiar with if you're going to speak computer scientist, if you're going to speak algorithmist. You need to be able to say, yeah, I think my algorithm grows at linear logarithmic, or I think it's exponential, or I think it's polynomic, or I'm pretty sure it's constant. You, know, you need to be able to say those kinds of things. Remember that these are a, an estimate of the worst case. A lot of times we like to code based on, well, I'm pretty sure that in the average case it's going to do great. And the algorithmist is going to look back at you and say, I don't really care what the average case is. <laughs> what I care about is, is this going to crash because in the worst case it is exponential and it takes, you know, a thousand minutes to run or something. Here's a true story on this. Uh, way back earlier in my career, almost 20 years, certainly more than 15 years ago, very early on in my career, one of the jobs that I took was as my job title, it sounds better than it was, but my job title was user experience architect. And I did not work in the engineering department. I actually reported directly to the product manager for a software company. And my job was to proto design and prototype out and do user testing of interfaces and ways to interface in our enterprise software and then hand those designs and those prototypes and the tests off to the engineering department who then implemented it and then I had to work with QA to make sure that they did it right, that they implemented what we had designed and tested with, right? So that was my job. So I didn't report to the engineering director but I worked closely with them to make sure that they implemented it. Here's how, that's how in theory it worked. Here's how in practice it worked. Nine times out of ten, they took my code and just dropped it into production. So I knew that I did need to be careful because they were more likely to just, we're all lazy as engineers, right? Lazy as engineers. If it looks good enough, just drop it in. Why re-implement it, right? So I knew that there was a bit of an additional responsibility that I had to make sure I didn't just hand off really terrible code. Well, we had this feature that they wanted me to design, and it was effectively a multi-column sorting kind of a thing on this particular data table. And so I wrote up some quick code for it that was uh, n squared. It was polynomial. I don't think it was exponential. It was polynomial in its theoretical growth to do this like multi-column sorting thing. It was very quick and dirty code. And I put, it was maybe like, I, I feel like it was maybe about 10 or 15 lines of my code. And I probably wrote double that in code comments, in all capital characters, saying this code should absolutely, positively never go to production. This is the prototype. And it's being tested on a data set that is a max of 15 elements. But we don't know what our customers are going to do with this, and our customers could have thousands or tens of thousands, right? I put all this out in the code comments. I told my boss, I was like, I don't have time to go write the correct version of this. We need to ship this feature. But this is our prototyping that we've user experience tested, and it works well in the small, but if they just took my code and shipped it, that would be bad. You probably can tell where this story is going. Because there was a lot of pressure to ship this out, whatever engineer it was, I don't even know who it was, but whatever engineer it was, just took my code, took out all those code comments, and dropped it right into production. And I told the QA department, use a larger data set. Make sure that even with a larger data set than 15 that I had available to me, fake some data, do something, but test it with a larger data set to make sure that the engineers have accounted for the performance of this. If somebody clicks on this thing, that it's not just going to hang or die or whatever. It was kind of an important screen that we were adding. So guess how many test elements the QA department used? Three. The exact same number as I did. They used the 15 data set. I told them use hundreds or a thousand or something just so that you'll spot it if there's a performance problem. Use something bigger. Everybody along the line after I had handed it off thought, oh, I can't imagine a customer ever having more than 15 elements in this table. They'll never have more than 15. So they just used 15 because they thought it was fixed at 15. High profile feature, we did a press release, we launched it with our biggest client. 
crashes while the CEO is doing a demo to his wife and other shareholders. Totally crashes. And guess who got blamed? Even though I said over and over and over again, this code is not ready to go to production. I'm not the engineer. They still shipped that code because it turns out that that customer had 10,000 records in that table. And he was like, look how cool this is. When I go to sort this, it's just going to sort real quick. And it probably would have taken 30 minutes to sort it if I'm doing the math correctly. OK? So this stuff does matter. It absolutely matters. I got the blame, even though I had tried as much CYA as I could possibly <laughs> muster. I got the blame because I didn't make sure that QA had done a large enough test data set. So anyway, this stuff matters. All right. Actually, let's keep going in our slideshow. Our next thing that we need to implement, we're almost to option one. <laughs> option one was, can we get all three of these things to implemented? Take a tech break. First. Okay. Oh, you yeah, want a we, break? Yeah, and it's. We have a. We're. I mean, we have to be done in 15 minutes or less anyway. I was oh. hoping to be able to get through the acyclic paths before we finished. How long is that going to take? I'm hoping 15 minutes or less. Yes, if there were more than 10 buttons, that would grow even worse. OK, we're going to push forward. We want to get ourselves to the option one solution. The last thing that we need to be able to do is list out all of the acyclic paths. This is going to be a little conceptually easier to look at. It's going to take a little bit more code, but hopefully it won't be too confusing of a code. Hopefully we'll be able to explain it so it won't be too confusing. OK. So the acyclic paths, we're not counting. We actually want to keep track of the paths. So that's slightly more complex. We're not just being able to return numbers and add them together. We're going to have to be able to build up these partial paths and build them up further and further and figure out when we need to stop and also do our backtracking and stuff. So there's a little bit more juggling to do. But this is basically what an acyclic path might look like. Starting from digit 1, you might go over to 6, and then 6 down to 0, the orange arrow, and then 0 up to 4, the green arrow. 4 over to 3, the red arrow, 3 down to 8, the pink arrow. Once we get to 8, can you see that we have to stop? Because we can't go anywhere else that we haven't already been. We can't go to 1 because we've already been there. We can't go to 3 because we've already been there. So that path, how many is that? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's the longest of that acyclic path. It's only 5. Other choices that we might have made along the way might have made a longer or shorter path. All we want to do is, for any given starting digit, list out all of the acyclic paths that we could have possibly taken. Make sense? We are still going to use recursion to do so. But it's going to be, as I said, slightly more to juggle. All right, so now we're going to be implementing the list acyclic paths function. All right, so the good news is that this function that we're going to write, it's going to look pretty simple, but it's going to call another function where more of the complexity will be. What we need to do here is have an array of paths. So that's not a counter again. That's going to be an array of paths. Paths are simply going to be an array of numbers like 8, 3, 4, 2, whatever the number would be, right? So we're just going to push into the paths however many acyclic paths we find for a given starting digit. And it's different. We'll see that there's an asymmetry here. There's some symmetry, but not all digits have the same number of paths and the same length of paths. So there's some really interesting geometry going on that I'm still kind of like fascinated by. OK, for any given starting digit, we know that we can take, we can get the next hops that we can take, I'll call it. We can get that from the nearby keys of that starting digit. Same thing we did before, right? Could call the function. I think that's the way it is in the Git repo. 
I'm just going to go ahead and access the array because why call the function? For each of those, we're going to say for, e for let next hop of next hops, for each of those hops that we're going to take, we need to basically create kind of a subpath. You with me? So we're going to say this path has the starting digit at the beginning of the path, and it has the next hop in that next position. So if that iterates three times, we're going to create three separate subpaths, both of all three of them rooted with the starting digit, but each of them having a different next hop in the next position. Does that make sense? Here is where we hand wave and pretend as if this is as easy as it is, which it isn't. We're going to call this function that magically doesn't yet exist, but we're going to write that just magically follows all of those paths and fills in our paths array. Yay. And then we just simply return paths. So it's kind of like if you're watching one of those TV shows and the chef you know, it's one of those cooking TV shows, and the chef just kind of says, hey, we stick it in the oven, and then two seconds later, they pull it out, and it's a fully baked cake or whatever. You know, I'm just hand-waving here. There's a follow path function that does all this work. It's not as bad as I'm making it seem, but in the past, when I've taught this workshop, more of the questions come from follow path, so I'm just preparing you. It's slightly more to juggle. So what does follow path take? It takes a path and the list of paths that we want to follow, that we want to mutate. Now, I'm deliberately making a choice here, which is that I'm going to pass in a reference to an array that I don't own, and I'm going to mutate that thing as I recurse down. And there are pros and cons to that. It is more efficient. It is also more likely to be the source of bugs when you start mutating stuff at a distance. Generally, you don't want to pass in an array and have some other function mutate it. You want to like return back a new array. But there would be a lot of subarrays that I'd be returning here. Creates a lot more memory and garbage collection waste. So I'm just going to take the more efficient route and mutate the paths. But be aware of it. Probably in production code, I'd be putting a little comment here saying, beware of the side effects. I am mutating at a distance. Because this is more likely where bugs are going to come from. All right. So. Follow path is going to do very, something very similar to the first step that list acyclic paths did. It needs to get the next hops. And the next hops that it needs are from, get this, we have that path that's passed in. Whatever the last element in the path is, in other words, wherever we currently are in the path, that's where we need to find out the next hops from there. So we're going to say path of path.length minus 1. So I know it's kind of like double nested references in here, array references or whatever. But we're saying path of path.length minus one, that's where we currently are, and we need to get the next hops from there. I'm going to keep track in a Boolean. There's other ways of doing this, but I like the Boolean approach. Forward, found, I'm going to start this out equal to false. Okay? This is a Boolean that's going to let me know if any of the subpaths that I considered actually worked. If I never found any other subpaths, then there's nothing else for me to do. If I did find any other subpaths, then I need to keep going. Make sense? So I'm just going to keep track of that Boolean. And actually, let's go ahead and write the if statement for that. If I did not find any further paths, what does that tell me? It tells me that that path is complete and therefore I can push it into the paths array. I am mutating that paths array with this path. I know that this path has nowhere else that it can go and therefore it is complete and I'll push it into the array. Does that part make sense? Give me thumbs up, thumbs down. How does that part feel? Okay. All right. Hopefully it's not as painful as I warned you that it might be. Hopefully this isn't feeling too bad. We're almost there. 
We need to look at all those next hops. So let's do the let next hop of next hops. There could be zero, two, or three of those for us to consult. We're just going to go through however many of them there are. And here's the key thing that this function needs. It's an if statement that says if the path that we've been on does not already include this next hop. That's how we make sure that we're not cycling back. I've got a subpath, a path that I'm building up, and I've got another place that I can jump, but I can't jump there if I've already been there. You follow that? Can't do this with a set. Why can't I do this with a set? Because order matters. I gotta just check to see if I have not yet gone there in this particular path, okay? If that is not true, then I still have a path forward. So I will say path forward found equals true. That way I don't go ahead and add that partial path to the list. We only want to add that partial path whenever there's nowhere else to go. You with me? And here's the last thing. Let's recursively follow that path on its way down. Oh, I'm sorry, we've got to define the next path. What does that next path look like? Next path is the current path plus next hop. And now let's follow that path and see where that gets us. I'm going to give a moment for you to catch up because I know that there's, we're juggling a few different things here. So. Is line 41 supposed to be a semicolon? <clears throat> line 41. It is. Thank you. So the strategy here is keep recursing down, keep following all of our different next hops, keep recursing down until such a time as none of the places that I can move are valid for me to move to, in which case I know that we're done recursing. So I set the path forward found, or I leave the path forward found to false. That ends up pushing it into our paths array, mutating our paths array, and not doing any recursion so that function call stack just stops. It doesn't keep going any further deeper. As a little bit of a side note, list acyclic paths probably could have been, we could have figured out a way to make that itself be the recursive function. But one of the things that you very quickly get comfortable with when you're doing recursion is that you often want to make another function be the recursive one because you might want a different signature for your recursive function than what you expose to the outside calling code, what you expose to the rest of the app. So there's a little technique here which is follow path is not exposed to the outside world. I don't want to give a function to the outside world where somebody's passing in an array and I'm mutating it. That's total chaos. I only expose the list acyclic paths as a nice clean encapsulation of that side effecty behavior. Meaning that from the beginning of list acyclic paths to the end of it, all of those side effects that are happening, those are all completely self-contained and they don't leak out to cause problems for the rest of the code. So it is very common that you will end up creating these side helper functions that are the recursive ones so that you have control over their signature, so that you have control over containing their side effects, etc. <coughs> if 
the last thing that we should do is test it. See if I made a mistake or if it works. Okay? Let's come back over to our Knights dialer and remember that this one is not concerned with however many hops I add in. If I add in 6 or 12, this one is only concerned with the starting digit, right? So if I click 4, here are the distinct acyclic paths that you can get to starting from 4. You've got 4, 3, 8, 1, 6, 7, 2, 9. You've got 4, 3, 8, 1, 6, but instead of going to 7, you went to 0, and then that was it because you couldn't go any further. 4, 9, 2, 7, 6, 1, 8, 3. That was it. No further to go. And these ones stopped a little early. So you can see here that we've got two of them that are visiting eight of the numbers. So they didn't quite get all of the numbers. But then we've got four of them that visited only six of the numbers, so they stopped kind of short. That's what happens when we click four. Would you expect a similar symmetry if I clicked six? Just by the geometry of the board, if I click six, we kind of expect, and indeed we get two eights and four sixes in terms of path length, right? What about if I click one? We're expecting something different probably, right? Let's see what we get when we click one. Ah, we've got two paths that are able to visit all nine of the numbers. We've got one path that it can only visit eight of the numbers, two of them at seven and one of them at six. So if that's the outcome from one, what do I expect from three? Do I expect something similar. somewhat similar? Mm -hmm. And in fact, we see the same shape there. Now, what about seven and nine? Do we expect the same outcome from 7 and 9 that we got from 1 and 3? The same shape, I mean, like the same, not the exact same paths, obviously, but the same shape. Let's try it. Let's see what 7 gives us. Well, we still got two 9s, an 8, two 7s, and a 6. We ended up enumerating them in different orders, but I think you might say that we still visited the same kind of number, we still had the same magnitude of paths that we had available to us from seven. Same thing with nine. We had four, oops, we had four and six gave us the same. What about two and eight? Those are giving us different ones. Let's look at two. We had quite a few more paths from two. All of them, or most all of them, were of length uh, eight. We had none of length 9, but we had quite a few different paths of length 8, a couple of length 6. Let's see what 8 does. Does it give us something similar? No, it gives us, I guess it basically gives us the same shape, but in slightly different orders here. There's one last key on the board, which is the 0 key. Does anybody have a prediction based upon the geometry that we see? Do you think that we will see more and or longer paths when we start from zero, or do you think we will see shorter paths if we start from zero? Any predictions? And you can put them in the chat too if you're listening. It's less and shorter. <laughs> Some of you have already clicked the zero, so you already know the answer. But If you start from zero, are you expecting fewer paths or more paths, and are you expecting shorter paths or, more, or longer paths? I'll tell you how I thought about it before I ever ran this the first time. I thought, well, the zero is kind of isolated all down by itself, so I bet it's going to have shorter and fewer paths. That was my intuition. Fewer paths, but all of them are of length nine. That totally blew me away. I totally did not expect that starting from zero, no matter what path you take, you can visit all of the digits, other than five, of course. I blew me away when I ran that the first time. That's totally not what my intuition gave me. It starts out in the most, what we would kind of geometrically say is the most constrained position, and it ends up getting the most freedom around the board. It's kind of fascinating to me. How are we feeling about Knight's Dialer? I can see the energy drain on your faces, so I get it. We've, we've 
worked you enough for now. You need a bit of a break. We're going to pick up next time we're together, and we're going to optimize the code that we've been writing in a whole bunch of different ways. We're going to try out different algorithms, different data structures, lots of fun stuff for us to dig into. So we'll dig into that the next time we're together. All right. And with that, we are done. And then uh, you said tomorrow we're going to um, go from 9.40 to 2.30. It's my goal that we'll be done by 2. We'll see how we bleed over, but it'd be my goal like 1.30 or 2 would be the target end time tomorrow. Okie dokie. We'll see. Well, thanks all for Make sure you're us. prompt tomorrow morning so that we can get started <laughs> and uh, get it all in. This, these stuff are senior level questions. screaming in a circle to start off the workshop day two. Okay. All right, we're good. All right, so let's pick back up with our Knight's Dialer solution. When we were together last time, we completed actually both option one and option two. You recall that I kind of jumped ahead a little bit with factoring out that long function for the nearby paths calculation. That's actually option two. So you've already done option one and option two. So for what we're going to talk about from here forward, starting with option two as your base branch. If you've got the repo checked out, you can start with option two. And we'll be working on option three. You also recall that we uh, were able to uh, test a little bit, that we sort of saw the performance benchmarking of the growth of the time. And we saw that it was literally growing just a little bit more than double. Every time we added one more hop, it's growing a little bit more than double. And that fit very perfectly with our theoretical analysis that there was 2.222 um, paths on average that you could go to from any one of the digits. And so that fit nicely. And it doesn't always happen that the theory and the practice, the, the performance benchmarking match up. But it's kind of nice when you can see a really clear illustration of that principle. Well, obviously, that's impractical. We can't roll out to production something that's going to be working in an exponential or even greater than exponential sort of way. So let's talk about some ways that we can optimize our solution. The first we want to look at is we want to observe that there are quite a few things that we are doing work over and over and over again. We're repeating work when as I've said multiple times in this course so far, the key thing is that once you do some work, don't keep redoing that work. Find some way to remember or take advantage of that work because that's the biggest drain on your performance is when your solution causes more work to be done just because it didn't remember the work that it did or it didn't take care of a piece of information that it could have saved, it just didn't save it. So let's look at this diagram. This, you recall this was kind of our recursive diagram. And the tree itself doesn't exist. It's a conceptual tree, but it represents the call stack tree, if you will. And so in this call stack tree, we see that there are actually quite a bit of repetition. For example, you'll notice that the F44, that's the count paths 44, you'll notice that there are multiple other places in the tree where we get to F44. So we've done that work over there on the left, and then we come around to F44, and we redo all of that work. We remake all of those calls 
down that part of the tree. And in fact, that's not the only place. Even in just this small little diagram, we also see all of these are being repeated in a different part of the tree. So all of that work is unnecessary. And there's the technique for remembering the work that we do, and that technique is called memoization. Now, I don't know exactly, I've, I've read various different histories of where this word comes from. It's a little bit of an unusually sounding or spelled word. I don't know where it comes from, but I will tell you how I remember it. Okay, this is my little mnemonic or something. This is how I remember it. Because memoization is about like remembering. It's about like memorizing things. So the way I remember it is it's like the word memorization, but they forgot the R. I don't know, that just helps me a little. Maybe it's too early in the morning for those puns. But anyway, that's how I remember memoization, memorization without the R. So this might sound like this is a somewhat more complex technique, but it, again, it will feel potentially a little anticlimactic in terms of how much code we have to write. It's a very small amount of code change to our current existing option two solution to retrofit it to be able to be memoized. Now, I do want to point out that memoization is not the magic hammer, the Thor's hammer that can just do anything, right? It's not what you want to bang every problem with. And so there are several caveats that we want to be aware of. When we implement this, it will feel like this magical thing that we should just do all the time everywhere. But do keep in mind that there are only specific cir circumstances where we should employ this technique. Let's switch back over to our code editor. We're in dialer, and what we want to do is memoize the count paths function. So what does that mean? What that means is that we want to take that function and cause it to cache the result, the output, the return value from it for any unique set of input. In other words, take the pairing of inputs here. We have two integer inputs, the starting digit and the hot count here on line 27. Take these two inputs and treat them as if they're a key in a cache. And then by keying against that hash, if we ever call the same function with exactly the same inputs, return exactly the same output without recomputing. Just remember the, the re compute it the first time, remember that value, and return it. So this is actually a quite common technique it's much more common, you see it much more commonly in functional programming, but the principle here it requires something that may not be super obvious to you at first. It requires that this function be what we call pure. Again, another term from functional programming. Meaning that the function cannot have any side effects and it can't rely upon any external state. It has to take all of its input and do the only output through its return value. If it were relying upon the DOM or if it were relying upon something outside of itself, it's not a pure function and memoization is actually a very dangerous technique because you will get bugs and you know, mistaken problems. We have a question. Yeah, I, sorry to take you out of the flow here. Sorry. Some of these, uh, or some of the people on the live stream said that they had to leave at the end of yesterday so they weren't familiar where we are with the current problem or what the problem is. I don't know if you can just quickly restate it to okay like we don't have to keep this in the course but just for the sake of the live participants. so they didn't get any of the night styler is um, that what they're saying i can go back and dream, reintroduce night styler get, if that's what's being asked yeah uh yeah so they can go back to the video. We, we did post the videos from la the live streams, so that's it's up to you, Kyle. I'm, I'm, I'm only trying to clarify what yeah. they need. Do so they need a recap of the problem the, the or problem. the option that we're at? I think the problem. The problem, okay. I don't mind going back. Okay. So we'll just take this out of the yeah, course. Yeah, the final recording okay. won't be. So the exercise that we're working on now is the Knight's Dialer. And this is actually a classic problem that has been presented on many, many job interviews at some of the big companies, the FANG companies. In fact, I learned about it from a blog post series that is linked in the Project Readme. An Amazon interviewer talked about how they used to use it as part of their interview. I don't think they use it anymore, but it's probably still floating around at a lot of other companies because things tend to flow from FANG down to other uh, other types of companies. So the premise of Knight's Dialer 
is that we start with a dial pad. This is the old school dial pad. Like there used to be phones with push buttons on them that you actually pushed in. So you see the digits here and on this particular dial pad, if we imagine conceptually it as a board, somewhat like the chessboard that we did in the other exercise, we imagine that a knight might be able to move around this board in the same way that it would move around a chessboard. And a knight, if you're not familiar in chess, a knight moves in sort of an L shape, one over and two down, or two over and one down. So if we were to look at starting from position one, we could go either to digit six or to digit eight. And if we were on digit six, we could either go back to one, we could go down to seven, or we could go to zero, so on and so forth. So the statement of this problem, there are three parts to it. The first part of the problem was how do we determine what are our nearby digits? In other words, what are the digits that I'm allowed to jump to from any digit? And we did a brute force approach to that. And then we came back and realized there's no reason to brute force that. That's just fixed known data. So our data structure is the fixed set of those nearby keys for any digit. Then our second part that we did, which is what we're going to be working on optimizing here, but our second thing was, how do I count how many possible paths I can take if I start from a digit, I take a certain number of hops, and I'm allowed to go back. I'm allowed to do backtracking and create cycles and things. What's the total number of possible different distinct paths that I could take? And then the third piece of this problem, which is not part of the traditional job interviewing, but I extended for our purposes, was in addition to being able to take cyclic paths with backtracking, it's also, I think, interesting to examine how many paths and of what length can I take where I don't do allow any repeats of the digits. So there's an acyclic path. from There's multiple acyclic paths from each starting digit, and only some of the digits can be reached depending on what choices you make in the path. So those are the three problems that we've been working on. Option one, we implemented a full solution to each of those three parts. Option two, which we kind of did a little bit <laughs> in the middle of option one, but option two was to factor out the implementation of the nearby keys so that we could just fix that data as a data structure. And now what we're about to jump to is using memoization to optimize the recursion that the count paths function is using. Is that a good summary, Mark? Yep, thank you. Okay. So what we need to do is essentially adapt or wrap the count paths function. We're going to use a utility that we're going to define called memoize to do that. So I'm going to go down here to the bottom of the file. That's just where I want to put it. You can put it wherever you'd like. But I'm going to write a function called memoize. And it takes in the function that we want to do this adapting to, which will be the count paths function. We will pass the count paths function in. It takes that in. It needs to create a cache, remember. I said that we want a cache to remember the uh, outputs from it. So we'll just use a plain old simple object for this cache. We'll talk about a variety of little caveats that exist with generalized memoization. All right, so we need to produce a new function. Remember, we're wrapping, we're, create, we're adapting. So we're going to create and return a new function, which I'll just call memoized. You could call it really whatever you wanted. The signature of the new function needs to be the same as the original function. And we're going to take advantage of the fact that we know exactly what that signature is. In other words, we're going to avoid trying to do any sort of general, I can memoize any function. That's not our goal here. We only want to memoize this specific function. In fact, we could have named it like memoize count path or something. We only want to do the work for the, the minimal work that we know is necessary. If you were trying to write a general utility for this, you would have to handle any kind of inputs of any data types. They could be objects, they could be arrays, and constructing a key for any arbitrary number of and type of value inputs can get quite complicated. And that's why, generally, you would not implement your own general memoization utility. But in specific cases where you know I only need it for this function, I fully recommend and think it's actually better performance for you to use a purpose-built memoization just for that function or just for that purpose. 
So that's what we're going to do here. This is significantly more complicated when you want to do it in the general sense. And in those cases, you should just use a utility from a library like Lodash or Remdo or something like that. They all provide these memoized utilities. So memoized needs to take in, I think that I called them up here in count paths. What did I call them? Uh, starting digit and hop count. I'm, I'm going to shorten that. I'm just going to call it start and length. But they're both going to be integers that are being passed in, so it's the same signature. And the fundamental job of a memoized function is to check to make sure that the thing we're asking for, that is the inputs, that those have not been seen before, that they're not in the cache. If they're not in the cache, we need to do the underlying work. So we're going to just say, if the cache does not have, and we need a key, and this is kind of stylistic choice here, but I'm just going to take the two integers and concatenate them into a string with a colon between them. You could do anything, right? Like you could, well, you wouldn't want to do math on the numbers unless you came up with a, a mathematic equation like exponentiation that gave you un a unique number. You do want these keys to be unique, but it really doesn't actually matter how you choose this key as long as you make sure that each input set is going to be unique. You don't want any collisions where you're accidentally overriding or returning the wrong value. Okay, so we're going to take the start and then a colon and then the length into that if statement. And we will actually do the work. So we'll set it. I'll just actually, I'm just going to copy this because I don't want to retype it. We're actually going to set that value into the cache by calling the function and then simply return it. Now to adapt our count paths function with memoize, which is a fairly straightforward task, there's a couple of different ways that you might choose to do it, and some people kind of bristle a little bit at how I like to do it, but I literally just like to overwrite the count paths function with its memoized version, because there's no case where I ever want both versions in my program at the same time. So I will just take count paths and reassign it, and we can do that because it was a function declaration. You can't do it if you assign with const or something. I will just reassign the result of passing it into memoized. And that's it for the code changes that we made. I, I promised you that it was a bit anticlimactic to make the code changes. That's it for the code changes. If we go back to our slides, what we can see then is that the things that we were uh, eliminating, those are just calls that don't even need to get made. And the bigger and bigger the tree it is, the less and less of the tree actually even exists because we just skip the call and pull it out from the cache. So conceptually, you should be able to infer from this that it's going to create quite a significant amount of savings. But I think it's going to surprise you just how much the savings is when we run the code. And that's where memoization sometimes starts to feel kind of magical. So let's switch over to the web page. You might recall from before that we were starting from digit four and we were doing things around the 20, 20 to 25 hop count. And we were starting to see that it really start to add up. So I'm going to redo that. And you can kind of uh, remember the timings that we had before and compare. So we're going to do 20 hop count from four. And it was one millisecond. And then we're going to go up to 21. And it was. 0.3 milliseconds, and then we're going to go up to 22, and it's getting even shorter and shorter because it's remembering all of that work that it's doing. And each time we add a new hop count, there's only a couple of extra functions that need to be called, and all the rest of that is now in our cache. So I could go up to huge, huge numbers that would have taken hours or days to compute in the previous one, and they run in fractions of a millisecond. In fact, 
I've run this up with very large numbers, and I'm sure some of you are like starting to do this. That 500 number, which is a number that's so big that it's over, overflowing JavaScript's number type, it still only took 6.3 milliseconds to do all of those function calls. Because most of that work didn't need to be done. We were just sort of naively redoing the work over and over. And by analyzing, oh, I'm doing this recursion and a lot of backtracking and a lot of revisiting of the same kinds of work, that's what clues us in, hey, maybe I ought to memoize this utility and significantly improve the outcome. So you might think, well, OK, then we're done, right? If I've memoized my recursion, I should just memoize everything, and I don't need to worry about all of my performance issues. We need to be very careful about some of the caveats around memoization. The first big caveat is that, yes, <clears throat> we are indeed you know, saving a whole bunch of calls. But if we were to be doing some memory profiling, anybody care to guess how many thousands or millions of entries our cache now has? Because think about all of the unique different combinations of starting digit and hop count that we've put into there. Uh, you know, it's, it's going to be a really, really large number. And so what we are doing is we're trading the memory usage to get a faster performance. And that's one of the classic trade-offs that we sometimes have to make. We sometimes say, I need it to run faster, so I'm just going to have to give up some more memory. The helicopter is really close right now. <laughs> that's why I'm pausing. trying to give you as many edit cut breaks as you possibly might need. Have you asked in the chat how loud is it for people in the chat? Can they hear it? Not too bad. this lesson. Oh, we need, we'll be here all day. <laughs> I think you'd pick a much quieter helicopter if you were trying to raid. <laughs> I think that one is deliberately putting out noise, like Teslas do or whatever. It's got speakers on it. Yeah. We're going to push through despite the helicopter being right outside the window. Just down 
the street. <laughs> There's a question from chat. Are we able to look into some of the memory profiling? That's not something I'm going to do okay. here in the course. It's far too complicated to get into the developer tool stuff. And you all, you have a great course on developer tool yeah. stuff. Tell them to go watch and that. Maximiliano is going to come and do an advanced is he one? performance Good. course. So. Let's, let's get going. So because we're using so much memory when we're caching, we need to be careful about how a memoized function is going to be used. And we need to think about what types of inputs are going to come in. For example, if you had a function that was taking in the XY coordinates of somebody's mouse cursor as they moved it around, think about how many unique different types of inputs are going to be coming into that. That's going to create a lot of cache. And think about how relatively low percentage there is of reuse. Meaning, yeah, we're creating all these cache entries, but it's very unlikely that we're hitting hardly any of those cache entries. In other words, most of the inputs are unique and novel and the first time that the function's ever seen them. So the profile that you want to look for is a function that's a, it's a rather small constrained set of inputs that you expect to come in and you expect for those inputs to be repeated a lot. That's when memoization is actually a really good technique. But I often hear people say, well, if memoization is so magical and awesome, why didn't JavaScript just memoize every function by default? And the reason why <laughs> is because we don't want to just have runaway memory and terrible performance in a different way. So in those places where it's helpful, this is a great tool to pull out of your tool belt, but be careful to analyze which types of functions you're using a technique like that on. All right, so that is our option three solution. Now, we're going to switch gears for our fourth and final solution to the Knight Styler. And I'm going to forewarn you that as we dive into the next several slides, it is going to be a fair bit more complicated to wrap your brains around. So just preparing you right now, if you need to refill the coffee cup, make sure you're ready to dive into this. It is one of, I think, one of the most mind-bending aspects in all of DSA. If you've been able to follow along at least partially with recursion, it's gonna take that to a whole nother level in, in a somewhat ironic sense by not doing any recursion at all. We're going to be able to calculate all the same things that we were just calculating, the count and all of that, but we're not going to use any recursion at all. And it's going to run significantly faster than the memoized version of recursion. And it's not going to use any memory. So it's like the unicorn solution that's both less memory usage and significantly faster, and you're wondering, what is this sorcery? How are we going to do it? This technique is referred to in the general t terms as dynamic programming. The good news is you've actually already learned one form of dynamic programming, which is top-down dynamic programming, otherwise known as memoization. But there's another form of dynamic programming, which is what usually people mean when they use this phrase, and it's called bottom-up dynamic programming. So we're going to go in reverse, in, a, in essence. That's what you, the, the idea that you should have in your mind from that. And there's another term for that. This is re referred to generally as tabulation. Tabulation should imply to you that most of the time when you're going to employ this technique, it's when you are counting things, when you are tabulating things. So it might not be as useful of a technique for example, to calculate the acyclic paths where we weren't counting anything, we were just enumerating all the possible different paths, you probably wouldn't necessarily want to apply this technique in that case. Tabulation is something that should evoke that idea that I want to count things, I want to find out how many things are doing. Another example might be if you were trying to come up with a, a bottom-up tabulation. Remember, I, one of the warm-up problems I posed to you was the, uh, calculating the size of the largest island. Well, that is counting because we're counting the units of the size. As a side note, I don't think that that problem can actually be done with tabulation because there's another characteristic here, which is that 
you have to be able to define an ordering for the tabulation to occur for this technique to work. And I know that may not make much sense, but you have to be able to go in a deterministic order through your data to be able to get a tabulation solution. And with the islands size problem, if you start from the top left of your grid and you work yourself you know, downward and rightward through your grid, that might seem like a deterministic order to go through that, but unfortunately you would miss parts of the island that might have curved back around and you hadn't seen yet. So you would have to go in multiple directions and you can't really go in multiple directions at the same time, or at least I haven't been able to figure out how to do so. So I'm not convinced that all problems that are counting can be done that way, but there are some that can. And this is one of them. So we're gonna learn this technique. So this slide I originally used as a way to help folks get some sort of mental picture of what's going on. It's somewhat misleading, but it's metaphoric. So I, I want you to not try to take too much or infer too much from this. If we look at the tree and we think about a tree in a physical sense as having leaves, and if we went up to the tree and we just shook it, and I'm talking about like in the fall time when leaves are about to fall, and we just shook the tree and all of the leaves on the end of the branches just started falling down. And if we had laid out 10 buckets underneath this tree, conceptually or metaphorically, we can think of all of those leaves as falling into one of those buckets. Now here's why this is not actually an accurate way of thinking about tabulation, because you don't need just one tree, you actually need all 10 trees. So if all 10 trees were in the exact same spot and we shook all of them at the same time and all of their leaves fell into one of these 10 buckets, we could then go through the bucket for bucket four and count how many leaves landed in the bucket four and it turns out there would be exactly 168 leaves in that bucket, which is the number that we're looking for. Remember in our running example, the four six, the answer is 168. If we took all 10 trees and we shook all their leaves off and they could fall in only one of these 10 buckets, it turns out that not accidentally, quite on purpose, there would be exactly 168 leaves in the bucket number four. So let's set the metaphor aside because it's a little bit strained, a little bit hard to imagine shaking a tree like that. And let's try to think about it. Let's try to infer what we mean by this top down versus bottom up. Top down, which is what we've done before, is starting from the top of the problem. That is the, the statement of the problem, which in this case is four six. And we are working from four six down to three five and down to four four. We're working down the tree, if you will, from the top of the tree down to the leaves. So you could think about bottom up as what if we knew where all the leaves were without having constructed the tree and worked in the opposite direction? What if we didn't need to recurse through the tree? What if we could just infer or understand exactly where all the leaves possibly were and then just count all of them, run through our way up and keep track of how many leaves we see as we go up and then we would have our final answer at the end. What's interesting about this is that that process actually is completely independent of the starting digit that we end up at. In other words, we basically do the count for all possible digits all at the same time, and then at the end we just say, okay, the only one that I actually care about was four. So I'm gonna do the count for all 10 of the digits, Five, of course, is always going to be zero, but I'm going to do the count for all five, 10 of the digits, and then at the end, simply select which bucket I want to count, which bucket I want to look at. So let's try to develop some intuition for that. If we started at four and we were doing the top-down approach, we would branch out. Remember, that's how we did it. We would say, I, I, I could go from four to three. I could go from four, that arrow's a little off, but I could go four to nine and four to zero. I could branch my way outward, right? Well, what if we could go in the reverse direction? What if we could ask, if I wanted to, to determine all of the possible paths, we've been thinking about these paths as directed arrows. But if you think about this logically, it doesn't matter which direction you went in the path. You could start at the end of any one of those paths and work your way backward and get the exact same path. 
So it's not actually a directed thing. It's simply an undirected traversal of a graph. And by that, what that means is that we could actually start from each of the digits and ask not where could I go from four, but get this, what if we asked where could I go to get to four? If I got to four, where could I have been? I could have been at three, I could have been at nine, or I could have been at zero. So we're actually asking the reverse question, which is the best way that I can help you to understand this notion of going from moving from the top-down model to the bottom-up model. We're asking the reverse question. I'm not going to start from four and go six count, six hops. I'm going to say, from all of the various places that I could have been, where could I, how many paths would have ended at digit four after having made six hops? Because that number is exactly equal to the other number, which is 168. So we're actually solving a different problem. It's kind of like when we talked about the whole bounding box thing and we said, what's, you know, do my two bounding boxes overlap? Has there been a collision? And it turns out that it was much easier to ask the question, do they not overlap? This is very similar. It's much easier to calculate and to compute the other direction than it is to recurse down. And that's, it's still kind of mind bending and, and difficult, even for me, and I've been doing this for years, it's still difficult. And each time I come up with a new problem, it's a little bit more difficult. It's still difficult for me to try to prove to myself that it either can or cannot be done with tabulation. This is one of those deeper areas that takes a lot of practice. So I'm not suggesting that you can just master this at the first time you try it. But I'm going to walk you through how to derive a solution to this problem, and hopefully some of those principles will stick with you so that you can try it on other problems. So if we were asking where could I, what digits could I have been at when I arrived at four, we then could ask, what digits could I have been at that I arrived at three? And then what digits could I have arrived at eight? And so on. So we're just going to work our way back up the tree. So this is the bottom-up tabulation. All right, so let's visualize it this way. And these slides, these next several slides, are designed specifically to help you visually see what kind of code algorithm we're going to write. So we've moved from the metaphorical or the theoretical into I'm now trying to help you set up, OK, that sounds cool in theory, but I have no idea how to code that. I'm going to show you that it's actually pretty straightforward to write code for this idea. We know that there are only 10 digits, so there are only 10 buckets. And if we could compute all of the possible six count paths for each one of those numbers, as I've done here, then it's a trivial question to say, well, what if I started from four? What would that number be? It's 168. What if I started from two? What would that number be? It's 104. So we'd already know the, the answer to all 10 digits up front, and then it's just simply selecting that one. So how do we do that? How do we get those 10 buckets computed? What we're going to do is start out with the 10 buckets initialized to zero. That should be pretty self-explanatory. And I've notated below these 10 buckets the nearby keys. Because this represents, this is key to us, this represents the going backward along the path. Where could I have been to get to zero? I could have been at four or six. Where could I have been to get to one? I could have been at six or I could have been at eight. Okay? You'll notice above the set of buckets, I've got a series of ones. That's kind of like the metaphorical leaves that are falling into the bucket. But that, that is going to be our temporary count set. And that's where our, our counts are going to grow. Okay? So what we're going to do as we set this up is we're going to go through all of the digits. So we're going to basically have a loop that goes one, 0 to 9, all 10 digits. For each of those digits, we're going to go through their nearby keys. So on average, we're going to go to 2.22 other places. A total of 20, if you count it out. There's a total of 20 possible places that we're going to visit. So we've got 10 basically times the 2.22 on average. We're going to end up going to two, 20 other places. And we're going to ask, what is your count? And add that into our count. So we're basically saying, for the 0, to figure out that count, we're going to say, where could I have been? I could have been at 4 or 6. What were the counts that 4 or 6 could have had at this moment? Well, they just start out at 1. Remember, we defined the base condition as 
If you don't move anywhere, if your hop count is zero, you're just on the digit and that's one. So we're gonna grab those two ones, add them together, and that becomes two. And then we're gonna move on to the next digit. The next digit is one, and it could have been at six and eight, so we'll go grab those two ones and add them together. And then we'll do the next thing for each of these, and you'll notice that many of them end up as two, a, few of, a couple of them end up as three, the five one, again, always going to be zero. We could skip over doing the five work, but it just, it's a nice clean, so you don't have to like remember that we're skipping it over. So it'll just keep being a zero the whole time. So that's our first pass when we were at hop count of six. We've done one layer of the tree, if you will. We've got to go up to the next layer of the tree. So what we're going to do is take the current counts and slide those up and start again with zero in the bucket. It's almost like we've got another set of buckets that we keep pulling from and adding into. The, the metaphor starts to get really strained here, but I'm hoping that it's not too far, far afield for you. So we're going to repeat the same thing again. We're going to start back over at zero. We're on another iteration of the loop. Our hop count is down at five. We're on our second iteration, so our hop count's down at five. We're going to start at zero and say, where could I have been? I could have been at four and six. We're going to go grab those two counts and add them together. So that becomes six. And then we're going to do the same thing for the rest of those digits. Go and find all of the places that they could have been and add their previous counts together. And that's how many places. So at this moment, what this tells us is that if I were to start at zero and only make two hops, then I could have done six paths. You see that? Because the six is the number of all the places that I could have been and all the places that they could have been. All the places I could have been and all the places they could have been, we've already calculated that and that number is six and that's why that's in the zero slot. So we're just simply inferring that where I, how you could get to me is the same as how I could get to you. And that was the original question. We wanted to know how many places, how many ways could I get to you we're just asking the reverse question. How many ways could you have gotten to me? And by keeping track of all the counts as we go, we always know that number to add those two or three numbers together. So we'll do it again. We added two sixes together and got 12. We added two fives together and got 10 and so forth. Now we're on iteration four. Hop count is continuing to go down. We've added a 12 and, uh, I'm sorry, a we added a 12 and a four and six. A 16 and a 16 together, excuse me, to get the 32. We added a 10 and a 16 together to get the 26 and so on. So we just keep doing this, running through. It's the same loop, visiting the same neighbors over and over again, grabbing their previous count. Once we're done, sliding the counts up and doing it again. Once we're done, sliding the counts up. And this is the final time that we went through. We recalculated the 168. Now that our hop count goes down to zero, we don't need to do anything else but simply select the 168 answer there in position four. So think about the memory usage of this. We have one array of 10 numbers in it. And we have a second array that's kind of our temporary count, like we're remembering it for the next iteration and then throwing it away. So you could basically say we've got two arrays of 10 elements, right? And we have a for loop that goes through 10 iterations to count all, to get through all the numbers. And for each one of those, does an average of 2.22 other operations. So we basically have 20 operations to go through. The reason it's 20 is because when we get to five, there's nothing to do, right? So it's not actually 22. <clears throat> but we do 20 total operations times the number of hops. So count paths is an O of N that we can calculate as N times 20. And that works out to an O of N of N, which is referred to as linear. You might remember the big O graph that we talked about before. And there's only one other, you know, there's only a, a couple of others that are lower than linear. We have logarithmic and we have constant. Linear is well within the green zone. If you can write a linear algorithm for something, 
it's generally quite safe to, to put out into production because it's very unlikely that it will grow in such a way that the performance fails for you. So we now have constructed a linear solution to what was previously an exponential solution. We're getting the same answer. Oh, and by the way, there's a constant memory usage. It's O of 1 constant memory usage and O of n computation time. It's unlikely that you will run across very many algorithmic outcomes in your career where you end up in this unicorn scenario where you have perfect memory usage and linear computation time. That's almost as good as it gets. It just happens to be that this problem is well set up for that. What are some of the characteristics of this problem that do set it up for that? Well, there's a very small set of buckets. There's only 10 buckets, actually nine. There's a very small set of possible buckets. If the nature of your problem is that there could be millions and millions of different buckets, it's still going to run in linear time, but that's going to be a million n instead of 20 n. So there will be some performance penalty that you pay to do a million n versus 20 n, right? But it's still going to be a whole lot better than if you wrote the recursive version of it. The recursive version of it, even with the memoization, because yes, the memoization will give you back a much faster performance, but at the trade-off of a ton of memory usage. And here we get constant memory usage. So hopefully some of parts of that conceptual approach are not completely confusing to you. I know that it is a foreign concept. This is not how we typically solve problems. But discrete math tells us that those pat and, and, and graph theory and a lot of other different parts of math and computer science, they tell us that if we solve two equivalent problems and one is much easier to solve, then that one's the better one to take. And that's what we basically said is, I'd like to solve a different problem that gets me the same result and do a whole lot less work to do it. And that's what we end up with here. Let's try to switch over to our code and write the dynamic programming tabulation, bottom-up dynamic programming version of count pass. OK, here we are in the code editor. First things, we need to undo the work we did in option three. We're going to get rid of the memoization stuff. That was a cool trick, but for this particular problem, there was a much better option. If you try tabulation and that ends up not working, I think the next best one is often memoization. But again, you have to make sure you're using something uh, in the appropriate way. OK, so what are we going to do? To, uh, to do count pass. So basically, I'm going to delete what's currently in count pass. Actually, I guess I should have probably kept that first one because that base condition stays the same. The base condition is still, if we call count paths with a hop count of zero, the base condition is still, the only thing that you can do is stay on that digit. So that's a count of one. All right, remember in the slides, and if you want to have the slides up while I'm typing, sometimes that's a little more helpful for folks to kind of visually connect or have the slides on a, on a separate window side by side. But the first step that we wanted to do was have an array that was initialized to all ones. That was our prior path count. That basically represents calling each one of these functions with hop count zero. We're just going to go ahead and pre-fill a set of buckets with all those ones. So our trick in JavaScript for creating an array of 10 elements long with ones in it is to do array of 10 and then fill with the one value. So that's our little temporary prior path counts that we will replace each time as we go. We're going to set ourselves up a loop. 
This loop is the hop count. Remember, I told you we had an iteration count that was just decrementing hops. So we're going to do, I'm, I'm going to have it counting upward rather than counting downward, but only because it's a little bit more convenient to write the terminating condition. But it's basically the same thing. We're going to do our six iterations uh, because if we pass in hop count of six, we're going to do six iterations here. So hops equal to zero, hops less than hop count, and hops plus plus. That's our outer loop. And whatever our, out, whatever our loop ends up computing, the thing that we're going to return is whatever is in prior path counts at the position starting digit. We're taking advantage of the fact that our digits are zero based and our arrays are zero based. If your problem had a different set of values for the buckets, then you'd need to do a translation here. But in our case, it's quite convenient that the digits on the dial pad happen to be zero based just like our arrays are indexed. But that ends up selecting that bucket, for example, four would have 168 in it, and that's what we return. For each hop count, remember that we did a loop through all 10 digits. Oh, I'm sorry. The first thing that we did was set up a bucket of zeros. So that we'll call path counts with 10 buckets all filled with zeros. That's our actual buckets that we're going to be filling into. And then we will replace prior path counts with path counts when we slide it up. All right, now we need to set up a loop to go through all the 10 digits. It's pretty straightforward. Hopefully that makes sense. We need to go through the 10 digits, so we set up a plain old normal for loop to go through them. And what was the last thing that we did? For each digit, what did we do? We visited the other digits that we could have been at to get to that digit. So we need one more loop inside. I'll say n is the digit that of the nearby key of the digit that we're on. So if we are on digit 0, the nearby keys of digit will give us an array of 4 and 6. So we will go visit 4 and 6. And we will take into our current count at digit position, we will simply add in or append in the value that is in the prior path counts of n. So remember when we reached out to the other two and we grabbed their prior path counts and added them together and made our own bucket? So we're going through all these 10 buckets and grabbing in the two or the three from the other places, adding them together to create path count. And our last step in this algorithm is at the end of each hop iteration, so on the outside of the digits, we simply replace prior path counts with path counts. Should have been a plural there. I don't know why I keep misspelling counts today. Something's wrong with my brain. This is 11 lines of code, and the recursive implementation was six lines of code. So, yes, this is a little bit more code. But let's take a step back and realize that this is not hundreds of lines of complex code, is it? It's a set of for loops. And most of us have enough familiarity with programming and with JavaScript that we can manage to reason about for loops. The real key here is not the code that we could write. I mean, yes, that's a thing. We need to be able to translate what we've planned out into code. But I. I figured out on the slides what the algorithm was, and then I simply wrote a line of code for each slide. That's it. It's not like I had to like come up with some whole new theory or whole new algorithm. I just figured out on those slides, well, what would I need to do? I would need to 
do a loop for all of the hop counts. And then for each of those hop counts, I need to do a loop for all of the digits. And for each of those digits, a loop for all of the nearby keys that they could have been at. And that's it. So I just, I needed three loops and I needed two arrays. I wrote it out on the slides, just like you could write it out on a sheet of paper, coming up with a plan for how to solve it. The translation to code is almost the trivial part. And I know that we as engineers kind of feel like maybe it's the reverse. We kind of feel like, no, it, the really hard part is the writing of the code. The big takeaway that I hope you're getting from this workshop, and I keep repeating myself over and over, you've got to first think the problem before you can code the problem. If you can solve thinking the problem, the code's probably going to shake itself out pretty straightforwardly. I mean, that's not entirely true because, yes, there are complexities depending on our language, depending on the mechanisms that we use. Sometimes we do face these challenges. But the vast majority of the problem here is getting our brains to think about the problem correctly. We have to think algorithms before we can code algorithms. As I've said multiple times in this course, there's no way that anybody could expect you to now be an expert on bottom-up dynamic programming tabulation because you just simply saw one, one problem that one guy helped you write code for. That's, that's not sufficient. But hopefully there's enough from the way I've described it. Because when I was trying to learn this stuff, there was not a lot of great material out there. The only material I found was like, oh, if you want to like, compute you know, Fibonacci with tabulation or something. Like, there's these very toy problems, and the, the solutions end up looking very, very specific to the problem. And this one is a solution that's very, very specific to the problem. But there are pieces of this that I do see as generalizable. If I can think about a problem as having a very specific defined set of inputs, if I can figure out what those would be, then I can figure out how to count each of them in the reverse order that I would go through it when I was doing a recursive approach. So maybe the first step is to write the recursive version so that I have my brain in tune with what the order is. If I would do it recursively in this order, do the reverse order to do a bottom-up tabulation. Those are things that are generalizable principles and hopefully will help you attempt this technique the next time you're trying to write a recursive counting solution. Questions, I see questions. Having three nested loops here, is this acceptable in this scenario because the iterations do not grow much as n grows? The iterations don't grow any. <laughs> this is all fixed work. Look at the, look at the uh, values that are returning here. We have a fixed for loop of 10. That never changes, no matter how many hop counts there are. And we have this for loop, this inner for loop, is only looking at the nearby digits, which is based on the fixed geometry of the dial pad, which never changes. It's either 2 or 3 or 0 every single time. So these two inner loops don't grow at all, and this loop only grows at n. So that should tell you more than anything why this is a linear algorithm because the only thing that grows is the outer loop, and it only grows by n. There's nothing else com com complecting it. There's nothing else adding to it. It's not like one of these inner loops is then also bounded by n, so now it's an n squared or something like that. If we go back to the browser just to kind of get a sense of things, I'm going to refresh, and I'm going to go ahead and start us at 25. And I'm going to click the 4, and we're going to see that that was 0.2 milliseconds. And then I'm going to go up to 250, and that was 1.2 milliseconds. And then I'm going to go up to 2,500, and that was 13.1 milliseconds. Because it's doing almost no work. It's just simply running through. And if we go back to the slides, we'll be able to kind of reinforce what's actually happening here. An O of 6 does exactly 120 operations. And if you do an O of 60, it does exactly 1,200 operations. And if you do an O of 600, it does exactly 12,000 operations. I literally counted those. Like, 
I put a counter in. No matter how big n is, if you multiply n by 10, you just get a number of operations multiplied by 10, which proves to us that this is a perfect linear solution, exactly linear solution. Like I said, it's rare that we get to those unicorn solutions, but when we do, that's when you like turn the computer off and go get a beer and you're like, ha, I did it. I earned my pay for today. I thought about the problem and I figured out the better solution. Any other questions or comments about the Knight's dialer? Like if I had to do the Knight's dialer for production, would I do yeah, this? Yeah, I 100% I yeah. would write that code with a, with a bottom-up tabulation. My process is that my brain does not, for me, my brain does not naturally think about the problem in reverse the way the bottom-up tabulation requires you to think about it. So for me, I almost always have to solve the problem top-down recursively first knowing that it's likely not to be the performance solution. And then I have to decide, is there a way for me to do it in reverse? In other words, are the number of possible buckets for all those leaves to be in a fixed and small enough number, or is it practically infinite? If it's a fixed and small enough number, and if the problem is like a counting thing, or it's something that I can make act like counting, right? Can I make that work? Then I'll start trying to write the bottom-up tabulation. And if not, I'll apply a memoization and see. I'll look at my problem, but I'll apply a memoization to see if that solves my recursive problem. So that would be my general approach to this. I hope maybe someday I can just look at a problem and immediately know, ah, oh, that's a bottom-up tabulation. I'm not there yet. But I've at least generalized enough of this that I can see what parts of this do need to be present for this kind of solution to even be possible. Another question. Before we get to his, can we, can you re ask that question? I missed, I had the wrong mic up. Oh, no, you're good. Just re ask the question. You don't have to answer. I think I'm trying to think how to phrase this. Um, you, you, you said that they're comparing the top down to the bottom up. Would you do this in production? Okay. That was your question. Um, comparing the two, because the previous recursion one with the memoization was top down, and this is bottom up. If there was a case in production of a nice dialer, would this actually be what is put into use? Yeah, absolutely. If I was doing this in production, I would, for sure. A little bit more verbose. I have a problem with it. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. I comment uh, on the in interpreting this problem. One of the features, and this is quite rare, the problems you're handed, is you have a stable tree. Uh, your, your state tree is finite, uh, finite short, and it is a legitimate tree, so no cycles, no. Uh, and so as you expand, it expands to a fixed, an endpoint of a fixed width. That's your cue uh, when you can say, ah, oh, that fixed width fits nicely in a small box. That's the cue. This is a good. This could be a good strategy because that that the information, the, the function is self-organizing. Uh, in those cases, uh, so that's just a comment. But but I agree with you very much. It's not something that's going to jump out to you. Maybe. Right. Yeah, you do have to inspect the problem. You have to think about the problem. To put it in slightly different terms than what he just said, if you think about it as the recursive kind of fanning out, excuse me, if you think about it as the recursive fanning out, if there's a convergence into, and I keep using this term of buckets, but as he said, it's kind of a finite set even if that finite set is large, if it's finite, it can be done with this tabulation. But if, as you fan out into all possible solutions, you get to practically infinite, then this probably isn't the one that you, this probably isn't the algorithmic approach that's going to prove fruitful for you. So I probably wouldn't even try it. 
So let's take, for example, because this is a segue for the next exercise that we're going to dive into. If you were trying to, to think about all the possible words that you might be generating and, and uh, you know, uh, fanning out recursively and trying to generate a bunch of different English words, well, the English dictionary is 80, 100,000 words. That is a fixed, finite size. So if you were trying to count that, you could have, practically speaking, 100,000 buckets and do the counting of that. But if it was all possible combinations of characters that aren't constrained by they need to be valid words in the dictionary, that's practically an infinite set. And if you have a practically infinite set, that's not where this algorithm is going to work. So that's, I think, what he's saying is like, you have to be able to see that it's going to converge to something finite, not infinite. Yes, there's another question. What are the cons of tabulation? I mean, the, the big con to tabulation is the unfamiliarity. It's not what most people see other people writing. It's not what people pull out readily. And at least for me, is not the way my brain first thinks about the problem. Because if I look at the function 4, 6, my brain starts with, OK, if I'm going to recurse, I'm going to, I'm going to break down the problem into the hop count of 5 and the hop count of 4. It's the divide and conquer way of thinking. So if you've been trained to think that way, it's very hard to think in reverse. And once you get better at being able to think in reverse, that gets easier. But I'm not sure it ever gets to the point where that's the natural way that you think is to solve a problem in reverse. That's just one of those techniques that you pick up. So I, I would say that's the, the big downside to it. The you know, sort of secondary effect of that is whatever code you write to do that, somebody else can read that code, but they can't understand why that code solves the problem. Even if they know exact, I mean, most people are not going to have any trouble reading your three nested for loops. It's pretty straightforward code. It's not terribly declarative, but it's pretty straightforward code. Most people are not going to really struggle with understanding, oh, I've got, I see some for loops here. But they are strongly, like, they're likely to strongly struggle with seeing that code and understanding how that code solves the problem. So there's an additional burden for you to document, <laughs> perhaps even creating the slides like I did, document why that solution solves the problem. You have to remember that the code that we write is our communication to other humans, including our future selves. And the code in this particular solution is not doing a great job of explaining the why. It's doing a pretty good job of explaining the how. So there's an additional documentation burden to explain the why. All right, if there are no other questions, we'll uh, take a break and reset for our next exercise. Okay, progressing right along, we're going to turn our attention to a somewhat different kind of a problem. I alluded to this previously that we're going to turn our attention to words and um, we're going to talk about algorithmically solving problems around words. So this I call wordy unscrambler. I don't know if any of you have ever played games like Wordscapes or these other games where you have to like uh, you know, mix and match letters or, or, or reorder letters to spell different words. I used to play Wordscapes a whole bunch, and I, I think I got to like level 2000 or something in Wordscapes, and I was like, it's the same game. It's never getting harder or different or more interesting. So I gave up. But anyway, I used to play a lot of Wordscapes, and I also used to cheat at Wordscapes. There are websites out there where you can give it a set of letters that can make a word, and it'll tell you all the different words that you could make for that. And so occasionally I would get stuck on a puzzle and I would go and use one of those cheating websites for that. 
And that's what inspired me to, to make a problem because I wondered what would be the algorithmic approach to trying to do this unscrambling of letters into real dictionary words. So that's what we're going to be tackling is in Wordy Unscrambler. So let's think about this. Again, we'll, we'll, we're going to take this in little pieces. We're going to try to get a working solution, and then we're going to try to optimize it just like we've done before. This one is almost less about the algorithm and almost more about picking the right data structure because the choice of data structure is going to end up being the whole game here. So just as a forewarning in some of the other ones, it was really more about what algorithm is the right algorithm to pick. Here it's the right data structure. In general, both of those are really critical choices in any solution that you write. The data structure you pick and the algorithm that you use, they have to be well matched together and they both have to be well aligned to the problem. And we've learned that lesson somewhat painfully <laughs> over the last several exercises. So the same will be true here, but it's more heavily weighted on choosing the right data structure. And that is a difficult task because if you haven't seen a data structure, it's hard for you to even conceive of what data structure to look for. It's hard to know what to Google for. So really, at least part of this is just exposing you to a few other kinds of data structures that you maybe haven't worked with very much so that you have more words to use for your Google searches. All right, so let's say that we had the input letters P, C, E, R, and A. And yes, that set of letters is actually my, uh, my little pun because that's how old I am. I grew up in the PC era back before we had, you know, all these like laptops and stuff like that. I, I grew up where we like built desktop computers and put hard drives in them and I was working in MS-DOS 3.0. Like, so I go way, way back. So yes, that, there's a little bit of a pun there. But if we just started with those letters, P, C, E, R, and A, and we tried to come up with a list of the possible matching words, we would need a dictionary, a list of valid words to be able to match against. So if we started out with this dictionary and we said what, of, what words of this dictionary could be made by unscrambling, reordering some or all of these letters. So it's pretty straightforward that we could run through and see that the word can is not able to be made by those letters, but cap, cape, car, care, can. Sorry, my little my uh, check marks are misaligned here, but you can visually shift those check marks up. Um, that we've got can, cape, cape, cap, cape, car, care, and ear. Those are able to be made, but the other ones are not able to be made because there's a missing letter. There's a missing n in our input. That's why can. There's a missing. Uh, uh, L and there's a missing H. That's why those letters, those words can't be made. So if we started to try to formulate an algorithm for this, what is the first most important question that we, or one of the first most important questions that we want to tackle? What occurs to you as a question that we should ask about this problem? First one that occurs to me is how am I checking against words? Like, do I have a big word bank that I mm. can go into? And be what is my word list? What is my yeah. dictionary? And where am I going to get a dictionary? That's a very important question, right? Similar to, I don't know the periodic table elements by heart like my kids do, so how do I get a list of periodic table? Fortunately, that was simply a quick Google away, and I found a JSON file with a periodic table. I thought, surely I'll be able to Google good English words dot JSON and out would spit a nice, well formatted, great to use dictionary. That turns out to be completely not true. It turns out that it's much, much harder than I would have liked to get a dictionary because it turns out that that's not actually a very well defined concept. What is a dictionary word? Let me give you some examples. The word laser, L-A-S-E-R. Should that be a dictionary word or should that not be a dictionary word? That's a, actually a subjective question that I'm not, not everybody agrees on. Why? You might not know this, but laser is actually an acronym. And some people say that acronyms don't belong in a dictionary. And other people say, well, it's a commonly used word, so it belongs in the dictionary. 
There's a ton of subjectivity here. What about contractions like don't and can't? Should those show up in a dictionary? What about plurals and other conjugations of words like with ed or ing? Are those words that should be separately in a dictionary or should they just be apply or assumed from the conjugation of a word? There's tons of subjectivity here on what should or should not be a valid word. There's also offensive words and how we even define what is offensive is in hugely subjective. And I don't even want to wade into the waters of what makes something an offensive word or not an offensive word from all different angles, religious and cultural and so forth. So it turns out that it's not very easy to just Google and say, give me the list of dictionary words and then I can start writing my algorithm against. You'll notice in the project that I've provided for you that I provided you three different dictionaries. One is a, a very tiny dictionary that only has 80 words in it. One of them is a somewhat longer dictionary of about 2,400 somewhat common English words that I actually handpicked all 2,400 of those words. And then there is a really giant dictionary of 300,000 something words. And that is one that I just found somewhere and it has a ton of junk in it. It has all kinds of like acronyms and abbreviations. That's another one, abbreviations. Should abbreviations show up in a dictionary? Another subjective question. Um, so, uh, I provided you those three different JSON files because it's going to be useful for us in terms of our performance benchmarking to check against different sizes of dictionary. So, in our little application, we'll have a selector where you'll pick the tiny dictionary, the regular dictionary, or the very long dictionary, and we'll see different timings as a result. And importantly, the reason why that is in our app, why, why we're doing that, is because there are different performances that we actually need to concern ourselves with. That's not a monolithic idea like how fast things run because there's the startup performance and then there's the runtime performance. And we haven't really talked about that much, but there is a trade-off sometimes between doing more work up front, things take a little bit longer to start up, but then it runs faster as it goes. That's yet another trade-off axis that we have to be worried about. So when we load up a data structure with our dictionary words, it might be a really fast data structure to build, but it might be kind of slow to walk through, or it might be kind of a slower data structure to build, but really, really fast to walk through. So you can see the trade-offs, and we'll have timings in our app for the loading of the dictionary data structure and for the searching of the dictionary data structure. But let's start to uh, ask, oh, there's actually, before we go any further, there's actually one more critical question that we need to ask to clarify the behavior here. And I wonder if it occurs to anyone what that question should be. Yep. Not responding to what you were saying, but okay. uh, just a clarification. Can we use letters twice? That is the question. Oh. They got it. That's an important question here. What if I have a single P in my input characters? Am I allowed to do words that have two P's in it, like the word appear? Would we want to allow appear to match here because it's reusing the P and it's reusing the A? That's a question, and it turns out the answer is no, we don't want to allow that. <laughs> we do not want to allow the duplication of letters. Now, that's an, a choice that we're making. You might think it seems like it would be easier to allow the duplication. It's much harder to do this algorithm and to come up with a data structure that allows the repetition. So we're going to choose not to allow repetition of the inputs. If you want to have two Ps, then you have to put that in the input. But again, going back to the very beginning of the workshop, asking these kinds of clarifying questions radically changes the kinds of data structures and algorithms that we use to solve the problem. You don't want to ask that question after three or four weeks of implementation work. You want to ask that question during requirements gathering. I cannot emphasize enough, that is not the product manager's job, that's the algorithmist's job. Right? You have to make sure you understand the entire constraints of the problem. You won't understand it, but you have to understand as much of it as you can and ask as many of those questions early. So developing the habit of asking those questions is a key skill.
So let's start to think about an, an algorithm that, you know, if, if our algorithm had been trying to simply go through the letters and see if all the letters in our input, if we were going through a dictionary and we were saying, what are all the letters that I have in this word, and then just checking to see if those letters are in our input letters, that would have been like the most naive algorithm. But that algorithm would not have taken account, or it would have allowed replication of the letters, and so it wouldn't solve our particular purpose. So let's think about a different kind of an algorithm. And there's actually a, a variety of different ways that you might do this. You might like count the letters and see if the count in the letters is sufficient or whatever. There's a lot of little nuances here, but let's take a step back and try to come up with a different algorithmic way that might or might be great or really terrible for solving this problem. So what we're going to think about is what if we were to simply think about or consider all of the possible permutations of the input letters. Permutation, that's a fancy mathematic word. It simply means all of the possible reorderings. Okay? So it turns out that for a five letter input, there are five factorial, there are 120 permutations of those five letters. And what's interesting about the permutation space, first of all, I was able to fit it all on the screen. And yes, this slide did take me like 30 minutes to put all of those in. That was kind of a nightmare. Anyway, um, nobody appreciates how much work it takes to create slides these days. Anyway, so all 120 of those permutations, and what's interesting about that is, for the, letters, for the words that we're cons interested in looking at, it is guaranteed that our word will appear in one of these permutations if it's possible to do the reordering of it. That's the, by nature of permutating the input letters, we are getting all possible reorderings of the letters, so the word that we care about has got to appear somewhere in this list if it's possible to make that word with these letters. And that takes care, by the way, of our repetition. It just automatically says, you've got to have enough of those letters for it to show up. Not only do we know that it must show up, we know that it must show up in the first few characters. So the word can never appears anywhere, but the word cap does appear as the first three letters of at least one of these permutations, in fact, two of them. Okay? And the word cape does show up in exactly one word in the very first position. It also shows up in the last position, but it shows up in exactly one word where it's in the first position. Same thing with car, same thing with care. The word clap can, is never going to show up in these permutations. The word each is never going to show up. The word ear is going to show up in one of these permutations, in fact two of them at the very beginning. So if we were to con think about this as an algorithm, we could say, well I could take my inputs, whatever those are, produce the entire space of permutations of those, and then simply search through those to see if the word that I'm looking at in the dictionary appears in the first position of any permutation. And then I know whether it's a match. So that is a workable algorithm. Does, it, does the algorithm make sense? We'll talk about whether it's a good algorithm, but it is an algorithm that we can implement. Does it make sense? Let's think about the problem space and a little bit about its theoretical growth. One of the things about factorial is that it grows pretty quickly. So five inputs is 120, not a big deal. Six inputs, 720, also not a big deal. Seven inputs, 5,040, also not terribly bad. But these numbers really start to grow very quickly. About 10 factorial is when that number of possible permutations starts to really get out of hand. And then 11, 12, 13, by 15 factorial, we're at 1.3 trillion permutations. Now, if you think about it, you could write your app so that people were constrained in how many possible characters they could type in. You could limit that to eight or nine, but how many words are there in the English dictionary that are longer than that? It turns out that the average length of words is somewhere between 11 and 12. So if you limited it to 12 for most common words that people are going to type, then you're at, what is that, 479 million permutations of those words. That's pretty large, and it's going to take up a pretty sizable chunk of memory. Not impossible. 1.3 trillion is probably approaching you're going to run out of space, you're going to, at least on some users' devices. Of course, this is context-dependent. Yes? 
Uh, Kyle, and as you're speaking of these numbers, this is one user, one instance, correct? This is not the number, this is, you would have to multiply this by however many users are actually accessing this system. Uh, it's going to be done client side, so I don't think it actually matters. It, we wouldn't be doing this on the server. You'd be doing this only in their browser. But yes, if you were doing this server side, then you would have to have the system resources to handle this for all users. Hopefully, you'd be able to share some of that work between users, but probably not a lot of it. But yeah, we're talking about a purely client-side solution. That is a good point. Thank you. All right, so we have, uh, and by the way, just some of my analysis on dictionaries. There are words that are 20, 25, 30 characters long. Those are pretty unusual words, but there are quite a few words that we use in everyday English that are at least 12 to 15 characters. So it is not completely unreasonable that somebody might want to use an app like this and type in 12 to 15 characters. These aren't c crazy numbers, and we're already getting into very, very huge numbers that are quite easily beyond the bounds of practicality. Okay? So 1.3 trillion is a pretty big and scary number, and so we can already know in, the, in a similar way to when we theoretically analyzed our exponential solution in knight Styler, we already know that even though this is a workable solution in the small, it gets really bad really fast. A couple of other things to point out is that it's actually worse than that. <laughs> the worst part is that we actually can't do that permutation once for those large numbers because there's no possible way that we could put 1.3 trillion of those permutations in memory and keep all of them in memory while we go through each of the dictionary words, potentially 300,000 dictionary words. So if we're going to do this, we're actually going to have to redo the permutation as we go every single word in the dictionary. We're not permuting the dictionary words, but we are permuting the input, and because we can't keep all of that in memory for those big numbers, we're going to have to redo the permutation for each single word. That means we'll have to redo that permutation potentially 300,000 times. So it's actually worse than O of K. It's worse of, it's O of N times K factorial, which K being the uh, length of input. The good news is it's not actually that bad. It's still pretty bad, but it's not that bad because the permutation of the input regardless of how many characters it is, it can stop once we've reached the number of characters for that particular dictionary word. So if we're looking at a dictionary word that is three letters long, we don't need to do all 15 factorial. We only need to go 15 times 14 times 13. And it will guarantee that that three-letter word shows up in there if it's a match. So it's much better than 15 factorial, but 15 times 14 times 13 in the best case for a three-letter word. And in the worst case, it's still 15 factorial. We can also abandon any of the partial permutations as we're going recursively, where the, where the next character that we permute doesn't match, we can just bail out early. So there's a lot of opportunities to bail out early, and I don't even know with those complexities involved exactly what the, um, what the growth of this algorithm is in a theory, theoretical sense. I don't know what the O of N is. It's not quite n factorial, but it's a lot worse than polynomial or exponential. So it's somewhere in between those. And we'll see that play out when we implemented our timings. It'll be another great illustration of, wow, I added one more character and it like went 11 times as long. It, it's, it's a fun illustration. OK, so that's our algorithm to start with. Again, as the baseline, it's good to have a working algorithm to compare against, even though we know that this is probably not the one that we're going to ship to, it's definitely not the one we're going to ship to production. If you've got the repo cloned, we're going to go ahead and dive in to um, our application code. And we've got the wordy.js, that's our module. You'll notice there's two methods there. The load words is going to load our dictionary, and the find words is going to be our, doing our searching, like give, give all of our possible matching words. Load words is given the word list. The app already takes care of loading that up from a JSON file. So you don't need to do any of that work. But we need to turn it into a data structure. And so each option that we do in this exercise, we will be redoing load words to create a different kind of a data structure. There's a question? Uh, well, before you get into it, lunch is here. I'm not sure what you want to. Yeah, we can stop now. We'll, this, is a, this is a fine stopping point. OK. 
can kind of do what we did last time do and probably just take a short lunch. 30 minute lunch, yeah, that's fine. So yeah. we'll pick back up in 30 minutes. So let's talk about implementing the load words function in the most basic way that we can possibly imagine. If we load in the dictionary from a JSON file that just has an array, we can just stick it in another array, right? We can just stick it in an array, and that's kind of the most basic form of data structure that we will start with. So I will make a dictionary variable. We'll have it be an object. Oh, I'm sorry, we'll have it be an array. Actually, we don't even need to assign it to an array, but we'll just assign that. Because in our load words function, all we're going to do is assign it to a copy of what was passed in on word list. We're only making a copy of it because we're not actually going to mutate this array in any way. But just as a kind of a good step, it's important to be clean with what we you know, receive. We don't want to like receive things and then potentially cause mutations of them. The other thing that the to-do comment mentions is that the load words function needs to return a value that represents how many entries are in the data structure for whatever that means for the data structure. In this case, it's however, whatever the length of the array is. But we'll be doing different data structures shortly, and those will have different representations of their quote-unquote size. So here we'll just return dictionary.length, but in other cases we'll want to run run return a different value. That's the reason why we're returning that value, by the way. We're treating that as a unit of memory. We're not actually getting down to the low level and trying to count bytes or do any kind of memory profiling. Again, that was asked earlier. There are great courses on here about how to use the deep developer tools and do real memory profiling and heap snapshots. We're just approximating here with unit, units of memory. So we'll just treat each string as kind of an equally sized unit of memory. And so if we have 1,000 strings, that's 1,000 units of memory. If we have 10,000, then that's 10 times as much. So we'll just treat it kind of that way. So it's an approximation of our memory usage. That's why we're doing that. OK, the next thing that we need to do is implement the algorithm that we described, the permutation algorithm that we described. So I'll take out, let me give us some room down here at the bottom. Take out that to-do comment. And we do want a list of words that we will fill in the array of words. And that does end up being what we want to return. So we know that we have an array of dictionary words to consult. So we're definitely going to need to loop over the entire data structure of words. So we'll say let dictionary word, let word of dictionary. And for each one of those, we can do some very basic filtering, which is if the input length, meaning the number of characters that were passed in for us to match against, if the input length is at least as long as the word length, then we know we should look at it. Otherwise, if, if the word is longer than our input characters, there's no reason to even possibly consider it because it's definitely too long. So that's one of our quick filters. And then we're going to call out to a function that we're going to write. We're going to call out a check word function. That's going to be our recursive function that will check this. And it needs to check the word that we're looking at and the input. And if that works, then we want to push that into our words array. So we'll say words.push words. So if it returns us true, then we'll push it. Otherwise, we'll just keep going. So all the real heavy lifting we'll do in a function that we call check word. Uh, 
I'm going to, for just simply purposes of creating a slightly cleaner API, I'm going to use an inner function that actually does its recursion. We could have reworked it a little bit so that the outer check word does this, but I'm just going uh, to keep things a little bit cleaner. So what we will do is call the inner function that we'll name permute. We're going to start with an empty string and the input. So effectively what's going to happen is that we're going to take a character off of the input and add it to this uh, word that we're building up little by little by little until we are able to find a word that, until we are able to find a permutation that matches the word. So that's what this empty string is. It's going to go character by character through the possible tree of permutations, adding a character and then adding all the other possible characters after it and so forth. So that first parameter to permute is the thing that's going to build up progressively as we take characters off of input. So let's then write our inner function called permute. We'll call that prefix because again that's the leading characters of a set of the, elite, the leading characters of a permutation that we're hoping will match the word, basically. That's what prefix is. And then we'll call the letters passed in, we'll call them remaining. So we have a prefix which starts out as an empty string, but then a, on the next recursive call, it'll have a single character in it, and we've got the remaining characters because we've taken that one out of the set got the remaining characters left. So we need to look at all of the remaining characters to create our next level, our next layer of our permutation. So we will say for let i equals zero, i less than remaining dot length and i plus plus. So this is just a loop to go through all of, I don't know why I called that remainings, remaining, all of the remaining characters. Let's pull off the current character. I'm sorry, let's, let's call it the, this will be kind of like the current word, but it's not really a word yet because we haven't matched it to the dictionary, but we'll just call it current. And that is the concatenation of whatever prefix is. Again, starts out empty string and then builds up. Whatever prefix is plus remaining of i. So what you can see here is that we're going to, whatever that prefix is, let, let, let's say that prefix is a, c. And now our remaining characters are like P and E and T. So we're going to have one loop iteration, which is like ACP, ACT, ACE, so forth. You follow where I'm going with this? All right. Now, what we can ask is if we made a match, if the current is equal to the word, then we know we can just exit out quickly. So we'll say return true. If. We have more characters to consider. So remaining dot length has to be greater than one, not zero, because we already took one of we already took the first or one of the items out of remaining. So we just need to make sure that remaining has more than one other character, at least one other character besides the one that we're looking at. And we need to make sure that we haven't gone uh, over the length of it. So word dot length. We already have a check here that says don't even try dictionary words that are too long, but this is just making sure that we stop the permutation whenever we reach the length of the word. So remember I said we could add a, if we had a three letter word in the dictionary, but we had 15 input letters, we would stop at 15 times 14 times 13. So that's what we're doing here is we're saying as long as the current length that we built up is less than the word length that we're considering, let's go ahead and stop. And then we're going to check to see if we make our recursive call. We're going to pass in current. Remember, current is kind of the temporary uh, partial permutation is the best word for it. We're going to pass in that permanent or that partial permutation. And we need to pass in the remaining characters minus the one, whichever one it is that we just pulled out. We're pulling them out from different positions as we go along. So we're going to need to do a slice on the remaining. 
from 0 up to whatever i is, but not including i, and then a slice starting at i, I think starting at i plus 1. Okay? Just so we are clear here. You see that remaining of slice, remaining dot slice 0 up to i is whatever characters are earlier in the remaining string that we aren't considering right now. Those are in the set of further remaining. And then whatever is after the characters, the, the one character that we're looking at, that's also in the set. So take the two slices on either side of whichever character we're looking at, put them together, and that makes a new smaller set of remaining characters because we've already taken off one of those characters and put it into current. Thumbs up, thumbs down. How we Did I confuse you or is that kind of making some sense? All right. I still see sideways or slightly up, so that's better than usual. <laughs> that's good. At least we don't have a bunch of down thumbs. That's good. All right, so if the permute was able to find that by going down its recursive tree however far and it bubbled us back up a true, then we can just simply return true. But if it somehow failed way down deep in its tree and we need to bubble back up, um, we don't want to bubble back up a false because that doesn't mean that we haven't found it. It just means that we didn't find it in that part of the tree. So we just need to keep going. So that's why we're not just returning the result of permute. We're checking to see if that was true. And if so, then bubbling back up the true. So what this is going to do is keep looping through and keep checking these different words, or these different partial permutations, until we find a match or until we know that we're never going to find a match. And then it just exits out of this loop. And so at the end of the loop, if we never returned true, then we know for sure that we can return false. Let's make sure we understand from a theory perspective how this is recursion, how this is divide and conquer. What we're saying is that to permute a set of characters, we start with the first character, and then we take the permutations of all of the remaining characters. Right? So we're saying all these remaining characters, as if I, only, if I started with the five characters, the P, C, E, R, and A, let's start with P, and let's get all of the permutations of C, E, R, and A. And then let's start with C and get all the permutations of P, E, R, and A. And then let's start with E and get all the permutations of P, C, R, and A, and so on. So we're starting with the first letter. And then again, we're breaking down to permute uh, C, R, e, C, E, R, and A, C, E, R, A, to permute those four characters. We could start with C plus all the permutations of E, R, and A. You follow that? That's our recursive definition or divide and conquer definition for permutation. And we are absolutely taking advantage of the short circuiting, which is as soon as we find a match, exit out now. Don't keep going through the entire tree. So if you think back to our discussion about traversal, here the in, in some ways, the order kind of does matter because we could go at this from the wrong order and end up going through a much, much longer portion of the tree before we ended up at the right thing. That's why we're picking the permutation where it matches in the first position as opposed to waiting until we got a permutation where it matched in the last position. We would have had to go through a whole lot more of the tree to find that. So we're optimizing to quit as early as we know that we found a match and we only exhaust all possible options if we never find a match. Does that strategy roughly make sense? Give me some thumbs up, thumbs down. OK. Any questions I can answer about that before we test it? I promised you at the beginning of the workshop that we were going to do a lot of recursion, and you can see why it's important to be familiar with recursion. 
because very few algorithms are you going to get away with not needing it. I mean, we did do the, the bottom-up tabulation without any recursion, but most of what we do here, we at least have to start with recursion, and oftentimes we'll end up st sticking with recursion. You notice that this problem set is not a counting set, so we're not going to do the bottom-up tabulation approach ever here because this isn't a counting problem. So it's almost, it's almost certainly not something that the bottom-up dynamic programming would help us with. Let's save that. Switch back over to our browser. And we should have a working solution, if not a particularly non-performance solution. So on the short dictionary, which is the one that comes up by default, I know that there's the tiny and the long, but I'm just going to stick with the short dictionary. But just so you can check, if we load in the 80-word dictionary, it loads in so quick that it's not even a tenth of a millisecond. But the 370,000 words dictionary it takes 23 milliseconds to copy that size of an array. So we can see, even in this very small first example, a little bit of benchmarking of the performance time. We see V8's now kind of caching some of that work. But you can see a little bit of that benchmarking. And we will see later, when we try other data structures, that those times significantly change. The other thing to be looking at is the size of the entries. When there's 80 words in the dictionary, there's 80 entries. When there's 2,400, there's 2,400, right? So we will also keep an eye on that because some data structures will have more entries than words, and some data structures will have less entries than words. So that's our approximation of the memory usage and our approximation of the processing time for the startup of the app before we've tried to do any searching at all. And we'll keep an eye on that as we try our different options as we finish this exercise. So because I'm... Uh, here in the United States, I'm going to go ahead and try a set of characters that I know works. I'm going to try an eight-letter input, A, M, E, R, I, C, and A. And let's see what words come back from our short dictionary matching those. Okay, so we got acre and air. We got America, like we'd expect, arc, R, area, arm. You'll notice that w the order that we're getting these in is alphabetized because we went through an alphabetized dictionary and we preserved the order in the way that we went through them. So that's why those words are ending up in alphabetized order. That won't necessarily always be true of any algorithm that you pick, so that's another thing that we would just want to keep an eye on is, oh, did I actually end up selecting other words in a different order? And then maybe I need to go back and sort my words because users generally want to see them presented in dictionary order. OK, so that took 0.2 of a second. It took 200 milliseconds on eight input. Let's try American, which is nine letters. And let's watch the timing of that. It went from 200 milliseconds up to 1,100 milliseconds. So that was about a five or six x, looks like. Let's go up to 10 characters. It's still going. So we went up to 6.36 seconds. So we see it starting to significantly grow by way more than just double each time, right? So if I did this word, which is 11 characters, if I'm counting correctly. Is that seven? No, that's, that's still 10. That should be the same as Americans. I just want to run that one and see what it does. Should probably roughly be around the same six second mark. Oh, seems like it's going. This one's running all much longer now. I lock my browser up. Let's 
So that took 39.25 seconds to run that one. So you can see that this is growing at what we predicted, which was approximately factorial or in that neighborhood. It's growing at a significantly long time. And the more characters that we put in, it would lock up for even longer periods of time. So we know we have a generally working solution. We've kind of done some, some visual, um, visual checking against this. But we've only been checking against the 2400 character dictionary. What happens if we try go back and try the long dictionary and try it with our eight character? And let's just see what that does. So before, that was 200 milliseconds. And it's still running, and it's still running. It's kind of funny that when I do this, sometimes it does what I'm expecting, but sometimes it's significantly longer. I can't control like what background processes might be running on my computer or whatever. So, But yeah, 14 seconds just to do the 8 input. I'm not even going to try the 9 input because we'd be here for another minute or two waiting on it. But you can see that now, now we see a verification that not only is it growing on the size of our input characters, but also on the size of our dictionary. Now, 370,000 word dictionary is way bigger than we need. My estimates from my Google searching are that almost all common English words could fit in about 80 to 100,000. So that's almost four times the size that it needs to be, but that's still crazy too long for us. It was too long at 2,400 words, which was way too short of a dictionary. So we can imagine if we had a dictionary at 80 or 100,000 words, we'd have similar problems. OK. So we can see here that our initial kind of naive recursive uh, permutation approach is not going to work for us. The code that you have now represents option one. And so if your code happened to not work or you missed a parenthesis or a comma somewhere, Again, stash whatever you've done so you can check it out later, and then just check out the option one branch. So that's your starting point for the next optimizations that we'll do. As I mentioned at the top of this exercise discussion, we have different data structures that we can choose that end up leading us down different algorithmic approaches. And so sometimes the real question is not, can I come up with a different algorithm? It's actually, can I come up with a better suited data structure? And a lot of times the data structure is up front, it's front loading the processing work, if you will, to get the data into a format that will make it easier for us to work with. So there are data structures that are pretty well known in this like words space. And I want to talk about a choice of using one of those because it seems like a pretty natural choice for us. That data structure is referred to as a tree, a T-R-I-E. There's a little bit of de debate as to how to pronounce this because a lot of people pronounce it as try. Because if you say tree tree, that's really confusing. And so people, I think, prefer to pronounce it as tri tree. But the guy who invented this invented the name of this from the middle characters of the word retrieval. So he wanted it to be pronounced tree. So if you're sticking to the original definition, this is a gif versus gif thing, you're supposed to call it a tree tree, but most people like to say tri tree, whichever one you prefer. 
What's the notion of this data structure? Well, obviously, it is a tree data structure. You'll notice that we start out with a node, and the, the, the values inside of the node are not the important part. It's the linkages between nodes where the meaning is assigned. So we, start, we always start out with a root node, and it has, in this case, for this dictionary, two children one labeled C and one labeled E. That represents, of all the words in our dictionary, what are the unique first characters of all the words that we have. So we have can, cap, cape, car, care, and clap. Those are all uh, C. And then each and ear all start with E. That's why we have a C and an E. And you'll notice that it just, it recursively, it's, it's a recursively defined tree. So the same is true that underneath C, we have A and L because of our words, the only words that we have, the only fir first two letters are CA and CL. And then we have CAN, CAP, CAR. Those are the only first three letters. We have CLAP. So you can see how this dictionary structure or this tree, tri tree structure is representing all of the words in our tree one letter at a time. Here's where this data structure is most commonly cited. It is used for, one of the most common usages of it is for autocomplete. When somebody has typed in the first several letters of something, like for example in a search box, and you want to return all of the possible suggestions to make to them, you match on the first few characters. And hopefully visually you can see why that would be useful if you had a data structure like this representing all the possible suggestions and somebody typed in the first three letters, you just simply go down, you follow what they've typed down in the tree one at a time down, and then the rest of the words that can be made in that tree are the suggestions that you give back to them. You don't need to consider the whole rest of the structure, only that subtree. So that's one of the most common usages of this data structure. I'm showing it to you because when I started this problem, I kind of had this intuition, maybe this data structure would also be useful for our case, which is a little bit like autocomplete, but not quite. And so it was an exploration that I tried to see whether or not this, this tri tree would work. The only other thing to point out, it should be obvious here, but the, the blue coding that I have there, we have to indicate which ones of these nodes represent actual end of words where they're valid. So the black ones don't represent an end of a word. CA in our dictionary is not a word, but CAP is a word, and CAPE is also a word. So it is not the case that only leaf nodes can be the end of words. We have to track an additional Boolean on each node that says, is this the end of a word or not? And we track that as we build up the tri tree. So we see EAR is a word, and that's why that's marked as blue, but EAR. EAC is not a word, and that's why that one is still black. Another thing that we know, just because this is a well-known data structure, we know that traversal of a tri-tree is done in linear time. It's actually k times n, m. k is the length of the dictionary, like the number um, of words, and m, I'm sorry, k is the average length of words in the dictionary, and m is the uh, number of words in the dictionary. So k times m, that's sort of a fixed known thing in your dictionary size. You, you can traverse it in linear time. It's not based upon your, let me make sure I'm saying that correctly. I think I said it incorrectly. The average length of words represents the height of the tree, the average height of the tree. So that's what k is, is the height of the tree and M is the number of words in the dictionary. I think I'm saying that correctly. Anyway, because it's a known data structure, we just know it has that known property. We don't need to go and reprove to ourselves that math. That's just a known stated property. If we construct a data structure like that, we know that we'll be able to traverse it in linear time. Any questions about how the data structure works before I show you how to construct the data structure? Okay, let's switch back over to our code editor. And we're gonna start again with our load words. Instead of making dictionary an array, we're now gonna make it an object. 
a tree is nothing more than, it doesn't need to be anything more than simply linking objects together. Having an object with one or more properties under it that point to other objects that point to other objects, that's all it really takes to make a tree. So we're just going to start with a plain old empty object that will represent our root node. And we're, instead of loading this thing up into a word, into a copy of an array, we're going to just create this nested series of objects as we load the words from the word list array. And then we need to keep track of how many we've done. So I'll have that count here, and we will return that. One other thing that I want to do is I want to have a special property on each node that lets us know whether or not it's the end of a word. And I want to have a symbol to define that, so I'm going to call that symbol is word. Symbol is one of the primitive data structures added in JavaScript back in ES6. It's just a unique primitive value. You could think of it like a number or a string, but it's guaranteed to be unique. All right, so what we're going to do, uh, firstly, let's just make sure, because we know that our app can call load words multiple times, we need to reset the dictionary each time we load it, pick a different dropdown. So I'm just going to check to see whether or not our dictionary has anything in it. And I'll reset it to an empty object in case. So we'll just throw away the old tree and rebuild it. All right, we're going to go one at a time through the words in the word list array that was given to us from the JSON file. And we're going to, there's no recursion involved here, which is kind of nice. We're just going to do an iterative traversal down this tree. And the way we do an iterative traversal down the tree is we just keep track of a reference, a pointer, if you will, a reference to the current level of tree that we're at. So we start that reference at the root node. And this property, that, I mean, this variable called node will be our reference pointer to our current root or our subroot as we go down our tree. And then we need to loop through all of the letters in this particular, in this particular dictionary word. So let letter of word. It's nice that JavaScript ES6 made strings iterable, so we can just get each of the characters out of a string with a for of loop. And we need to ask if at, for this letter and wherever I am at traversing down in my tree, have I yet created a node for that letter? Because we might get you know, we're going to see the same starting letter from a whole bunch of words, and we don't need to recreate the object over and over. So we only need to create it the first time. So we can just say if node being our pointer to whatever our current portion of the tree is, if, if not node of letter, meaning we have not yet created that child, then we need to go ahead and create that child. And that object, I, I said that the objects were empty or that they didn't carry any particular data payload, but they do need to have that Boolean flag on them that tells us whether or not they're a word or not, whether they represent the end of a word. So we're just going to do, a, we're going to include that symbol, the is word symbol, as our property name, and we'll initially set each node, the Boolean, to false. So we're saying the property of that symbol name value is false as we add in a node. We do need to keep track of the count. So this is a good place for us to increment our counter so that we know how many of these nodes we have created. Actually, let's do that inside the if because that's where we actually created it. After we have added a letter or at least found an existing one, whether we added it or found an existing one, now we can advance the pointer so we can say node is equal to node of letter. So we're simply taking that running reference that was started out at the root 
and now it's pointing to this child node, whether we just created it or had already created it. And then we're going to, so we're basically just walking our way down for every word in the dictionary. We're walking our way down to the place in the tree where that word would have needed to be finally represented. And at any place where we haven't yet got the nodes for the letters left in that word, we just add them. So we're just progressively filling out more and more of the tree with more and more of these nodes. At the end of the for loop where we have added all of the letters for a word, we know that the node reference, the node pointer there, that variable node, that is pointing at the last letter of the word. And therefore, we should take that one and set its symbol to true because that does represent the end of a word. So we're going to say node dot, or sorry, node of is word is equal to true. Those 20 or so lines of code are all that it takes to construct a basic data structure that behaves like a tri tree. Now, there are well known implementations of data structures like tri trees that you can find on NPM, and some of you have probably already Googled for this. Is there an implementation of a tri tree? They are more sophisticated, they have API methods, they're written as instances of classes and all of this other fanfare. And those very well might be the kind of code that you would like to just use in a production app. But I like to do the bare minimum that is necessary to get the job done. So if it only took me 15 or 20 lines of code to write a tri tree implementation like I've done here, that's what I would almost certainly do. Rather than going and getting a 400 line nicely packaged you know, tri tree. There is a dividing line where the complexity of doing your own implementation and all of the potential performance gotchas where you might not have an optimized solution, it becomes actually way better for you to use a known, well battle tested implementation. So this one's only 15 or 20 lines of code. It's conceptually pretty straightforward. There's not a lot of places where we could have made a mistake or a performance foot gun or something like that. So I think this code is the right code. This is the code I'd use in production. But in our next option, we're going to start looking at data structures that are much more complicated and that we definitely don't want to reinvent ourselves. And we'll use packages that exist for them. Okay? So you do have to make those judgment calls. Just be wary of where, where's that balance line of how many lines of code and how many potential pitfalls have I introduced. This is only part of the problem, but it is at least useful that we've constructed ourselves a tri-tree data structure in just a few lines of code. We're now going to need to adjust our find words utility to know how to search through such a data structure. So what I'm going to do is delete our find words and our check word function. And we'll start over. So remember, like in the autocomplete sense, what we really need to do is be able to get to a part of the tree to know if we've found a match or have any other matches that we can go to. So we're going to use a very similar concept, which is we're going to, again, recursively step down our tri tree until we have convinced ourselves that there are no more matches and we're going to stop. But if along the way, if we find any nodes where we've got an is word marked, then we know we found a matching word. That's our broad general overall strategy. So we're just going to keep tra traverse for every word in our dictionary, keep traversing the diction, I mean, sorry, for every one of our input permutations, we're going to keep traversing our tree and whatever words pop out, those will be the words that we spit back as our result. That will be our general strategy. Okay, the first thing that we need to do is check if we're already, oh, I'm sorry, we also need to change the signature of find words. So we're going to still pass in the input, but I'm going to, this is another technique where I'm not creating an inner function to do my recursion. I'm just changing the signature of the function itself. 
In this particular case, I'm adding on two extra parameters that have default values. So from the perspective of the place in the code that calls find words, it still only passes in one argument. But I've got two other parameters that have default values, and so I'm able to do this with the same function. I just wanted to illustrate to you that we saw using a sub-function for our recursiveness. We've seen using separate functions. And now here we're just going to adapt the existing function to our needs as recursion. Each one of those is techniques that you can use. All right, so the second parameter will be the prefix starting at the empty string, as we probably saw before, and the current node that we're at in the tree, again, this being like a node pointer, a node reference. So we'll start that, we'll default that to the root dictionary. All right, so the question that we need to ask is, are we already at a word? If so, we need to go ahead and add that into our words list. So we can say if node, if node of is word, have we found a node that is marked as the end of a word, then we need to push in, and this is why we're passing down prefix. We don't want to go then have to walk back up the tree to reconstruct our word. Remember, we, went, we, we got to this node letter by letter by letter. But we're pushing down with each level of recursion the progressively built up string that represents that word. So at this iteration, if we're at a node that says it's a word, the thing that's in prefix is the full word as a string. We pushed that down. That'll save us some work, basically. So we can just push this into the list of words that we can return. And now we start to go through whatever's left in the input characters and, again, kind of do our, basically, our permutation recursively down through our tree. So we're going to say for let i equal 0, i less than input dot length plus. Let's pull off the current letter off of the input. This looks a lot like when we were pulling the letter out of the remaining or whatever. It's the same concept here, so I'll call this current letter. Input of i. It'll start out with the first one, and then the next iteration will take the second one and so forth. The question we want to ask is, if the node that we're currently pointed at, wherever that is in the tree, if the node that we're cur currently pointed at has a node for this letter. If not, there's nothing else for us to do in this part of the tree, right? But if it does have a node for that, then we can keep going down. So this is the big if statement. We need to check that. Now what we need to do is get the set of the remaining letters. And this is, again, similar to doing it with slice. I'm just going to show you a slightly different style of doing it. We're going to say that the remaining letters is an array. Rather than keeping that as a string, I'm just going to keep it as an array. Arrays and strings are very similar, but I'm going to keep it as an array. So I'm just going to spread out input.slice from 0 up to i, and then spread out input.slice starting at i plus 1. That should look familiar because that's the same way we kind of picked out a single one when we were doing the permutations. So I'm going to call find words with remaining letters as the input. We just computed remaining letters, so I'm going to pass in remaining letters as the input. The prefix is going to be whatever the prefix was passed to us plus whatever our current letter is. So if it was the empty string, now it's the first letter. If it was first letter, now it's the second letter. And the node is the node of the current letter. So now we're walking down in the tree one, one layer of node reference. So to make that more readable, I'll put that on two se few separate lines. That's our recursive call. And what does that return back to us? It returns back an array of a partial list of matching words, potentially. It'll at least always pass us back an empty array, but it'll pass us back any words that it found in its part of the subtree. You with me? So what we want to do is add that into the words array. So I'm going to do words.push 
And whatever this array is, I want to spread that out as arguments to the push call. Might have returned us back an empty array, in which case it found none, and we're just spreading out an empty array and doing nothing pushed in. It might have found a thousand words, and we'll put all those in as well. There's a question. Uh, since we're <coughs> since we are reversing a tree, we can't possibly mix it up with the, uh, the other is word. Is that true? Because we're using symbol. There, what, I'm sorry, what confused. was the question? They're a little confused on why you used the symbol for is word and where that could possibly get mixed up. Um, it could not get mixed up. I used a symbol because it's the best semantic coding choice. Uh, this is a special property on the node. It's not a child property that represents a letter in a word. I could have picked some other thing like one, two, three. But the best way of doing this, this is what symbols are for, is to create special meta properties, special properties on objects. So I'm just using the JavaScript feature for what it is for, which is to make a special set apart character. But our particular usage of these objects doesn't enumerate over the children in some way where it could, could get confused. It just would make more confusing code to pick some other arbitrary value for that property name. One last little thing to fix up, which is that at the end of this for loop, it may not be obvious, but if the inputs had had any repeat characters. In other words, if anybody had typed in the P letter twice in the input, we would end up with duplicate words because we would have ended up visiting that same part of the tree multiple times and got, and got all of its sub-matched sub words multiple times. So our list might annoyingly to the user end up with some duplicates in it. That's one of the implications of this algorithm. And so to fix that up, I'm going to use the JavaScript set data structure. I'm going to push our array into a set and then pull it right back out as an array. So I'll do new set of words and then spread it back out into an array. So this is just get, making sure that our list of words that we return is unique. In what's checked in in the code repository, this is how the code looks. But I want to point out something that this is a recursive function. And because I'm not using an adapter function, the, this function is the actual one that recurses on itself, which means that we are reuniquing this at every single level before we return back up, which is a whole lot of unnecessary work. So we really only want to do this line at the last level, right before we return back to the calling code, right? After all the recursion's done, and we've gotten a big old list of all the possible words with a, potentially a bunch of duplicates in it, then we just want to do one last deduplication. If we had an adapter function that had called this one, we could put that line of code in the adapter function and not in the, per, in the recursive function. A way of approximating that same thing is that we know that when node is back at the dictionary level, we know that's our last level out because we always start at the root. So we can just simply, this is just a little, it's a tiny performance, it probably wouldn't matter, but if just as we're thinking about things, you can say if node is equal to the dictionary, that lets us know that we're at the last level and we only, so that's the only place that we need to do deduplicate. I see the question. I'll get to it in just a moment. I just want to finish typing this. What was the question? Could you please clarify why we have what we have in remaining letters? Okay, so we are going through the input 
which is the set of characters that we can basically permute on. That's whatever the user typed into the input box. That's a uh, array or a string of letters. It starts out as a string and we end up turning it into an array, but the way we use it, it doesn't matter. And so we're, we're looking at that set of those letters and we're saying, I want to take each one of them as the next letter, but I want to do that one at a time. So I'm going to start with, again, going back to the P, C, E, R, and A example. I would take P as my current letter and then remaining letters is going to be the array that holds E, R, that holds C, E, R, and A in it. And then on the next iteration of line 43's for loop, instead of taking P, now I'm going to look at C. So I want to take C as the letter that I'm fixed on as my next letter in a permutation. And I want to pull out a remaining set that has P, E, R, A. So remaining letters becomes those four. Then on the next loop of line 43, I take the E as my next letter that I'm fixed on, and I get a set of remaining letters that is P, C, R, and A. And then I keep going. So it's just pulling out one letter from the set of possible letters and getting everything else into another set. That's what we're doing. Any other questions about this implementation before we test it? Yes? Couldn't we just remove duplicate letters from the input first? So if we were to remove duplicate letters first, then it would prevent us matching words like that we want the duplicates in. Remember that we constrained our problem such that you have to pass in P, P, and A, A if you want the word appear to match. If we deduplicated that down, then you would get to the part where you did A and P, and you'd be looking for another P in our algorithm, and it wouldn't be in the input set. So therefore, we couldn't keep going down that part of the subtree. So unfortunately, we can't deduplicate the input letters. We have to deduplicate the output. This is just a, f a, a, a side effect, if you will, of the algorithmic choice that we made here. That may or may not end up, actually, it won't end up being what we like about this particular choice. But we are going to see the performance implications. Little hint, this is going to be significantly more performant, because this is a linear algorithm. As, compa as compared to the factorial algorithm that we tried before. All right, so let's go ahead and switch on over to our browser with our new implementation in place. Pay attention now to these benchmarks for our data structure. For a 2,400-word dictionary, we ended up creating 5,705 nodes. Each node is only represented by a single character, but we are creating about, it looks like they're just about a little more than twice, about two and a half times as many entries in the data structure. Okay? And if we're treating entries in a data structure as units of memory, we could sort of approximate that this is using a little bit more memory to represent this data structure. Looking at the timing of it, 8.6 milliseconds, I don't remember exactly what the short dictionary one was, but I do remember that this one ended up at something like 20 milliseconds. So let's see how long it takes. But that took 210 milliseconds to construct the tri tree. That was about 10 times as much time to construct the tri tree as it was to just copy the array. Notice also that for 370,000 words, we've got a little bit over a million entries in our tri tree. So, yes, we are using both more memory and more startup time to construct our tri tree data structure as opposed to simply copying the array. What's that going to buy us? What's that, that we're paying the more upfront memory and more upfront performance? Not horribly, I mean, 0.200 milliseconds is not that terrible for the startup time. And a 370,000 word dictionary is a pretty large dictionary to represent. So. 
seems like 200 milliseconds is not that big of a penalty to pay. But whatever that penalty is that we are paying, what's that buying us? What's our runtime performance? Let's go back to our example. I'm going to go back to the 2400 word dictionary because I remember those timings a little better. And let's go back to our four, our, our, I'm sorry, our eight character input, America. That's 0.8 of a millisecond. Let's see what happens when we go to nine inputs. Ooh, it went down actually. What that doesn't mean is not that it was faster in any way. What it means is that it didn't grow by five or six X like it did before. Let's try it again. Let's go to 10. Went to 1.4 milliseconds. When we did 10 before, you remember it was like multiple, multiple seconds. Remember when I tried meaningful and that one ended up at like 36 seconds? Let's try it. 0.8 milliseconds. So now we have a linear search algorithm and that's a huge payoff win for us compared to the relatively, I would say, small costs that we had to pay to construct a better data structure. It's a very good chance that at this point, you would look at the memory and performance profile of this solution compared to relatively not that many lines of code that you needed to write, and you would say, I'm done, ship it. Because this is a pretty good balance. It is taking up a bit more memory. It is still taking up a bit more of our time up front but it's ending up with a pretty good overall balanced solution. And nobody would fault you if this is the one that you said ship it for. But as we transition into our next set of discussions, there are a few other things that I want us to consider about our implementation. Okay, back at our slides, I want us to talk about garbage collection. And while I've got these slides projected, I just want you to look back at the code that, I've been, that we've just worked on. And I want you to see just how many places that we are just treating for free that we can create an array and return it back and spread it into another array and throw it into a set and create another array. This is one of those cases where JavaScript makes that super ergonomic. And quite honestly, it's pretty performant at doing it. We don't see a big penalty for doing it. So it ends up creating some pretty reasonably nice code for us to write. The C programmers of the world are cringing because they're like, ah, oh, that dot, dot, dot is like 6,000 lines of its own complexity and all the memory implications and all of that other stuff. At our layer of abstraction, we just sort of treat it as a, almost a free operation. And one of the things that you need to get good at as an algorithmist is even though you do play in some particular layer of abstraction, you shouldn't be completely ignorant of the layer below. You should be at least competent at understanding the layer below. For us, that's what JavaScript is managing memory-wise underneath the covers. So I want us to talk about the creation and throwing away of a whole bunch of arrays as temporary transport values. That's basically what we're doing there. And I want to talk about an approach that you sometimes might employ to reduce the pressure on the garbage collector in our programs. Why is that important? Because it is always the case that we, in the small, we test things out and everything works. And then in production, we end up starting to see people complain that our animations start to just randomly be janky or there's a delay when somebody clicks something or whatever and it seems very unpredictable and that's because we can't really predict or control when the JavaScript engine is going to say ah you put out too many bags of trash at the curb I gotta come by and pick them all up and I gotta collect all the garbage we don't really control that we're not supposed to control it but we don't control it and yet it is actually an important factor that plays into the real experienced performance that our users have. It may not end up showing up in your test suite, 
but real users will experience the effects of us being lazy about garbage collection. So as a little bit of a detour here, I wanted us to spend just a brief moment talking about minimizing our garbage collection. And there's a technique for doing this. It, obviously, if there's a way for you to say, oh, I don't need an array here, I could return something else, just don't do the array. But the way we wrote our algorithm, we kind of based it on the ability to like make arrays and return partial arrays and concatenate them together. The algorithm kind of just assumes all of these arrays, so it would be difficult to avoid returning them. But there is a technique that we can use to cut down drastically on just how many arrays that we need. And that technique is referred to as an object pool. So put simply, an object pool front loads the creation of some number of instances of some value, usually a data structure like an array or an object. Could be an instance of a class or something. But if I know, for example, that at any given time, I only need 25 of this thing, whatever this thing is, I could pre-create all 25 of them, and then, not that much unlike a library, when I need one of them, I could check one of them out, use it, reset it, and then check it back into the library. And if 25 was the most that I ever need concurrently, then I might end up putting back and checking out hundreds or thousands or millions of times, but notice that I only ever created 25. If they were arrays in our case, I only ever created 25 arrays, even though at any given time I might have 13 checked out and then put a few back and then get 12 more and put a few back, but I never go above 25, then I've drastically reduced it from the thousands or millions of arrays down to 25. Does that make sense? Yes. This is the process you're describing. <coughs> Analog <coughs> Excuse me. I'm just an you know, understanding check. This is analogous to the process that databases use um, <coughs> for repeated queries and potentially caching, correct? That we know that there's so much information in the set. We know what our, uh, you know, we know what our maximum overhead is, so we materialize that, which makes it readily available for lookup. Instead of like sitting somewhere where we have to compute it, we compute it, dump it and make it available. Um, is that the same kind of loop that we're describing here? Possibly. I will say that I am certainly not sufficiently well versed in the internals of database implementation to speak to what they do. But I can say that as a correlated relationship, yes, um, the concept of resource pooling as a broader version of object pooling Resource pooling is extremely common when we're dealing with fixed, finite, and expensive resources like network interface connections and database connections and things like that. It is extremely common that you might create three or four database connections in a pool because you know you don't really need all of them, but you don't want to create and throw away and create and throw away. That's very expensive performance-wise and memory-wise. So yes, the, the broader idea of resource pooling is very common. right? Whether you're dealing with garbage collection or not, you just simply don't want to create and destroy a whole bunch of memory because it fragments your memory and it wastes you know, CPU performance and so forth. So this use, reset, recycle loop, that's the conceptual thing to think about. Now, another extension to this pool is sometimes you don't know how many you need. So you might start the pool at five and then just let it run. And what happens if you try to check out the sixth array when you started at your pool at five. You might think, oh, I, I guess you just, that fails, or like there's no more array. Well, the general response is you just grow the size of the pool according to how many you ask for. So if I started it at five, I could grow the size to six and give you the sixth one. But we have this general principle of what's called exponential back off. I mean, in timings, and we use this a very similar principle here, which is to say, if I asked for the sixth one, you, you started out with five, and I've now asked for the sixth one, there's a pretty good chance I'm probably going to ask for a seventh, eighth, and ninth one. So rather than just give you six, and then grow it to seven, and then grow it to eight, and grow, how about if just every time you ask for one more than I have, I'll just double the size of my pool. So I'll go from five to ten, 
because there's statistically a pretty good chance that you're going to want 7, 8, 9, and 10. And then if you ask for the 11th one, I'll just add another 10 to the pool. 10 that are out and another 10 I create. So now the total pool size would have been 20, or total pool capacity would have been 20. And I'll give you the 11th one. And then after you go past the 20th one, I'll make the capacity 40 and give you the 21st one. So this, that's the general idea of a data structure like this object pool, is that you just ask it to give you a new value and you don't really worry about it too much. But you do want to sometimes kind of fine tune the pool size. If you started out too small, you end up with too many doublings. If you started out too large, you end up with wasted arrays, or wasted instances that you never use. You follow me? So you could just use the object pool right out of the box, however it's been implemented, and not worry about it. And it'll take care of its own doubling and giving you new values. But in the end, you probably, if you're going to go to the trouble of using an object pool, you probably eventually want to try to fine tune it down to a, a number closer to what you probably need. Because there's no real reason to let it double and have to pay that penalty in the runtime. If you know up front, I need 23, just go ahead and set it to like 23 or 25, and then you're good. You, know, you follow where I'm coming from? If you know that you need 10,000, I might not set it at 10,000, because that's an awful lot of upfront allocation. I might let that grow as my application goes, because maybe I, maybe I need 10,000, but maybe only 1% of the time do I ever need 10,000. So that one might be a case where I'd set it to like 500 and let it, let it grow itself to those bigger numbers in the rarer cases where we really need it. It's, there's a lot of little fine tuning and subjective judgment that you make and you want to benchmark. But that's the general concept of an object pool as a data structure. So how does that apply to our code? This is going to be a little bit more intrusive on our coding style. It's a little bit annoying to work with, but we, we get this big payoff in terms of how many fewer objects we're just throwing down at the curb to be garbage collected. Far less chances that we're going to have animations or other things that become janky because of garbage collection. So we'll switch back over to our code editor. And we are now on the option three branch. Um, or we are, we are now finished with option two, that's the starting point. But you'll notice in the option three branch, I've included a library that does an object pool for us, rather than us implementing our own. That library, I happen to have authored. I wrote this like seven or eight years ago. It's called dpool, D-E-E-P-O-O-L. Um, so it's just in there in the option three branch. You can switch to option three and grab it and copy it out if you want get it off of the GitHub repo, however you want to grab that. Or you can get it off of NPM, again, D-E-E-P-O-O-L. Um, so dpool is my attempt at writing the most stripped down, least feature rich, but most performant object pool that I could possibly imagine. And I spent a considerable amount of effort tuning and benchmarking the performance, but Big uh, disclaimer here, I am not a performance engineer. I am not one of those ones who went and looked at the internal guts of V8 and like tried to figure out all the, like, the nuanced quirks. I just did my best to take out all the frills and give a very, very stripped down version of an object pool. It uses a very simple round robin strategy to, keep the, to prevent the memory from getting over clustered and it round robins through an array and all of that stuff. All of those details are in that tool. You can completely ignore this library from here on. I'm not trying to sell anybody on using it, but I wanted us to have an object pool to use, so I pulled out this old project that I had written. So how are we going to use, um, how are we going to use dpool? Well, if we had it, if you've, if you've gone and gotten it, um, and you have it, you can just import it. So we're going to import dpool. And I put it in the external. directory. To use this library, you need to construct an instance of the pool. So you're allowed to have as many pool instances as you want. You would want one pool instance for each type of value that you were pooling. In other words, don't put arrays and objects in the same pool. If you're doing array pooling, 
have one pool for the arrays. If you're doing object pooling, have another one. If you're doing class instance pool, they, they should all be identical is the point. That's one of the concepts of this sort of data structure. So we'll create ourselves an array pool. It's the create function. And what you pass to it is a function that constructs instances of the value that you care about. So in our case, we just need something that creates empty arrays. I'll pass it an arrow function that creates an empty array. Dpool will automatically invoke that function anytime it needs to make new instances of your value, anytime it needs to grow itself. So that can be as complex as you want. That could be like constructing a class instance or calling out to a data. Whatever you need it to be goes in that function. Ideally, usually, it's just returning an empty array or an empty object, but it can be more sophisticated. You can start using that pool just as is, and it defaults, because the documentation disc discloses this, it defaults to starting out with five entries in your pool. It lazily does that when you ask for the first one. It goes ahead and creates a pool of five, and then it doubles from there. That five doubling might be good, good for many of your small usages. In this particular case, I've already done some pre-work on this exercise, which is that I first went through and benchmarked how many arrays was I creating and throwing away in my average case when I was typing in, say, a 10 or 11 character word, and it turns out that number was in the multi-thousands multi of arrays that I was creating and throwing away as it recursively went through and made all of its matches of several hundred words to return to me. Okay? So several thousand arrays are what is being created, and then I went through and using some, some console logging and some counters and stuff, tried to get an approximation for how many do I need at any given time? Like, what's the most that I'm ever using concurrently when we're, you know, 8, 10, 12 levels deep of recursion? And that number was around, it was somewhere between 20 and 25. And then I, so I set it at 25, and then I fine-tuned it a little lower and a little higher. And I arrived at, for my testing, that if I picked 23 as the size of the pool, that the pool never needed to grow but I didn't end up with any unused items in my pool. Now, your mileage may vary if you're trying out different dictionary lengths or trying out different lengths of input. You might end up you know, needing 25 or 24, but we're just gonna go ahead and pre-grow our pool to size 23, since I already did some of that pre-fine-tuning work, and I think that's a pretty close number for most cases. So how do we use this pool? That's where, that's where the real big game is. The first thing that we're gonna do is, we are still gonna have that same function here, but I'm gonna make another function that will be the find words function that takes our input. And then we're gonna rename this function to find all words, just because I'm uncreative and I can't come up with another name for it. Uh, we'll explain in a little bit why we need two functions, but it's because I need to do a little bit of cleanup work after the final call. All right, so in the find words function, I'm going to call my find all words with my input. Actually, I should have probably left this as the same. We could leave this or not. You don't technically... Whether you use this or not, it would be fine, but we'll leave it there. Since that's what I did in the Git repo. Okay, so find all words is our sub function, the one that doesn't get called publicly, and it's the one that's going to do all of its recursion for us. We're going to go ahead and call that, and you might think, oh, well, all we need to do is just return all words. Why do we even create this adapter function? Well, before we get into the internals of what find, words, find all words is going to do, it is going to return us an array. And the array that it returns us will have come from the object pool. And we don't want to lose that object. We want to reset and recycle that object. So we want to pass out to the calling code a new array that's not part of our pool that the calling code can do whatever it wants with. 
but we are internally managing our set of pooled arrays and we don't want to lose one of those. We need to keep all of them and reset all of them and, and make sure the pool gets back to its initial state. So we are going to use something that has become much less common to see these days, but we're going to use a version of the try uh, construct called try finally. I don't know if anybody out there has used a finally block before. You don't see that too often. But with the purpose of the finally block, notice I don't even need a catch clause here. If I put a finally block, it will happen every time, no matter what, even if an exception occurred. So the purpose of finally blocks is to do cleanup, which is exactly what we're doing here. We are cleaning up our memory. This is exactly what try finally exists for, is this kind of work. So we need to take the all words and set its length equal to zero. That's resetting the array back to an empty array. And we need to do pool.recycle and recycle all the words. Recycle that back into our pool. That's our cleanup. Does anybody spot the problem with this code? Before we even look at how find all words does what it does, does anybody spot the problem with this? I'll give you a hint. Somebody in the chat? We are not taking the words from the pool. Uh, we are going to do that inside of this find all words function. Like I said, we're assuming that this thing is going to return us an array that came from the pool, which is why we need to recycle it back. You are returning and the function exits. We are returning and the, ex and the function exits, but it always guarantees to do the finally block after it exits. All words is not a new array. Ah, there you go. We are returning all words and then Im immediately emptying out all words. So the calling code is going to be like, what? You gave me an empty array. We need to return a copy of all words and then clean out the all words and recycle it. Little nuances that when you start doing stuff like working with an object pool, you got to pay attention to the very little nuances like this. It's easy to get tripped up. Okay, this next set of work that we're going to do, we're going to wire up the find all words function to, in as many places as we possibly can, when it goes to create a new array, instead of creating a new array, we want to get an array from the pool and add values into that array rather than constructing a new array. That's the task. And whenever we're done with an array, we want to reset the array and recycle it back into the pool. So that's what I meant by saying it's a little bit intrusive here, so it makes the code a little bit uglier, but it's not too bad, I don't think. We just need to look for places like this where we construct a new array. And so instead of constructing this new array, we are going to check an array out from the pool. So we will, instead of saying that, we will say pool.use. That gets us a new in, or gets us another instance from our pool. Let's look for other places that we create arrays. Here's a place that we create an array. When we're creating remaining letters, we create an array. So let's do pool.use. And instead of being able to kind of nicely declare this, we're going to actually have to push into the array that we got out of the pool. So it's slightly less ergonomic, but we'll push in these values. We'll still spread them out. One note is that the slice method here, built into JavaScript, is in fact returning arrays, 
And we can't do anything about that because that's a built-in method. So this is an example of an array that we just have to get the array and it just has to get garbage collected. This is not a perfect solution. But insofar as any arrays that we can control, we want to use those from the pool. And any of the other ones that we don't have control over, we just shrug and say, that's just part of using JavaScript. So we can't do anything about those slices, but we did take care of the array that we had been creating for remaining letters. Now, we want to take the array that is coming back from find words. We know that find words, I'm sorry, this is going to be find all words. Let's stop. I, I mess this up every time I do this workshop. We have renamed that. That's our recursive call, find all words. But we need to take that function and call it, and we know that that thing returns us a pooled array, right? Because look, that thing is going to be this, and it's a pooled array. We know find all words is giving us a pooled array, just like we know it up here. It's a pooled array. So we need to get that array, which I'll call more words. We need to get that array. We need to push those values into our existing levels words array. So we need to say words.push more words. And now we have this more words array, which is a pooled array. What do we do when we're done with an array? We reset it, which for JavaScript arrays is as easy as setting its length equal to zero. And then what's the last thing that we do? Recycle. In fact, we are also done with remaining letters because we've made this call. So we can also set remaining letters dot length equal to zero. And we can also recycle remaining letters. We pulled two different arrays out of the pool, and now we're resetting both of them and putting them back. The discipline here is anytime you take something out of the pool, make sure you know where you are done with it and reset it and recycle it. Otherwise, you've completely shot yourself in the foot because the pool is just going to grow infinitely and you're not going to get that reuse that you want. One last little nuance that we have to handle is this code down here, which is calling our uniquing. You see that we're creating an array here, and we don't want to do that with an array. So what we're going to do is say words set is a new set with the words. That's a new set instance. and because we're only doing this once, we don't really need to worry about pooling. We're only doing this on that last call, if you will. So we don't really need to worry about pooling. But you could also do a pool of set instances, if you were, or a pool of map instances, or whatever. Here, there's only one, so it's not that big a deal. I've constructed the set, so I've now copied the words over into a unique set. And so now I can do my resetting. I can say words.length is equal to 0 because I no longer need that array. And I can then push into words what comes out of words set. So we'll do dot, dot, dot of words set. So I reset it to 0, because I don't want to reconstruct an instance of it. I'm reusing the same pooled instance, I re set its length to zero, pulled it back out of the set, and that's now what I'm going to end up returning. So if you follow through the logic here, we have a pool.use and a pool.use, and we have a pool.recycle 
and a pool dot recycle. Yes? Why doesn't the uh, recycling method make an array empty itself? Why do you have to do your own resetting? That's uh, basically the question. Yeah. Because the pool is generalized, it says I can handle any kinds of values. You might be handing me instances of some complex custom class that you've defined. It has no way of knowing how to reset a value. It technically could have like done some special casing and said, oh, I know how to reset arrays and I know how to reset objects or whatever. But because it doesn't do any frills and doesn't have any performance overheads that it doesn't need, it's your job to do the resetting before you pass it back to recycle. Another question? this recycling manually, manually, does the uh, JS recycling engine check all these steps again after the function gets removed from the stack call? Please repeat that question. If we do this recycling manually, does the JS recycling engine check all these steps again after the function gets removed from the stack call? The way that you should think about this is that we are not actually growing the JavaScript memory stack very much as we go down. That's by design what we're trying to do is not grow the stack. We grew the stack by all the arrays that we needed when we did pool.use23. So as we walk our way down into all of these recursive levels, we are in fact having JavaScript construct new uh, function call frames on the call stack and there is a little bit of value creation on the stack because of the input.slice that we don't control. and So some of that is getting cleaned up as it goes back after the call stack frame goes away. That has to get cleaned up. But the big thing that we're focused on here is that all of these thousands of intermediary arrays that we were creating before in the previous solution, we're no longer creating thousands and thousands of arrays that JavaScript needs to garbage collect. We pre-created the 23 that we knew that we would need. We checked them out, used them, reset them, and recycled them. So I guess the real answer to the question being posed is JavaScript is still needing to do its own memory cleanup. And yes, there might be some garbage collection that happens. We have significantly reduced the pressure on the garbage collector by simply putting out thousands fewer bags of trash down at the curb. Hopefully that answers the question. Last one I've got here, I'm not sure if you covered this yet. Uh, how many arrays did you manage to get rid of using the object pool in this particular case? Based on my estimate, I went from, uh, in my testing, from using several thousand arrays to using 23 arrays. Yes. And just a clarification, you, when you say using several thousand, you mean initiating several thousand, uh, or is it because we've, we've initiated 23 and we're just recalling them, instead of creating thousands of new objects, we're, we're reusing the references we've already created, is that correct? I, I mean creating and using. Like okay. We didn't create any arrays that we never used, but yes. we created thousands of arrays because we were creating and then throwing away and then creating and throwing away and creating and throwing away. Now we're just doing create, use a whole bunch, reuse a whole bunch, recycle a whole bunch, reset a whole bunch, and then at the very end of the whole thing, JavaScript might be like, after you've re unloaded the page, it might be like, okay, cool, I can now throw away those 23 arrays. Okay. All right. Um, we didn't change any of the functionality of the code, and we haven't really impacted any of the performance. We could rerun it to, to, show you, to show that, as long as I didn't make a mistake here, it should still work, and we should still be getting roughly, uh oh, did we have a JavaScript error? Oh, I know what happens. I didn't import, I didn't pull over the dpool implementation, so the, I can't actually run this code. Just to save the time though, the, the timings, you can run it yourself, the timings are gonna be roughly the same. So we're not really paying hardly any performance penalty for this, we're just simply reducing the memory pressure on it. It's just a technique to have in your bag. Do I use object pools all the time? No. But I would say maybe 
one out of 100 cases where I'm implementing an application like this, I see a place where the algorithm that I've designed or that I'm using is particularly wasteful in creating and throwing away lots of intermedi intermediary instances of an array or an object. And then my brain kicks in and I'm like, I should probably use an ob object pool here. Okay? Another example of places where people have used object pools, somebody took my library and used it in, at least for a while, in one of the semi-popular uh, libraries that was, I, I think it was Redux or something like Redux, because they were creating all these objects for the state dispatches. And they were creating and throwing away thousands and millions of these objects, and then they ended up using uh, Dpool as a way to manage those objects. And they, I don't know whether they're still using it. I think they're probably not. But for a while, it was being used by one of those libraries. So that's just an example in a place where you're creating and throwing away a lot of those intermediate data, data structure instances. Object pooling can be useful. Any questions before we move on to the last? optimizations that we'll make to this exercise. Okay, we're winding down here. here. That should be working. Let me just double check that I didn't mess something up. All right, uh, the next set of optimization that we want to look at is we want to look at this tree. Here's our tri tree uh, implementation that we've been working with. We want to think about our tri tree implementation and realize it does seem like there's a fair bit of kind of wasted space in this tree. Look at all of these extra nodes that are being created here that aren't there for any other purpose other than that's the structure of a tri tree is that it goes one letter at a time. In our particular dictionary case, we're not, we don't have any child nodes off of those, so those are kind of wasted nodes. You might think about it as, well, I could construct a tri-tree, but then go back and compact that tri-tree and save a whole bunch of memory. Because I'm likely to have, on average, quite a few of these nodes that are just hanging out with no reason to be there. They're intermediary nodes with no reason to be there. It turns out there is an actual term for these. Uh, kinds of trees that have been compacted. A tri tree that has been compacted is referred to as a radix tree. So the way the compaction worked, as you can see, is that we just took the internal nodes, combined them into one connection, and then made that connection the um, augmentation of all of the intermediate states. So that LAP, for example, there, 
LAP took the place of the nodes that were L, A, and P separately. All right? So at each one of these levels now, instead of only having single letters, we can also have multi-letter combinations as the children, as the endpoint. You wouldn't construct your tree this way because you couldn't possibly know in advance where those would need to be. So you would construct a tri-tree with single letters and then run an optimization step to effectively compress the tree down into this format. So that would end up saving potentially a significant amount of memory usage of your tri-tree. In the case of doing something like autocompletes, that ends up being a pretty effective technique because you don't lose anything, you haven't lost any information, you still know the words, you just do a lot less traversing, it's faster and uses a lot less memory. So most of the time a production implementation would construct a tri-tree and then compress it into something like this radix tree. Unfortunately for us, the way our algorithm works, a radix tree would not be the right data structure. It would significantly complicate our algorithm and we would lose most of the performance benefit that we wanted. So I only wanted to show you that something like this exists and when you Google around you'll find them. But in our particular exercise, this is not the right data structure. And had we chosen this, we would have ended up beating our head against why is this so hard and why doesn't it work and why is it not very performant. The reason why it would be difficult is because at every level, we currently take advantage of the fact that we can take a single letter out of our remaining letters and find a child node or not find a child node. Here we would actually need to enumerate all of the children of every node to see if there were any matches. That would end up creating a whole lot of extra performance overhead and complication. However, there are other data structures. And we have now, without possibly even some of you realizing it, we just made a giant leap, actually kind of a tiny leap, from tree data structures into graph data structures. Why, are, why is this a graph data structure? Well, you can easily see that it's a graph data structure because you have one or more nodes that have uh, more than one parent. The H node has two parents. It has the C parent and it has the A parent. That's what lets you know this is a graph instead of a tree. Okay? This is referred to as, actually it goes by a couple of different names. The first place that I found it was under the name DAFSA, D-A-F-S-A, which stands for Directed Acyclic Finite State Automata. So that's a whole bunch of really like fancy sounding computer science terms. Go back to your coworkers the next time you're at your work and say, I learned about Directed Acyclic Finite State Automata, and they'll probably buy you a free lunch, right? Because that's going to sound really impressive. It's not quite as impressive as it sounds, but it sounds good. The other way of referring to these is DAWG, D-A-W-G, Directed Acyclic Word Graph. And I like that name a lot better because that speaks to what we're creating here. We're creating a word graph. This Directed Acyclic Word Graph is, you see how it looks a lot smaller? It's doing the kind of compaction that a radix tree does, but it does it in a different way. Instead of removing nodes, it creates these extra graph links within the tree. So we get the compaction of memory usage, but we still get the properties that we're going to be able to, tra to traverse this in a similar way to the way that we were traversing a tri tree. It's not exactly the same, because there are complexities in graphs. You have to worry about getting into loops and I mean into cycles and things like that. But it ends up significantly reducing the memory footprint of the data structure, and we'll see that in a moment, and it ends up creating um, a pretty significantly performant implementation. Maybe not quite as nice as the tri-tree, but a very performant implementation and much better in memory. So it ends up getting, creating for us a potentially a better balance than what we saw a few iterations back with the tri-tree implementation that we did. This one shifts the balance a little bit and makes better usage of memory. Pays a little bit more up front. A directed acyclic word graph is a much more complex data structure to create. 
And we are not going to learn the algorithms of compaction that end up creating all these links. Those algorithms are significantly out of scope for our discussion. And also, even if I taught them to you, it's so complex that I would never recommend writing this code yourself. We have firmly crossed into the area where you want to use a known and battle-tested library to do this. And I have included for you an implementation of this from a library called Minimal Word Graphs. That's a library that I found out there, and I've included an implementation of that, and that's what we're going to use. The first thing that we need to do is load up this library. You, um, you can copy this from the option for branch in the same way that we copied in the object pool if you'd like to. Um, this one, unfortunately, doesn't get distributed as an ES module, so we're just going to load it in the old school script tag way. But you do need to make sure that it is loaded. In our Wordy, we're going to take out the is word, and we're going to take out the pool. And our dictionary is going to be a minimal word graph. So we're going to construct an instance of minimal word graph. Our load words function, we're going to be able to take out all of this code because the data structure is going to take care of all the work of constructing our data structure. So really all we need to do is double check to make sure we don't need to empty it out. So we're going to say if the dictionary.size is greater than zero, then recreate an instance of our minimal word graph. And we're going to call for let word of word list. We're going to go through each of the words. And this is the nice part is that we're just going to call their method dictionary.add and pass in the word. So that data structure in their API is taking care of all that complexity under the covers for us. There's one final step that we want to do, and this is basically the step where it makes, it does all that compaction and memory efficiency stuff. Gets rid of all the intermediary steps. We call it, they call it make immutable, which is actually one of my favorite API names I've ever seen in a library. It's just very straightforward what it's doing. It's making the word graph immutable. What we should take from that, importantly, is that once we have constructed this word graph and done all of the compression to get the nice, efficient memory usage and all that, we cannot add any more words to the dictionary. In our case, that's no big deal because we preloaded the whole dictionary. There might be cases where you need to be able to add words to the dictionary as things go along, in which case this is not the right data structure to use. Because <laughs> this data structure really gets its benefit from the ability to have compacted it but that's a one-way operation. Once you've done all that compaction, you can no longer add stuff to the graph because it just breaks things. So for us, that's good. We go ahead and make it immutable, and we return the dictionary.size. We are going to, yes, question. There's a couple of questions before you get on to the next thing. Um, how does it reduce the memory usage while the same nodes still exist? It does not create all of the same nodes. It removes any unnecessary nodes, and the way that it removes the nodes is not to actually combine nodes, but to create additional links. That's what makes it a graph versus a tri-tree. But it does actually literally create far, have far fewer nodes in memory. And we'll actually see that once we run our working solution. We'll actually be able to see 
the number of entries in the data structure is drastically lower than in the tri tree. Yes. I, as an aside, I, this is where I work, and the typical graph in production has millions of nodes and billions of edges. So mm -hmm. you are going to have a lot more links between entities than entities in general because it's a much more efficient strategy. And references are yeah. a pretty small yes. value for JavaScript engines to keep track of. Is it creating more memory to keep all those references? Yes, but it's way less than creating a big old you know node of, of string value in it or something like that. References are pretty small. Were there R, more questions? Yeah, R and C are parents of H, yeah? Yes. Did I say something different, maybe? I might have misspoken, but yes. Yes. So it looks to me like the edges are labeled, not the nodes. So that would not be true. That you would not have the nodes, no, no node would have a parent because it doesn't have, it's, it's simply a structural reference. All of your information is on the edges. So R is not a parent of C because it doesn't have a valid combination in the set. Um, well, this is, this is getting a little too into the weeds, but the, the way we're implementing this is this is a property on this node called R that's pointing here. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, yeah. this thing is a parent of this thing. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't have a name R, so it its parent is an anonymous node that was pointed to by an edge named R. I'm calling that its parent, and that's kind of a semantic distinction without a difference. But Any other questions? OK. We're going to call the API that they provide, and they actually have several of these you can read through. Fair, fair warning, the documentation for this particular library is not as great as I wish it would be, and it doesn't seem to be a super well-maintained library, so you, your mileage may vary with using it. But I was able to get this to work. It does, if they don't say this in the, in the documentation, you absolutely have to pass an array. It implies that if you pass a string, everything's fine, and I can tell you, you have to pass an array. <laughs> that I know for sure. So here I'm just making sure that we are in fact passing in an array. If we've received a string, then I'm just turning it into a string. I mean turning it into an array with split. So contains only is the method name on that data structure that basically does the search that we're talking about. That's our find all words functionality, basically. So we're going to be able to take away find all words. We still have the same problem. Their, their data structure still has the same problem, which is that they might end up returning us duplicates if we passed in um, duplicate input letters they might end up returning us duplicate output letters. So in the code repo, you'll see this line of code. Somebody asked earlier, could we just deduplicate the input letters before passing them in? In our previous algorithm, that would not work. But something that's interesting about the way the contains only works is that it does not care it will find all of the matches even if you didn't provide enough of those letters. So technically, we don't actually need line 35. This is what the way it is in the repo. Technically, we actually could have solved line 35 by deduplicating what's in input. So you could do it that way, pass in a deduplicated set of input into contains only, and then you won't get those repeats out. And then line, now line 36 wouldn't be needed. There is, however, whether you deduplicate the input or you deduplicate the output, there is, however, another annoyance that we have, which is that they were matching words that we wanted, that we said at the beginning we don't want to allow. In other words, they would have matched appear 
because they allow that du duplication of those letters. So it's both a good and a bad thing that their search algorithm works that way. So now we are going to be returning words that our previous algorithm would not have returned because we would allow a single P as an input to match the word appear even though it needs two P's. So to fix that up so that this code works the same as the code before. You could make a decision at this point that I'm using a data structure that allows the repeats. Maybe that's how I want my app to work. But just so that we are comparing apples to apples, we're going to show, we kind of hinted at this, but we're going to show a way of ensuring that we don't end up with any of those false positives. And that is that we're going to implement a utility called count letters. Okay. And this is obviously a very down and dirty way of doing it, but we want to go through any string and count how many occurrences of each letter there are in the string. In fact, this is a classic interview question. Uh, and then I'm only showing one very down and dirty implementation that you could do for counting the number of letters in a string. So we're going to go through each character in the string, and we're going to create a reference in this counts object for that character. So we'll say string of i. And then we're going to say, um, we're going to set it equal to either, just trying to write it the way I have it in the repo so that the code compares here. This is just a, a way of code golfing, writing fewer lines of code. What I'm basically saying is, if it's there, use it, otherwise default to zero, and then add one to it, to the count. So I'm incrementing the count, but I'm defaulting it to zero if it hasn't already been set in there. And then return counts. So for the word appear, it would return us an object that had A1, P2, I'm sorry, say A2, P2, E1, R1. Everybody follow that? That's what this function does. We're going to need those counts for our input. So I'm going to come back here and get those at the beginning. I'm going to say input counts equals count letters of input. If you did the D duplicating of input rather than the set approach, whichever way. If you did the deduplicating of the input, you would want to do that after you counted the letters. All right, so do, do that deduplication de here on line 38. Okay, so to fix up our result set so that it filters out the words that we should not have allowed in there, that, the, that their search should not have allowed, we're just going to do a plain old filter function. Again, just trying to kind of quickly scope this, sketch this kind of logic out. For each word in the returned set, we're going to get its counts. And then we're going to go through all of those letters and compare the counts of what's returned to the counts of our input. And if they don't match, then we're going to reject it. So for take the letter and the count of object.entries word letter counts. So we're saying, oops, I misspelled that. We're saying this object that got the counts for us from this particular word in our return, our candidate returns, we're going to go through each one of those entries. So we're going to go through the A, the P, the E, and the R entry in that object, for example. And we're going to compare the count that was returned from this word, so P2, to the count on our input counts object. So we're going to say if there wasn't that letter, which this should never happen, but this is just kind of a, like, if there wasn't that letter at all, that's just sort of a sanity check, but it shouldn't ever happen that it gives us back a word with a letter that wasn't in the input set. Or the count is greater than what it was in our input counts. 
If either of those things is true, I got one too many parentheses there. If either of those things is true, we can reject this word because it should not be in our list. So that's return false. And if we make it all the way through all the letter counts and everything was fine, we return true to keep it. Thumbs up, thumbs down. How do we feel? Does that sound all right? It's a little bit regrettable that their API doesn't allow a flag that says don't allow duplicate input letters or something like that. It'd be nice if, the, if their API did that. In this particular case, we just have to clean up the result set a little bit. So it's, it's kind of a paper cut, but it's on a much smaller set than the input set. So we're not, as algorithms, we're not too worried about the performance hit there. If I did not make mistakes, if I was able to successfully type that in, should be able to go back to our page. Oh, I did make a mistake. On line 30. Aha. This colon should have been a semicolon. Nope. Another mistake. Line 40. That's a question mark. Sorry. I didn't even finish that line. I got ahead of myself. Array that is array. We just return input and then colon. Ah, okay. Right off the bat, notice that our 2400 word dictionary is now being represented by a directed acyclic word graph that only needs 1,562 entries. So we see it having fewer entries than there are letters in there, and that's because it's able to do all of that sharing. Okay? If we go up to the 370,000 word dictionary, you'll notice that it did take 810 milliseconds to create that instance and make it immutable, do all the compaction on it. This is a pretty large dictionary, as dictionaries go, but that is a noticeable impact on startup performance. Something that you would have to think about. Can I do this in the background thread or hide it somewhere or whatever? Okay? So just be aware of it. It's not 20, 20 seconds or something crazy that's completely impractical, but it is something to be aware of. Notice here, though, instead of having the 1 million entries that we did in our tri tree, we now have 160,000. We have less than half the number of words in our dictionary. So we went from being three or four times as many to being less than half. Pretty significant memory savings. So again, trade-offs. Better memory, a little bit harsher penalty on the startup time. Let's go back to the 2400 word dictionary. Let's try our examples again, like the word America. Six milliseconds. We were seeing around one millisecond before, so Slightly slower. We want to make sure that we don't see growth, though. So let's try it with nine. Still pretty quick. Still very quick. Even something much longer. Right? So we see that it's still not going in a runaway growth, still performing pretty much linearly. And that's what we know that we get from those algorithms like the traversal of a tri tree, or in this case, slightly more complex data structure, but under the cover is that contains only is fundamentally doing a similar algorithm to ours. So what we've seen in this exercise is that the choice of data structure is a pretty important choice. It leads to very different outcomes, some good, some bad. There are lots of trade-offs in memory and performance usage. It's kind of the running theme throughout the whole workshop. But it's very nicely illustrated by this particular exercise. Hopefully, at a minimum, it's exposed you to a few other data structures that you maybe haven't heard of before. A lot of people have heard of stacks and queues. Not as many people have heard of something like a directed acyclic word graph. 
I had not heard of it before I started tackling this problem. I started Googling around and I found it and I learned about it and I realized, oh, this is exactly what I need. I didn't even realize it. So I learned a new, da new data structure. As a matter of fact, not only did I learn about directed acyclic word graphs, I learned about another data structure that is a very related in this space of working with words. You might have remembered I talked about the Wordscapes game, and one of the particular challenges in Wordscapes is that it's this like crosswordy kind of thing, or it's almost like a like Scrabble kind of a thing where your words are being based off of other words. What if the problem had been, I need to give you a set of input letters and I need all words, but I need to constrain that the second letter has to be H. One way of doing that was, would be to do whatever we had done before and then do another filter over our outputs to just filter out anything where the H wasn't in the second character position. And I'm pretty sure that's probably what Wordscapes does. But it turns out that there's a data structure designed specifically for this problem. Figure out all the possible words from a set of input letters where we have fixed one or more of the letters in the word. And it was invented by people who play Scrabble. It was invented for the purposes of Scrabble solving and Scrabble analysis. And this data structure, and I'm not making this up, is called a GADAG. It's DAG, which is directed acyclic graph, and then GAD, which is the reverse of that in before. And when I describe to you how this data structure works, I will just say, I have no idea how somebody came up with this data structure. I don't know how they invented this data structure, but it's kind of genius. Look at what is stored for the word explain in this data structure. They store two pieces of information. They store the first letter and then X-P-L-A-I-N. But notice the second entry is that they store X-E. So they've reversed the first part of it and then the P-L-A-I-N. And then they do the E-X-P and then still L-A-I-N in the same order. So notice that the prefix is always in reverse order to the suffix as it does all of those permutation, not really permutations, but as it does all of those different pivot points in the word, and it stores all of those different entries. So it is going to be a bigger data structure. It's storing a whole bunch of extra stuff. Why are they reversing the prefix? And I stared at this, and I read the Wikipedia, I stared at this forever, and then I had the epiphany point. The reason is because what you're wanting to index on is the very first character. If I want to find, if I want to fix the character at P, then I can go directly to that entry and see that PXE, all I have to do is reverse that and I know that I can spell the word explain off of P in the third position. So they've stored the prefixes in reverse order so that you can look at the first character of the prefix or the first character of the suffix part of this entry and know whether or not you have a match. It's, again, I have no idea how somebody invented this data structure, but I was super delighted when I had that light bulb moment and I was like, yeah. That's pretty cool. We're not going to go implement or get a, an implementation of GADAG to use for this particular exercise, but more broadening of perspective. And the final thing that I have to share with you is a bonus. We're not going to actually walk through any of this code, but there is a website for you to play a game that I created. It's a word game. Some of you may have played Wordle. I was inspired by that game, but very annoyed by the luck aspect of Wordle. And I wanted to create a game that was completely deterministic. And I had this idea that it seems like every word, or at least most words, if you made some changes to that word, you could get to another word. And that, that, there's a concept for that. That's called a word ladder. You could take any word and change one letter and produce another word, and then change a letter in that and produce another word. And that, that concept has been around for dozens of years, and that's called a word ladder. But I had a specific version of a word ladder in mind, which was a dwindling word letter, word ladder, where the changes that we make get smaller and smaller and smaller until we get down to a single letter word, like A or I. So if you start with the word path, you could remove the, word, the letter H and you get pat. And then you could remove the letter P and you get at. And you could remove the letter T and you get A. So that is a minimal example 
of a dwindling word ladder. The rules of this game are that every move that you make has to produce a new valid word in the dictionary. You can either change a letter to another letter, remove a letter, or in certain circumstances, even add a letter. But you can only make one change per move. And the goal is to get the optimal path, that is the fewest number of moves and the shortest resulting words to get yourself down to a single letter word. That's the premise of the game. I've had this game out now for almost a year and few people have been playing it daily. I see my logs that there's a few dozen people that are playing it daily. But if you like word games, you might try, try checking out Dwordly and playing it. But I just wanted to talk to you about the algorithmic complexity behind this. When I got the idea for this game, I thought to myself, I, I can come up with a couple of examples of simple words that I can construct this dwindling word ladder for. But I just had a theory that there would be a lot of words in the dictionary that you could do that for, but I, I was not sure. I had no way of proving that because I couldn't find any prior art on this. There were no Google pages that said, yes, you can do this. Maybe others have done something like this, but none of my Googling found it. I think I'm the first one to attempt this particular concept. Anyway, I spent two weeks working on trying to invent an algorithm that would find these word ladders within a dictionary. And I kept tweaking the algorithm and it wasn't working or whatever, I was trying to figure it out. And I eventually stumbled on the idea that if I modeled it in just such a way, I essentially constructed a word graph and then I used Dijkstra's shortest path algorithm to traverse that and that gave me my answer. But it took me like two weeks of fiddling with stuff and Googling or whatever. And then I asked, and I was like, ah, I remember Dijkstra's algorithm from Computer Science 101 25 years ago. Haven't used it since. But then I just happened upon some set of information and code that ended up, and that's what I ended up implementing too. And I took a 12,000 word dictionary that I hand curated all 12,000 words of, and I ran my algorithm against it. And I was delighted after weeks and weeks of effort that out of a 12,000 word dictionary, I found over 8,000 words that can make a dwindling word ladder. So then I knew I had the basis for a game that I could move forward on. So just as a little bonus there, algorithmic work can come up and even something as entertaining as making your own game. Any questions or thoughts? I I'm surprised you didn't find anything on that on Google because I have read papers that use that method. For academic papers that use that method. I probably used the wrong Google searching. Uh, yeah, I don't know. That's, uh, it's certainly a hard one to come up with. Very cool. Yeah. But, but yeah. I, I accidentally stumbled upon it. I did not start out knowing what I was doing. All right. So we've come to the end of this fun workshop. I want to refer you back to the TLDW slide that I gave you near the very beginning of our workshop. I want to refer you back to that. So I'm actually just going to go back up until I find it. Probably should have just copied it in my slides, but we're going to go all the way back to the beginning. These are, I hope, the themes that recurred for you over and over and over again, and in order of importance, I think. Asking the right questions and then thinking about the balances and trade-offs that we make between the memory usage and how much performance time we're paying, and choosing the right data structures that are shaped for the problem instead of trying to coerce the problem into the data structure, and then thinking smartly about optimizations. We should use memoization sometimes, but in other times not. We should use object pooling sometimes, and in other times not. So anything that's not thought about with careful engineering mindset becomes immature, and then that's the bad form of optimization that wastes time, creates harder to maintain code, and ultimately will re be rejected by either our current coworkers or somebody in the future who says, oh, this is garbage, I'm going to rewrite it. So the, the goal here is that we write code that survives that kind of scrutiny, that our coworkers can have confidence in, that we, we know that it's doing what it's doing, that it's doing it well, that it's made the right choices and trade-offs and balances, and that it ultimately will survive 
long after we've moved on. That's kind of what an algorithmist, I think, would kind of consider to be the best badge of honor, is if something that they wrote survived ultimately that test of time. Are there any final questions that we didn't tackle? Any other thoughts? My parting thought to you would be to point back to the idea that this course has certainly been, I would say, a somewhat unconventional take on data structures and algorithms. But that's why I set this up as more like a lab course than your traditional theory, lecture heavy kind of a course. It doesn't mean that those courses aren't good and I strongly recommend that you go and check out some of the resources that I've uh, recommended throughout the workshop and also the other courses here. Uh, at Front End Masters. Those are all fantastic and they have a lot of really good value here. What I hope that you get from this course specifically is an increased sense of confidence that it doesn't matter what your educational background is. If you take the time to think like the algorithm works, the code will come along with it. Think first as an algorithm and then code. So many times in our industry, we reward code first. Code as quickly as I can. It doesn't matter whether it's good. And in this workshop, the takeaway that I want you to get is you spend much more time thinking up front, you'll spend a whole lot less time coding on the back end. Hopefully that's useful to you as you go forward. Thank you for being part of the workshop. Well, we went a little bit over, but mostly on time. Thank you all for being here. I appreciate it. It's fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, this is excellent.